All right, good morning. Today is Tuesday, February 8th, 2022. Welcome to a regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County. It is a beautiful day in Manatee County. And as always, we start the day here by honoring God and by honoring our great nation. We're going to start with an invocation, which will be led by Reverend Robert Bledsoe of Trinity United Methodist Church, after which we will have the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by Lee Washington. Uh, Mr. Washington uh, reached the rank of staff, sh staff Sergeant in the United States Marine Corps. He served 11 years in the Marine Corps, yeah. two Navy Marine Corps Achievement Medals, numerous certificates of commendation, non-commissioned officer of the quarter, and the National University Leadership Scholarship in 1991. Mr. Washington is one of the first Marines to serve a broad <clears throat> naval submarine Kings Bay, Georgia, um, Marine Expeditionary Unit, uh, and I cannot pronounce that, but it is in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> he is currently a member of the Bradenton Kiwanis Club. He is an advisor to the Manatee County Veterans Council. He was also the Employee of the Year in Manatee County in 2019. So we will start with the invocation at this time. If you're able, please rise. And let us pray together. Oh God, as we just heard, it is a good day in Manatee County. And we thank you that every day you give us is a gift. We ask that as we gather together this morning that you would lead us in our conversations and in our deliberations for there are many important things to be discussed. I give you thanks for each and every person who is here in this room and uh, what is important to him, him or her that brought them to this place. I give you thanks for the leaders of our county for their willingness to give of their time and their wisdom to make this place a, a better place for all who call it home or all who may call it home one day. We continue to lift up all of those each and every day in our county uh, that put their lives on the line to serve and to protect and to keep others safe, especially those in our hospitals and our healthcare workers. God, we ask that as we meet today, that this place would be filled with your Holy Spirit, that we would speak with love and compassion and kindness, and that we would remember servant leadership and caring for the least, the last, and the lost is always on our hearts and our minds. God, we give you thanks and we love you on this day and in all of our days to come. And we all said together, amen. amen. Nice. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Washington. And on behalf of Manatee County, thank you for your service, sir. Dr. Hopes, will you please read changes to today's agenda? Yes, Mr. Chair. The following amendments to the agenda. The first amendment was dated uh, February 4th. And under the changes to the consent agenda, building and development services, item number 13, the final plat um, for Azario Esplanade, uh, phase five. Uh, at the request of the applicant, the supplemental declaration to the Declaration of Covenants was updated and replaced to include revised Exhibit D and revised Exhibit F. Under financial management, item number 17, budget amendment resolution B22-045. The resolution was updated and replaced to remove an item related to the Rural Road Improvement Plan. Um, and rename two projects within the item related to the American Rescue Plan. Village for Homeless 17th Avenue is renamed as Assistance for the Homeless. Uh, stormwater projects under 500,000 renamed to Stormwater Projects. Public Works, item number 30, Surplus Vehicles. This item was updated to reference only Surplus Vehicles. Uh, in addition, uh, the addition to the regular agenda under Public Works, item number six, uh, 36, Rural Road Paving Program, Budget Resolution B22-04, 
request for a motion to approve map selecting the roads for the first year of the rural road paving program and adopt budget resolution amending the annual budget for Manatee County, Florida for the fiscal year 22. That item was formally on the consent agenda. Uh, in addition to commissioner agenda under Commissioner Whitmore, uh, the affordable housing task force discussion. The agenda was further amended on February 7th under uh, regular agenda items, administrator item number 38, which will follow the confirmation of Lee Washington is a discussion and explanation of employee compensation for fiscal year ending September 30, 2022. And those are all the amendments, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Dr. Hopes. Um, before we move into proclamations, um, the administrator and I added item 38, uh, sort of last minute because I anticipated it coming up in commissioner comments. Um, commissioner Servia, is item 38 needed for discussion today? I wanted to avoid it coming up in commissioner comments. I felt it should be added to the agenda if it was going to be discussed, but I will leave that up to you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I did not add this item to the agenda. Okay, well, I anticipated it coming up in commissioner comments. That's why I wanted to add it to the agenda. Um, so does that item need to be discussed today at all? I guess it's, that's the question. It's entirely up to you, sir. I'm not going to discuss it during commissioner comments. Okay, then in that, in that case, I will take it off, strike it from the agenda um, because I don't think it's necessary. Okay. Okay, we'll move then into proclamations. Oh, I'm sorry, you want to do... Um, do you want to do the introductions first? Yes, yes okay. Mr. Chair. Let's do the introductions first, and uh, I will go to the county administrator to introduce his new department heads and staff. Uh, uh, I'll ask for the uh, director of building and development services to, to come up and introduce our new building official. They're the new team that will be moving Manatee County's rapid growth forward in an orderly fashion. Director. Hey there, good morning. Um, so I'm here to introduce our new building official, Mr. Bill Palmer. So um, he's this is his fourth week on board, um, so he's also drinking from the fire hose. However, um, he comes with a lot of experience, 16 years at City of St. Pete Beach, uh, most recently as their building official and floodplain administrator. So he also comes with a lot of floodplain experience, which is gonna really benefit our county. Um, so I'll let Bill introduce himself. Welcome. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Courtney and um, Charlie um, for selecting me to be the new building official in Manatee County. I feel blessed for the opportunity. Um, since I've been here in this short period of time, I've been just so impressed as to um, my fellow workers, how um, helpful they were, how friendly they were. It made me feel really welcome very quickly. So I really am grateful for that. Um, moving forward, you know, I want to be successful in being, you know, a liaison between the community, the residents, the construction industry, you know, between them and the building department, and uh, also move the building department forward, you know, and build on the successes that it has already made. I think so far I see it's a really good building department, and, um, you know, we'll just keep on improving on that. So I look forward to working with uh, everybody, and uh, thank you very much. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. All right, I have Commissioner Ball on the board. Well, I, I just wanted to say welcome aboard. And um, I can tell you from many that I've heard from, everyone has waited uh, for you to get here. They're very excited to work with you. And they're excited to, to see the new team and what all you do with the building department. So everyone's anxious and excited. So welcome aboard to both of you, to both of you. Yes, Courtney and Bill, welcome aboard. Looking forward to, to working with you going into the future. Yes, Palmer, Bill Palmer. Yes, ma'am. Got to remember how to email him. Bill Palmer. Bill Palmer. <laughs> Courtney Good DePaul. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, we'll be we'll be bringing to you the two of them have been working diligently uh, to sort of uh, reorganize, uh, redesign the building department, including changing the name. And so when we finalize those plans, we'll be bringing them to the board in accordance with our ordinance to get your approval. Uh, so you'll be seeing a lot more of them in the, uh, the, the days and weeks to come. Commissioner Bellamy. Yes, you changed the name of the BADS, the BADS? Uh, yes, sir. All right. what, what is it going to, I'm just curious. 
going to be called goods. The, develop, yes. develop, the, the, <laughs> department, the Department of Development Services, I think, where we're, where we're landing at this time. All right. D-A-D-S. Dads. 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 Can't anyone do that before the Are you there? Okay. So, commissioners, uh, next so. we're going to go into our next, our second new department head, uh, Dr. Hopes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and, and commissioners. Uh, and I appreciate us uh, taking Lee early on. Uh, I, I cannot express enough how, how impressive uh, Lee Washington has been in his, his new role. As you know, we, we, uh, I made him the acting director of neighborhood services. Uh, upon numerous uh, recommendations. During this period of time, he has, has been phenomenal in, in bringing organization uh, uh, to the department. In addition to that, he has taken on additional divisions. Uh, effective the 12th, this is another department that will be coming to you for your approval of the changes that have been made. Uh, he will be taking on all of the areas related to our affordable housing prod, uh, uh, programs, including the HUD grants, as well as our uh, significant uh, uh, approach to addressing the needs of the homeless in Manatee County. In addition to his ongoing role uh, overseeing Veterans Affairs uh, and, and the library service, he's going to be announcing uh, upon our budget discussions yesterday uh, funding to expand the library hours uh, to get him back to some, some normality. Uh, and with that, I ask, uh, humbly ask for your confirmation of Lee Washington uh, as the Director of Neighborhood Services, soon to be named the Department of Community and Veteran Services. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, motion to confirm the appointment of Lee Washington. Second. All right, Madam Clerk, we have a motion by Commissioner Servia and a second by Commissioner Bellamy. Um, on the board, did you, you take I, this? I, I just want to make okay, a statement. Okay, I, I have Baugh, Whitmore, Bellamy on the board. Commissioner Baugh. Yeah, um, Lee, you know. I mean, I, I've always wondered why past administrations did not move you uh, into some role as this because I knew that you were so capable and you'd do such a great job. So I'm thrilled for our citizens of Manatee County, and I'm thrilled for a lot of our staff members that will be working under you and look forward to all of the new endeavors that you do. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate that. Commissioner Whitmore. Every, after every good leader is good staff, and I've worked with you as staff and as a leader recently, so as interim leader. And you're catching on. You're doing a wonderful job. And I don't, um, your position wasn't, the position you're in now wasn't open until now. So they picked a wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, I've always been afraid of you because you're a Marine. <laughs> <laughs> and when you come in, it's no nonsense. Yeah, it's no nonsense. I'm a funny and, guy, uh, believe it or not. But, <laughs> and we've been working together since you've been here. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But we've gotten to know each other, we're friends, and I want to say how proud I am of you, how professional you are, and that comes in, I think, with your, um, your Marine um, training and your, your background. You're very professional, and you get right to the point. And I've seen just a little bit that we've met recently that you let your employees help you and you take their input. It's not just my way or the highway, and that's why you're going to be successful. You may even be the administrator someday. You never know. So anyway, Lee. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh -huh. Appreciate let's, it. Let's not wish that upon him. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> I didn't mean truth? now. I meant later. Uh, com uh, Commissioner Bellamy. Used. Yeah, I, I remember when some of this, the immediate parts started taking place, and this is exciting. Um, Lee, Lee's a very, very, very talented individual, and he's, it is articulate, and obviously he's committed. If you get an opportunity to just look at Lee and look at his eyes, it defines his focus and his desire to make a difference in whatever task that has been put in front of him. And that's the thing about being a soldier. I'm not going to go too far in the Marines because me and Leah go back and forth. Yes, we do. <laughs> because I'm an Army guy. But what, what you have done, sir, is continue, continue your service. 
after you've gotten out of the military, came back to a community and make it a difference. In my mindset, you define the word leadership. Thank you for your commitment. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Bellion. Okay, and I'll just add a final thought and say, uh, Dr. Hopes, you've added three really strong team members uh, to Manatee County today, and, and ultimately the taxpayers are the winners today. So uh, hopefully, hopefully the vote goes your way, Lee, and, and I'll say, well, I'll prematurely say welcome aboard uh, <laughs> before, before we vote, uh, Dr. Hopes is on the board. I just wanted to add one thing because I did not know you were at Kings Bay. Uh -oh. And uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's amazed me how this, there's this very small circle. What you may not realize is in 1988, when I was hired by Ernst & Young, my first assignment as a health care planner uh, was to go to Kings Bay, uh, and I had no idea where it was. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> the reason for that was the Navy, in anticipation of making it, I think, the Trident submarine base, uh, realized that Kings Bay, Georgia, was going to grow dramatically, and they needed to design an entire health care infrastructure, which was not there at the time. And, and so I spent many, many days and weeks there in 1988 and early 1989 designing the healthcare delivery system, both civilian and military, in anticipation of your arrival. I was there from 88 and, to 90. And, I, and I'll tell you, you know, you and I, you and I have clicked from day one. Uh, you and I have clicked from day one, and I, I am, I am so appreciative of your willingness to to serve in this capacity it's a it's a challenge and you uh you're going to do great things and i think you may be uh a, an ideal candidate for a county administrator one day yeah See? thank you okay <laughs> thank you dr hopes uh so we have a motion we have a second i will open this up to public comment is there anyone who would like to come forward to speak on this specific agenda item seeing no one we'll check with seth on the phone no sir there's no one on the phone either. We'll hold the vote now. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Clerk, Mr. Washington is approved unanimously. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Wow. Mr. Washington, the floor is yours. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, Mr. Clegg, Mr. County Administrator, Dr. Hopes, Lee Washington, Director of Neighborhood Services. <laughs> I first would like to thank the, the County Administrator for putting his confidence in me and my abilities and tapping me for this position. I'd also like to thank my fellow directors who have supported me since this transition and allowing me to lean on them as I learn to backstroke. I've been doggy paddling for a while in this position, but uh, I'm getting my stroke on. So, but I also want to thank the board uh, for confirming me this morning. Um, your confidence allows us what we do upstairs to, to go a lot easier, and I truly appreciate that. But I cannot forget the people who stand with me and behind me and those who may be watching uh, on TV and their computers right now. I truly appreciate you, and I look forward to doing great things with you real soon. Good leader. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Washington. Uh, we are going to very quickly pull items from consent and then we'll move into proclamations. Uh, are there any items that commissioners would like to pull from the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, that was quicker than I expected. We will, Mr. Chair, ma'am. Are the ARP uh, that's uh, that's being pre a presentation, correct? ARP grants, pandemic. That's presentation. I believe ARP is under consent under fiscal management, financial management. Okay, I'm 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 okay with it. Okay, because I've been by it a, through it a couple times. I didn't know if we were going to present it to the public though. Okay. Okay. Um, then let's move forward with awards first, and we will start with the Employee of the Month Award, which is being given to Joanna Belmore. <laughs> Elliot. Good morning. So happy for Lee. What a leader. Yes. What a strong dude. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, that guy has the strongest handshake of all men I've ever <laughs> shown. Uh, please state your name for the record. <laughs> Elliot Felchoni, <laughs> Director of the Bradenton Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, the pastor this morning talked about living here as a gift. Leadership is a gift. Real. 
and we can't stand before you all with an employee of the month without good leadership. I carry that to Dr. Hopes as our leader. Uh, I'm only as good as a leader as he is. If he can't lead, I can't lead. He leads. I thought of an analogy last night. Have we ever gone to the beach and we've walked into the, the water and the waves are trying to knock us down? Think about that. Good leaders handle adversity. They find balance when waves are trying to knock us down. So, so important uh, that we reflect on that. If we can maintain balance to fight those waves, to carry on a task for the board, to maintain policy, then we've done our job as administration and additional and more employees a month will come forth more and more every day. With that, uh, I'm not going to say much about Joanna because I know Anna Pohl is, but uh, it's real simple. Look at her smile. Oh, I know. <laughs> it's every day. Uh, it resonates through the telephone to the customers, to her colleagues. Uh, she is the epitome of what we seek uh, as staff for Manatee County government. She does so much. Um, Joanna, I'm so proud of you. Um, thank you for what you do for us and the customers. And um, uh, coincidentally, uh, about two weeks prior to her uh, getting this uh, accolade, she was promoted. Hmm. Uh, so the timing was actually extra special. So with that, I'm going to introduce Anna Pohl. Hello, everyone. I'm Anna Pohl. I'm the general manager over at the Bradenton Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. And I am so happy to be here today to help honor Joanna Belmore with us. Um, for those of you who may not know Joanna, she is really an amazing worker and is just into everything that she does 100%. But most of all about Joanna, as Elliot already said, it's her smile. She smiles every day, and she is just a great coworker and a great person for all the people that are from around the world who come to call um, Manatee County to book the Powell Crosley Estate for events and weddings. And as most of you know, too, the Powell Crosley Estate is all about weddings. We have hundreds and hundreds of weddings there every year. But about a year or so ago, we had COVID and the pandemic. And it was a really, really, really trying time for all of the brides and grooms and families and friends that were hoping to come to Manatee County to get married. So every day when the Powell Crosley was shut down along with all the venues across the country, Joanna was there to answer the phone. And I can't tell you how many people called just crying, completely heartbroken, scared, unsure of what the future would bring, and Joanna was really, truly there for every single person. She changed dates. Mm -hmm. She changed dates again and again, whatever anyone needed. She answered any question. If for some reason dates got changed so much, they had to go someplace else, she helped people even find other places in Manatee County to get married. She is just truly a selfless person, and the best word to describe her is kind, kind beyond measure. And she just works incredibly hard, and her sales skills are just the best. Now, many months and a few years later, she's still helping a lot of the COVID couples that are getting married, but she's also brought in many, many, many more people that want to utilize the Powell Crosley Estate, and that's due to Joanna. And she's really, really great at what she does. She also collaborates with every person on her team. And that also brings even more people to the Powell Crosley Estate. And right now, we're getting about 395 inquiries a month. Wow. And she talks to every one of them. And she smiles every day. So I just can't say how wonderful Joanna is. And Joanna, here you go. Aww. Congratulations. <laughs> Um, I just want to say, oh. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you. This is a tremendous honor. Um, I love, they all told me not to cry and 
Um, it's really an honor to get to live and work in Manatee County, and I'm very honored by this. So thank you all very much. Uh, <laughs> that was so cute. Don't go anywhere. Joanna, don't don't go anywhere quite yet. Uh, there are commissioners on the board who want to uh, to further honor you. Bellamy Servia Whitmore, Commissioner Bellamy. I, I think one of the best kept secrets in Manatee County is not just them communicating, but walking in the convention center and having the opportunity to speak to them. Her smile is very contagious. Um, I've randomly walked in there looking for Ellie, you know, trying to do different things, and I have a ball when I go into the um, in, into the office. And a lot of it's because of that smile right there. And we bounce off and we have a lot of fun, myself, her, and, and Nick. But what you've just heard about her is that, honestly, she's probably the gatekeeper of the tourist community for individuals that want to come to Manatee County. And, and that alone says a lot. The number of the data that was just brought up as far as 395 um, interest calls, maybe, a, is it a month, What a month? I mean, that's a lot going on there. And when I saw it, I smiled because I know her. And then when I go in there, we have a lot of fun and, and she has a lot of energy. So I think the reality of it, I mean, it's your moment and it's your day and you're feeling real good. But I think from the dais, we should be saying thank you for all that you do to make the tourist part of our, of our county so great. Thanks for your commitment. Thank you, Commissioner Bellamy. Commissioner Servia. Yes, thank you. Congratulations, Joanna. And so I would say, what's the biggest customer service challenge? Having a bride that faces COVID, right? Yep. <laughs> so um, I know that, that those have been a lot of difficult phone calls. And I learned a long time ago in high school, I think it was, that when you're having a difficult conversation, just put on a smile because your whole tone's going to change. So thanks for inspiring us through your smile. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Servia. Commissioner Whitmore. I have to say this. After hearing about you, it makes me want to get married no. again. <laughs> I've been married a few times, so <laughs> Scott. <laughs> Don't make me want to get married. <laughs> he still has me beat, yeah. but the anyway. Two of you. <laughs> oh, was that a proposal to, to Scott? <laughs> what that no, was? no, 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 Whit no. Curious. No, no, no. Whitmore, Whitmore and hopes to keep a wedding planner in business. <laughs> oh, that's a match made in heaven. But I wanted to um, tell you when I opened the PDF when I was going through the agenda. <laughs> And you, your smile, I just, start, I, I just started smiling. And, you know, I was, I, I'm married to a plastic surgeon. And it's always first impression is everything. The first, pick, the, the first call that you make that you pick up and you greet that customer, the first impression when they come in means everything. And you reflect Manatee County. So, you know, even our 311 operators, everybody, first impression is everything. So I just want to thank you because you're being recognized today and you deserve to be recognized today. But uh, I, I loved hearing everybody's comments. And no, I'm not getting married again. I'm too old. <laughs> and I'm married. Vowel renewal. Yeah, a vowel renewal. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. For $30,000 at Crosley. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. Commissioner Satcher. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, Joanna, it, it was neat because... On the way in this morning, I was uh, I was listening to the Joy FM uh, local radio station, and uh, Carmen was talking uh, to Dave and Bill, their co-host, the morning co-host or whatever, and uh, she was going through uh, a sermon and talking about, uh, you know, this pastor had said, "What do you think is the main problem when people have relationship problems?" And uh, and so everyone has their thing that they think of, you know, communication or money or whatever. But what the, the case that this pastor was making uh, from the Bible was that the main problem was selfishness, was putting your interest above everyone else's interest. That's right. And then I show up here, and here we have, you know, employee of the month, and the biggest description that comes out for you is they said, you know, she is not selfish. She puts other people's interest first and looks out for them. And uh, so... Uh, I just want to commend you, thank you, and uh, I think we could all learn something from that. You know, it, it seems like in life, when we put others first, uh, things seem to go right for us. I, I remember uh, my first job at 18 was working for Chick-fil-A, 
And, uh, That's why he likes it. <laughs> <laughs> now I know. And, uh, and then went to a school where they actually had a camp and worked at the camp for the summer uh, boys camp. And so the founder, Truett Cathy, would come and, and preach at chapel. And uh, his big thing, he said, that, and people would have bumper stickers that said, I am third. And, you know, you read that and you think, well, what is that? And, of course, that was the point, was to make you, what is that, you know? And, uh, and then the answer was the, to put God first, another second, and I am third. And I think for so many people, when you, when you follow the, you know, Truett's advice, um, you, good things end up happening. And so I just want to thank you uh, for what you do for Manatee County and for the people. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Satcher. Uh, I'm not going to try to follow that. I will, <laughs> I will just say on behalf of Manatee County, Joanna, thank you so much for all of your service to our community. Okay, you figure someone important from Public Works must be next if Sia has made an appearance in the audience. Oh, it's so <laughs> nice to see him here. So we were next going to go to the Retirement Award for Dave Branning, who is an engineer with us, and Mr. Chad Butso, the department head. We'll do the introduction. Mr. Butso. Maybe he won't. I apologize, Denise. You will do the introduction. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to start us off. <laughs> I'm Denise Greer, Development Review Division Manager at Public Works, and we're here to honor Dave Branning. And I've got the short version, three pages here. When I asked him to fill in some of the blanks, it was a lot. So I'm going to try to sum it up quickly. Um, Dave's first day with Manatee County was January 19th, 1987. And that's when his beard was reddish brown. <laughs> right now. Um, that's when Public Works used to be out at 75th Street, west of the old Kmart building, if anybody remembers that. And then in 1983, he reminded me that Public Works moved to the 66th Street complex. So for his first 14 years working at uh, the county, his supervisors included Leonard Carlton, Frank Schultz, Wayne Roberts, Robert Hall, Pat Phillips, and he had many responsibilities at that time. One of them was helping young engineers as, my, as myself learn how to navigate Manatee County, and I can't tell you how much he used to help me um, when I started in 1987 with all the help with all the lift station calculations. I still need help with those, and he's still there. Um, he started out with water and wastewater system designs. Uh, with lift station calculations. He helped prepare the first edition of the Public Works technical spe specifications. He also helped with the water hydraulic model analysis that was done in preparation for the first county water master plan, which won an award uh, from the National Association of Counties in uh, 1990. He helped supervise the wastewater hydraulic analysis and preparation for the first county wastewater master plan, which has been updated several, since, several times since that initial version. He helped coordinate for the county's um, utility main relocations for over 50 DOT and county road improvement projects including the planning, budget preparation, and completion of FDOT agreements, and following it all the way through construction management. He helped review and permit private development utility designs within Manatee County from 1988 to 2000, including many preparation um, of participation agreements with developers for many of the systems that we're using um, right now. So that was the first 14 years of Dave's um, career in Manatee County. And then he took a position with Wilson Miller Engineering, which is now known as Stantec. He worked with them for 10 years, but he didn't really leave the county as most of what he was doing was water and hydraulic analysis for many of the Lakewood Ranch systems that are, we now maintain as a county. He also worked for several other firms, including a contract position for Sarasota County before he returned to Manatee County to finish his last seven years in January of 2015. When he came back, his first supervisor was Chris Mowbray, Scott May, and I think C is here also. 
Um, and he first started identifying all the new water meters and associated them with the three wastewater treatment plants that we have, and that information is used today to help with our master planning. He's also continued his um, coordination with the FDOT on our county road improvements, and he's also helped review and accept bills of sale and defect securities for all the infrastructure that we receive from the private development. With all this, David's had time to play bass guitar in some bands, playing gospel, contemporary Christian, and country music. Him and his wife, Marilyn, hope to travel to New England and out west in the near future. And I would just like to say a special thank you to Dave for all the help that he's given me over the years as a young engineer and his ex expertise, his great work ethic, and um, even through COVID, you know, he's been at home a lot, but he has a great work ethic, always reaching out to anybody who emails him or calls him. And I just wish you happiness and safe travels wherever the road takes you in your retirement. Thank you very much. Wow. Can we get you to cry? So, Ch Chad Butso Public Works. Denise said that and summarized that very well. I just want to highlight a couple of the points on, on what De Denise said. Dave and the teamwork. Dave and the teamwork. Everyone around him has always respected him, always wanted to work with him. Lifted up people that were higher ranking than him, lifted up people that were uh, young and upcoming next to him. Uh, everyone young and old around him benefited by him being there. We've got, I, I, I mean, I'm astounded. Uh, I haven't seen Sia drawn out of the uh, roles in a while, but that's respect. I remember the day uh, when his application crossed Sia's desk to come back from the private sector back to us. Uh, he practically woohooed it in the hallway to say, uh, look at this experience that we're able to bring back in here. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave has helped and done stuff. Uh, uh, the technology that he's seen grown uh, from documenting a paper master plan to what he's had to do for modeling in these days, and then on a dime had to flip to uh, working from home uh, for various reasons, COVID initially, self-benefit and somewhere there, but it, we found in a way by isolating Dave we could steal and get more out of Dave because if he was working from home. So I'm not sure who got the most uh, benefit out of that, but it all worked together. And he adapted and kept a smile on his face to the very last day. Uh, he's got plenty of friends he's earned and worked with in the utilities department. Mike's still here. Robbie's here. Uh, many more would want to be here, but uh, there is work to be done. But we can't say enough and say thank you, uh, Dave. Even Albert... He moved. He was in the bay. He's right here. Albert with DOT for many, many years. The coordination that he did on countless DOT projects with Manatee County Utilities being relocated. So there is a summary, depending on how you look at it. Either Dave knows where to dig or where not to dig in Manatee County. So, Dave, I hope you have a long, happy, joyous retirement. Thank you. Hey, Albert. No. <laughs> oh, I didn't know we were going to talk. <laughs> uh, for the record, Albert Rosenstein, uh, Public Works. Now, I, I spent uh, two plus decades with FDOT, and I communicated a lot uh, with Dave. We'd email each other back and forth. Dave would seem to know where every single Manatee County utility was, whether it's a wastewater line, a force main. I mean, Dave would say things like, yeah, I know about that one. <laughs> That was placed back in 1921, and I was there. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it amazed me throughout all these years how he just knew where everything was very accurately. I always thought that Dave had a superpower, but I, I've never seen a cape, so I think his superpower was the uh, GIS. It kind of helped him out. But the, the man um, really knew exactly where, where many, many things were. Dave has been an institution, though, because he's been very helpful to me since I made the transition over to the county. Um, he, he helps me understand how the system works here. And, and I know he's, he comes to my office and he chats me up, and I'm sure he's never chatted anyone else up here before. <laughs> so um, I, I, I want to thank Dave for not only for what he's done for me and for FDOT and the, the many, many projects that were FDOT, but for the citizens of Manatee County. Every time someone turns on the tap or, or flushes the throne, um, Dave was in the background. I mean, it's because of Dave many, many, many things work. So I want to thank you, Dave. 
it, he it, was it's, it's been a pleasure. And you might say, um, I, I got to add this. Uh -oh. he, no, no, it's not bad. It's, <laughs> oh, come on. You know, we, I've communicated with him for so many years, but I never met him. And I, and I re didn't realize that until I came over to the county. I've, I've met so many people throughout my career, but I've never met him. Now, he may say we've met before. I don't think we've met before. We didn't when you were on DOD. Now, see, that's his superpowers at work. He thinks we met, but no, I've never met him. So it's, it's been a pleasure, Dave. Thank you very much. I appreciate everything you've done for me, for FDOT, and for the citizens in Manatee County. Why I feel old. <laughs> I started the same day as um, our esteemed former county attorney did, Mitchell and Palmer. Oh. oh, wow. We worked together very closely uh, initially because we were doing not only the design, but also all the county specs, fin specs, making sure everything was going well uh, so we could minimize uh, construction claims. So Mickey and I worked very closely together for many years, and each one of us knew, thought the other one had started years before. So we had a great partnership. I've been blessed with having great mentors myself. And the funny thing I was thinking of on the way in here, they all had a common theme, not only because they were engineers or surveyors, with all that experience, but that they took the time to mentor the young people like myself, which I've tried to do since I came to the county. And the other common thread is that the majority had the first name of Bob. Mm -hmm. My first surveying supervisor, Bob Sauer in Kalamazoo, Michigan. <laughs> His young engineer was Bob Janicki. When I came up down here in the Manatee County, I worked for Bob Lombardo, oh, he a great guy. I worked for Bob Hall, our county engineer. And I worked with Bob Hallbach at Wilson Miller's last stand tech. So somehow, never could figure that out. <laughs> but. Maybe I gravitated toward it. All I know is that I, my beard was pretty much the color of Commissioner Satcher when I came on board. And this is what happens when you stick around a while. I can vouch. I have been blessed with a great team of Manatee County staff in the past and present, mainly operations. We worked very hard together to combine our knowledge and experience uh, to minimize problems, to maximize uh, our county system, and be able to support future development. And that includes the water and wastewater modeling. Uh, I have just completed, before I retired, um, the uh, compilation of all of the water meter releases by lip station service area and by wastewater plant. So that not only are they able to use that for the model analysis, but we'll be able to use that for planning and emergency services uh, in the future. So with that, I thank you. And uh, I've been farewell. Dave, on behalf of Manatee County Public Works as well, it's a small token of our wonderful and uh, immense gratitude for your service and uh, just friendship that you've had. Thank you, Chad. Thank you. Don't run away. There's probably. Um, Commissioner Servia, you're first on the board. Yes, thank you so much, and congratulations, Dave. I, 
I really enjoyed hearing the summary that Denise read because I was having all of these flashbacks to the hundreds of times that we sat around a table and looked at projects in Manatee County. Uh, I spent years doing that with you. And, um, and then when I went to work for the private sector, I happened to be in an office right across from Denise. And Denise and I would uh, banter ideas back and forth. And when there was a challenge, I would hear her say, I got to call Dave Branning. <laughs> it was always Dave Branning to call to help out. And I remember when you left and went to Wilson Miller, there was a big hole. It's like, who, who do we call now? <laughs> They called me. They called you oh, yeah. there. So, so I don't know if your phone number is listed, but I would say, um, you know, <laughs> look <close>. out. <laughs> um, First things don't change. <laughs> thank you so much, Dave, um, for all of your service to Manatee County because you truly, your career has made such a positive difference for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Serbia. And, sir, I, I would add... A thank you on behalf of all the citizens of Manatee County and um, you know just say the commissioners our average age is in the upper 50s for our employees here and and this is the type of uh, institutional knowledge uh, that we lose I mean this is a great loss for the for the organization um, because of the knowledge that we lose of course you have every right to retire and go enjoy your <laughs> yourself and and I hope that you absolutely hope that you do um, but this is this is a great example of us losing another you know priceless asset for for our organization um, wish you all the best, sir. Dr. Hopes, you're next on the board. Uh, congratulations, and uh, we always have plenty of work for you if you get bored. Mm -hmm. uh, and for Chad, I'm not sure how you're going to fill the void. Yeah. We have a clock is ticking on the FRS rules. <laughs> okay. Well, a year later, you could come back. Thank you. A year or two years? Uh, Thanks a year. Is it a year? Okay. Thank you very much, sir, and wish you all the best. Um, okay, next is presentation of awards to commissioners serving on various boards. And this is for the chair. Um, I do not see a list of awards. It's on our agenda, but it's TDC, chair. So TDC and uh, Reggie for the board. Reggie. What number, what, 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 what number is on, I on say my let's agenda? Do Reggie. <laughs> No yeah, let me let me pull it up for you. I lost my the the first the first is the why don't, why don't past we go ahead and, year. Why don't we go ahead and move forward with uh, proclamations, and idea. we'll follow up with this Great when we're finished. Um, so we're going to move forward with proclamations, and we are going to well, we'll go ahead and do a motion now to approve the proclamation. To approve the proclamation. Second. Okay, Commissioner Serbia has made a motion to approve. Commissioner Bellamy has seconded. Uh, we'll open this up to public comment. Is there anyone who would like to come forward to speak? from the public on proclamations. Seeing none, I'll check with Seth, and there is no one on the phone either. All right, then we'll move forward with a vote. All in Sir. I'm sorry? Oh, you have a young this, lady. I, I do see someone from the audience who would like to come forward. If we're voting, we have to have public comment. So this young lady is going to come forward and speak on proclamations, likely on the Cracker Trail Ugh. proclamation. But wouldn't she come up during the proclamation? Yeah, yeah don't yeah. come up until during. This is a public comment. I, I believe the vote was to approve them, not on individual proclamations. So she can only talk about whether or not we should approve them, not the right. specific. So, vote. young lady, Carol, you're, come you'll come back and, and speak later. So no one's going to speak at public comment. We'll go ahead and hold the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Clerk, it passes unanimously. So the order of the proclamations will be Black History Month, Cortez Fishing Festival, Cracker Trail, uh, Eating Disorder Awareness Week, and Parish Heritage Day. We will start with Black History Month, and Commissioner Bellamy has asked to give this to read this proclamation. Commissioner Bellamy, the floor is yours. Good morning. I would ask my great friend, the NAACP president, Mr. Robert Powell, to join me at the podium so we can read the proclamation and he can accept it, and I think he may have some comments. I will read the proclamation. Board of County Commissioners, Manatee County, Florida. Whereas Black History Month dates back to 1926 and observes African American achievements. And whereas Black History Month celebrates the achievements and contributions of African Americans in the United States. And whereas Black History Month's intent 
is not only to increase the knowledge of black history and black communities, but also to spread the issue of American society as a whole. Whereas all members of the nation are affected by black history because it is a part of American history, which should be celebrated by everyone. Whereas Black History Month has become a symbolic time period in which the appreciation and celebration of African Americans began every year and continue, continues all year. Whereas the 2022 theme of Black History Month is Black Health and Wellness, which explores the legacy of not only black scholars and medical practitioners in Western medicine, but also other ways of knowing, in parentheses, e.g. birth workers, duels, midwives, oh Lord, not our past, herbalists, etc. throughout the, the African diaspora. That's a tough word for me. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of County that February 22nd, 20, February 2022 shall be known, designated, and set aside as Black History Month in Manatee County, Florida, and the board further calls upon the people of Manatee County to recognize this special observance with the appropriate ceremonies and activities adopted with the quorum represented, I mean, with the quorum present and voted on the 8th day of February, signed by our great chair, my man KBO. Before I, okay. Be before I pass to um, my great, great friend, and as I reflect, on African American History Month nationally. Obviously, I think about the great Dr. Martin Luther King and um, the great Mary McLeod Bethune from a national standpoint. But when I think about local, <coughs> excuse me, and some of the trailblazers here in Manatee County, um, there was a, a, a text message that came out from one of our board members this morning. It was a photo. And um, on, on that photo, and I'm not saying this because my last name is connected to it, but there, this is African American history. On that, on that photo, you have three African American gentlemen. Mm -hmm. And I'll just briefly tell you about their history and their impact to Manatee County here locally. One was a, a man by the name of Sylvester Bellamy, and he was one of the first African American sheriff deputies here in Manatee County. The other one in that photo was the legendary, was the legendary Eddie Shannon, who I had a great opportunity to speak with yesterday, and we're preparing to celebrate his 100th um, um, birthday on March the 7th. And what he has done in our community um, to be almost a, a century old, it impacted countless amount of individuals um, Obviously, the word legend is what, what comes to your mind when you think about Eddie Shannon. Now for the one that the, the, the photo was acknowledging and highlighting was Ray Bellamy, who broke the color, and yes, he is my uncle, who broke the color barrier at the University of Miami and was the first African American to sign a football scholarship in the South in the late 1960s. And I did not know, I did not know how huge that was until I worked in Michael Jordan um, camp and George Ravelin, if you know anything about George Ravelin, he's the one who owns the official speech of the I Have a Dream speech. If you watch the video, you'll see Dr. Martin Luther King hand a piece of paper off to a young man walking off the stage. And that young man is George Ravelin. George Ravelin ran Nike operations for Michael Jordan. Going a lot of African American history here, hang in there. George Ravelin ran Nike operations for Michael Jordan. And he asked me, did I know Ray Bellamy? No. And I was in Santa Barbara, California at that particular time. And I asked him, why did he know? I mean, why is he asking me? He's like, you got to know that he broke the color barrier in the South for athletes. And I looked at him, well, you need to know that that's my dad's brother. Uh -huh. And that's my uncle. In Manatee County, we're very, 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 very rich here in African American history. And there's a lot of things that have taken place. But I'd venture to say not just African American history. 
I think we should move forward in the same way we acknowledge the African American history. We should bring forward the, the, the Heritage Month in October and talk about the Latino um, cultures and make sure that they're acknowledged. Also, I will stand down now and pass this to my great friend, Robert Brown, NAAC President. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, as always, um, Commissioner Bellamy, whenever we're in the same uh, place, he always Sir, takes pull, my pull the microphone down towards you <clears throat> so we can hear you better. Thank you. He always takes what I'm going to say. He always <laughs> takes my speech. So, um, I want to say I, my name is Robert Powell. If you don't know who I am, I'm um, the president of the Manatee County chapter of NAACP. And I just want to say um, I consider this a tremendous honor to be able to accept this proclamation um, for on, on behalf of the NAACP. And I want the uh, commissioners to know, you know, we may not always agree, you know, on things. However, I hope that we continue to have a level of respect and um, for each other and continue to, to move forward and make Manatee County better. I thank you all. I do appreciate the things that you do. I know it's difficult on, on your end as well as my end, but just know that anytime if I'm addressing you guys, I'm addressing you guys from the community standpoint. And, you know, we, like I said, we may not agree, but let's always stay together and, and have that level of respect. Thank you very much. All right. Yes, sir. Very well said. Commissioner Servia, you're on the board. Yes, I just want to thank you both gentlemen for presenting that proclamation and for being here. Um, in celebration of Black History Month, I chose to read a book called The, the Warmth of Other Suns. Uh, it's an excellent book that details the migration of black citizens from the south to the north for decades um, and what they went through. And so take this opportunity in celebrating black history to learn more about that segment of American history. And thank you both for what you do. Yes, thank you both so much for coming. Any other, anybody else on the board? Commissioner Satcher. <laughs> you, well, you're clearly about to speak, so. <laughs> um, uh, what an amazing, uh, you know, history there to share. And uh, so I just want you to know I'm, I'm, I'm impressed and, uh, and I appreciate you and, uh, you know, uh, we've see you have to choose your words carefully, but um, I want you to know that uh, I sure do love you, men, and uh, and the community that you represent, and appreciate you and everything that you bring uh, to the county and to each of us. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Satcher. Commissioner Ball. I just wanted to say that it's an honor to have you with us this morning. And I think sometimes we all get so caught up in, in current events and, and rumors and hearsay, and, and we forget how special Manatee County we are with the diversity that we have in our great county. And um, I just wanted to say thank you for making sure that we keep our diversity alive and that we learn to, <coughs> to live together, get along, and make it the best it can be. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ball. Commissioner Whitmore. I wasn't going to say anything, and um, I just remembered something. Um, a long time ago, Gwen Brown and I are, were good friends, and we lost her to COVID. She was a county commissioner. <coughs> commissioner Van ha Hamen and Mayor Chappie are here, and they, know, they knew her well. And my daughter wrote me a Mother's Day um, book about all different things. And my husband was a surgeon, as you all know. And he would say, once you do the incision, everybody's the same underneath. And she wrote a, 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 a card to Gwen and say, my mother taught me this. And we were really close friends. And I just think that, you know, people forget, you know, we all, we all need to work together. And everybody uh, deserves respect no matter who you are. Everybody deserves a chance in life, no matter who you are. <clears throat> and I want to thank you for taking the lead for the NAACP. You're wonderful to work with. And um, I think you've been a good leader. So I just wanted to say that. But uh, Gwen Brown was a special person, as all of you all know. I think she was the first, uh, Jane could correct me when she comes up, the first black 
chairman of the board of Manatee County that I can recall. First female, definitely. And um, But I just wanted to uh, tell you, thank you for stepping up. Because no matter what position you lead in, it's always hard. So thank you, Coach. All right, thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. I don't see anyone else on the board. So, sir, I'll just thank you again for coming down and speaking. Thank you so much. All right, our next proclamation is the annual Cortez Fishing Festival, and it'll be presented by Commissioner Whitmore. And before she starts, I'll say this is a wonderful festival that takes place in District 3. Yeah. I would actually, where's Rocky? I didn't see Rocky getting up. Rocky, you need to come down. You are more than, and you are old time Cortez. You're a surfer. Come on. You need to be here. <laughs> Mayor Chappie's here too. I think that if you guys want to come down, you're more than welcome. But I know some people get shy. And I'm honored. Thank you. Mr. Chair, for allowing me to read this. I think this is only maybe the second time I've ever been able to read this. So I, this means a lot to me, as you know. I actually probably went to the first festival 40 years ago, so I appreciate it. Whereas 40 years have come and gone, and still the party with a purpose carries on. And whereas music, art, and seafood galore will be served to thousands along the shore, and whereas the Florida Institute of Saltwater Heritage and Cortez Village Historical Society report that they are still here and still clean, uh, gearing up. And whereas Cortez fishing families now celebrate more than 130 years of feeding the multitudes and the Florida Institute of Saltwater Heritage continues the large scale habitat restoration project that is the Fish Preserve, the largest and last undeveloped stretch of shoreline on the North Sarasota Bay. And whereas 40th annual Cortez fishing festival will be held on February 19th and 20th, with the theme, Gearing Up. Now therefore be proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County, Florida, that district, I mean, that floor, February 19th and 20th, 2022, shall be known, designated, and set aside as 40th Annual Cortez Commercial Fishing Festival Days in Manatee County, adopted with a quorum present, and voted this eighth day of February 2022. Signed by Commissioner uh, Chairman uh, Kevin Van Osterbridge, and thank you very much. And I know Commissioner Va um, Von Hamid is going to come up and speak. She's here with her famous husband, Rocky Von Hamid, <laughs> and Mayor Chappie. So I'm going to let Commissioner Von Hamid speak, and congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, we do have invitations for you to come to the festival. And if Chris, would you just hand them to? The attorney. Hi, and um, they'll pass them down for us. Thanks. First of all, we want to thank Manatee County for uh, this proclamation. 40 years later, and we're still there. We're still doing our best to preserve what we have to protect the history that is the village of Cortez and the community that is the village of Cortez. But, you know, we couldn't do it without partnerships. And one of our biggest partnerships is right here with Manatee County, not only because of the partnership we have with you on the preserve, which is moving forward, but also the festival itself. We partner with Manatee County to provide off-site parking and bus rides to the festival to keep some of that traffic off our road because we know at this time of year we are inundated with traffic. And we also partner with uh, utilities, solid waste, to provide for garbage pickup and recycling that comes from the festival. So there's a lot that we do. GT Bray is the, is the site for off-site parking and Coquina Beach. So we want to thank you first and foremost for, for allowing us to do that. We see a lot of new faces up here on the board, and we hope you will come out Come join us. It is a fun time. I guarantee you, you'll have a fun time. And we'd like to introduce you at 1 o'clock on Saturday where we just, we have the blessing of the fleet and then we uh, present a couple of awards and we introduce any um, dignitaries that are there. Mayor Chappie comes almost every year. And so we hope, especially our own representative, um, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge, we hope you can make it out to see us as well as Commissioner Satcher and Cruz and our new county administrator, Mr. Hope. We hope you can come out and see us. We still want all the people. No, we still want all the all the returnees. Hear what he said. But you aren't invited. But we want all the returnees. We just want to recognize that you are new 
and we recognize that, so we want to welcome you as a community. So join us. We have great entertainment, and we have incredible food and uh, artists galore. So there's something for everyone. Kids area, pony rides, we do the best we can to provide, as the um, proclamation said, the best party with a purpose in Manatee County. And it is a party. It is. So I also would like um, to ask Angela. I'd like to introduce my friends, Angela Collins. She's with Sea Grants, and she's our protector of waters and preserve, and she's worked really hard. I want to ask her to speak a little bit to that. We have Steve Baker, who is on our board. We have um, Chris Martinez, not on our board, but she is a key player in this festival. She works like so hard to make sure everything is done. We start this process in October, so we've been hard at it. And then in the very back is Dave Kabnis. He's our, our vice president. So if anybody else would like to speak, you're welcome to, but I would like Angela to speak a little bit about the preserve. Yeah, absolutely. Good morning, everybody. My name is Angela Collins. I'm with the University of Florida and Florida Sea Grant. I'm really happy to be here today to help present the Cortez Commercial Fishing Festival. And I wanted to make a note that this isn't just about celebrating the maritime heritage and commercial seafood production in Cortez's history. It's also about our future. Commercial seafood production in the state of Florida generates billions of dollars every year. In Manatee County, it supports hundreds of jobs and creates millions of lands, millions of pounds of seafood that is available to our tourists and residents every year. So it's very important to the economy of the state as well as our cultural heritage. The festival really is a party with a purpose. Every single penny that is generated through the proceeds of the Cortez Commercial Fishing Festival go right back into the conservation and the restoration of the fish preserve, which is that 95-acre plot of land just east of the fishing village, supports hundreds of species of birds and fish, and a lot of the recreational and commercial species that are so important to our fisheries begin life in estuaries that are just like the fish preserve. So it really is a party with a purpose. We're really happy that this year we are back in business, and we hope that you can join us for the 40th annual festival. So, so come on out. Um, if you want to ride the bus, you can park at GT Beret and ride the bus. If you're out on the island, you can park at uh, uh, Coquina Beach and get to us much more easily. But we are coming back with a vengeance because we missed 2021 thanks to this terrible pandemic, which took so much from so many people. But we are so blessed to be here in this state, and we are so blessed to live in a village that is just doing its best to keep what we have, to recognize the heritage that is part of Manatee County, and that's Cortez Village. So thank you very much. Hope you come out. Oh, okay, yeah, we, ha we do charge an admission fee, and that admission fee is $5. And what we have also done in order to support the Boy Scouts is we have offered them our parking area to, as a donation, people who park in the parking lot, we ask them to make a donation of $5 to the Boy Scouts because they, they did some bridge work out on the, uh, we had an Eagle Scout project that did some great bridge restoration out there, and we're excited to um, be partners with the Boy Scouts on that. So um, anything else I'm forgetting? <laughs> Thank you very much. Very well said, Commissioner Von Hamann. Thank you so much. You're a, you're a great spokesperson mm -hmm. for this event. Um, I've been to, I grew up here, I've been to more Cortez Fish Festivals than I can possibly count. I've been Not as a commissioner. <laughs> few, not as a commissioner, you're right. A few years ago I got caught in a torrential downpour uh, during a fish festival, um, but we still had fun. I still sat there and ate my food and just poured the water out of the basket and kept going. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Um, and it is, it is a fantastic event. Of course, it's family friendly, um, and, and I think you touched on it well. You know, people should really understand and appreciate how lucky we are that we live in the state of Florida and that events like this are taking place. Um, first of all, you know, most of the country, you can't have an outdoor event in the middle of February. Um, so that's not going to work right off the bat. Uh, but then so many places are shut down and people aren't allowed to gather like this. And, and we live in free Florida and have the greatest governor in the state. And so I hope everybody will come out to District 3 and come out to Cortez, park at GT Bray and go down to the Fish Festival and have a wonderful time. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. All right, next on the list is the Florida Cracker Trail, which will be presented by Commissioner Baugh. I would ask that Commissioner Satcher join me at the podium. And Commissioner Satcher will co-host 
the presentation of the Florida Cracker Trail. I asked Commissioner Satcher to join me here at the podium Where are you? Um, because as we all know because of the redistricting he is now our rural commissioner so that's pretty special seriously you're very fortunate so I'm going to read half of this then I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Satcher uh, and I don't have my glasses so pray for me um, whereas in the early 1500s, Spanish conquistador Juan Ponce de Leon landed on the shores of Florida in an attempt to colonize. Thwarted by Navid, N Native Americans, the colonists abandoned their quest, leaving behind the first livestock in North America, horses, hogs, and cattle. And whereas by the 1800s, as settlers moved south, so did the cattle, searching for new pastors. And following the Civil War, early settlers along Florida's east coast and central corridor became known as Florida Crackers, to compliment. Cracker cowmen, or cow hunters. The Crackers relied on bull whips to flush cows out of the palmetto scrub and spur on oxen that pulled their carts and wagons. The snaps of these whips could break the sound barrier, if you haven't heard it, it is loud, making a loud crack. This sound earned the cowmen the nickname of Crackers. And whereas each year the Crackers gathered west of Fort Pierce to drive their herd of scrub cattle west across the state toward Bradenton and then to Tampa, Punta Gorda, and Punta Rasna to ship them to Cuba. The Cracker Trail was the only dry route across Florida. And Commissioner Satcher, you take over right there. Whereas, in 1987, a group of individuals came together to form the Cracker Trail Association to recreate a part of Florida's past that has become a traditional event. The annual cross-state ride is a reenactment of the return trip from Bradenton to Fort Pierce. It commemorates the dedication of the Florida Cracker Trail and honors the Cracker cowmen and their history. And, whereas, the 2022 cross-state cross -state ride will be held February 19th through February 26th in remembrance of Jennifer Osterling, who for more than 20 years was a Florida Cracker Trail Association member, trail boss, assistant trail boss, and outrider. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County, Florida, that February 19th through 26, 2022, shall be known, designated, and set aside as Florida Cracker Trail Ride Week in Manatee County, Florida, in memory of Jennifer Osterling, adopted with a quorum present and voting this 8th day of February 2022, signed by the Chairman of the Board of County Commissioners, Kevin Van Austinbridge, and attested to by Clerk of the Courts, Angelina Colonesso. Thank you. Ms. Feltz, I believe you're here to receive this proclamation. No, you do it. All right. So, let me say, well, I appreciate you bringing this up, and, uh, you know, when we look at uh, so many things in the United States of America, there is no doubt uh, that our history keeps moving on and keeps moving forward. Um, but when we stay rooted and grounded and remember some of the things that, that uh, make our nation great, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it pains me to see that when a group of people may pick out um, something to be, uh, to rally around or to say this is something that represents us, our spirit, um, to somehow take that as some sort of an offense. Other groups have, have done that. And, uh, and I disagree with it. There's nothing wrong with us, you know, looking back and saying, this is something special and unique about America. And sure, you know, are there many people right now in the middle of Florida driving, doing this day after day or, or week after week? There's some, um, but there's fewer than there used to be. That doesn't mean um, that we shouldn't respect and honor uh, that heritage, and especially those people that are that still do that today. And so, thank you so much for bringing this up uh, before the board. And I wanted to present this to you in any words you have to say. Thank you. I'm very, very appreciative of this. Um, Jen Osterling was quite a character, and I guarantee you, if she was standing up here right now, um, 
it would be interesting. I have something for you all. Um, <laughs> if, if, can they can do it, yeah. Or somebody, here, you. Put your district commissioner to work. Um, I just wanted to note, uh, Kevin and I <clears throat> have uh, ridden the Cracker Trail. I think we've both been involved for about 15 to 20 years. And if, if we don't really explain what we do, but uh, we'll be starting um, February 19th up there around the um, Manatee Museum where the train is. And what you're going to see going down uh, 64 is usually we have about 100 horses on the road. And we ride our horses about 20 miles a day. Um, and then we move camp every single night riding those 20 miles a day. Um, what we do is we camp at various places across the state. Um, Adam Putnam's Ranch was one of the places we camped at, uh, Duck Adams Place. Um, the Cracker Trail used to actually start on Lorraine Road. Years ago when it started, it was on Lorraine Road. It was then moved out to uh, Hunsader's. Um, then we had to move to the Swiftbud property at Rutland Ranch. Now we're in, uh, at Kibler Ranch. And the reason for that is um, the logistics in getting 200 horses across the state at 20 miles a day and moving camp and all that kind of stuff. What I've uh, given you all is a copy of the book called The Land Remembered by Patrick Smith. Um, it is historical fiction but it tells you a little bit about the history of Florida um, in terms of the first settlers here, um, how they used the uh, livestock, again, left by the Spanish explorers, and created an industry. At one time, Florida was the, I believe we were the second largest cow-calf producing uh, state in the nation. Uh, we had cow hunters here well before the West was won. And what I'm very honored today is to let you know that this book was once required reading for our fourth and fifth graders in Manatee County Schools. And there is a reason for that. And the other thing that I think is very joyous about February is that we share this history and this Heritage Month with so many facets of Manatee County. Uh, our Heritage Festival, our Seafood Heritage Festival, our parish, Heritage Festival. These are all the facets of Manatee County. And those books are a gift from the Florida Cracker Trail. We'd like for all of our commissioners to come out to our send off uh, February 19th. And we'd have more people here, but you have to understand that these are people. Our president is a farrier, he's somewhere in a barn right now. But Kevin. Webb, our sheriff's person here, he's been on the ride many, many years with me, riding stirrup to stirrup. And uh, I think you were trail boss and president? Two years. Two years. And I really would like to invite you all to come out here. Um, my family personally uh, settled the town of Manatee. Uh, they went from being uh, Key West conks to being Florida crackers. And uh, that's quite a um, heritage that I'm very proud of here. And I hope you all read the book. If you haven't, um, it should be required reading mm -hmm. for everyone who comes to the state of Florida to understand where we came from and where we can go. And I am extremely appreciative of this. And I know Jen would be very, very proud of herself and proud of the Cracker Trail right now and proud of our county for recognizing this. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Ms. Feltz. Um, interestingly enough, Commissioner Whitmore, you're first on the board. I, I just have one question. Carol, don't leave. What is anybody owning this like on the county side? I mean, is anybody uh, is anybody owning this, attending this is what I want to know. The Cortez Festival is the 19th and 20th. I mean, do you know, I'm asking Scott. What, we what they'll be doing is, um, <clears throat> we'll be starting at Kibler Ranch, but there's a small contingent. Um, we don't bring all the horses into town. We just have a small contingent of um, a few riders and wagons that will be, I think the logistics are, they're going to park at the uh, VA uh, parking lot on 64, 
and then trailer up the horses, and then they'll uh, hitch the wagons and get on the horses and then ride from uh, Manatee Historic Village back to the uh, VA. We wow. were trying to get um, the museum open and get, you have to understand when people are getting on the road for a week with their horses and all, they don't pretty much do have much time to do these kind of things. So it's going to be there. I mean, you can't help but notice there's 50 horses and a wagon in the middle of Manatee Avenue, but, but that's where we'll be. Okay. And if any of the commissioners would like to ride, we do have wagons available. For and horses. So. Yeah, I've ridden, and I rode a horse, not a wagon. Hey. Um, Commissioner Cruz, you're next on the board, sir. Oh, all I'm going to say is thank you for the book. It's funny. When we were up at Tallahassee, we were in, I think it was Senator Gruder's office. Yeah. And he, has a, he had a copy. In fact, all of the senators and House reps had, because this year they handed this book out to everybody up in the legislature. I had never read it. I, I've read The Gulf and Swamp Peddlers and a, a lot of other books about Florida history, but not this. So as soon as I got back, I tried to reserve it at the library. My library card was expired, so it took two weeks to get that fixed. But I actually just reserved this at the library, so now I don't have to take the library's <laughs> copy because there actually is a back date on it. I think I was like well, number nine uh, on the list. Patrick so Smith is, has since passed. Um, he was actually the poet laureate for the state of Mississippi. His son um, uh, does did do presentations, um, and we'd like the Cracker Trail to start doing that again. I do have my whip in my car, so if anybody wants to learn how to crack a, wi crack a whip okay. at lunchtime. Um, we have security. Yeah. yeah. Well, they wouldn't let me bring it in. Yeah, the therapy guns. goat's tied up there, too, guns, but, yeah. you know. But anyway, yes, uh, we will be giving uh, whip cracking lessons uh, at, the, at the museum. Perfect. Ooh. All right. Thank you. Good so way to lose an ear. I'll, I'll just close this out saying that um, I have participated in the Cracker Trail. Um, more of the dinner slash party at Doug Adams Ranch uh, and less riding. But, uh, <laughs> but I, have ridden, I have ridden the first leg of it um, and ridden all over uh, Mr. Adams Ranch as well. And it is a great time and it is a great tribute to the heritage of our state. So thank you so much for coming. And I did know uh, Jen Osterling as well. Uh, I hadn't seen her in several years, but she was quite a character and a tremendous loss and shock of a loss for the community as well. Thank you so much for coming, Ms. Feltz. All right. Um, Next on our list today is we're going to skip ahead and do, since Commissioner Satcher is already down there, we'll do the Parish Heritage Day in Manatee County, and that will be read by Commissioner James Satcher, the District Commissioner. Right. Jennifer and Gretchen will come join me. Good morning. Good morning. I can't even get off my chair today, let alone a horse. You got, you got yeah. swag. You get one of those guns. <laughs> I know, I know. You gotta shoot those things. Aww. Well, they took it from me up the Parish door. doesn't so skimp. <laughs> Not that anyone else does, but I'm just saying. We miss you. Good job. He, work, he works for Green Meadow now. Lucy already directed. All right. They don't like you, Bill. I'm sorry. Oh, we miss you. <laughs> I know Palmetto loves you. Oh, you know my size. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully it's not a small. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Satcher, I think you're good to start. All right. Uh, proclamation from the Board of County Commissioners, Manatee County, Florida. Whereas the parish community has been celebrating its rich history for more than 80 years through Parish Heritage Day festivities and whereas since 1980, the Parish Heritage Day parade has been a hallmark of the community, and whereas this year marks the 42nd Parish Heritage Day Festival, and whereas Parish Heritage Day continues to teach Manatee County citizens the rich culture Manatee County has to offer in the parish area. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County, Florida, that March 5th, 2022 shall be known, designated, and set aside as Parid Parish Heritage Day in Manatee County, Florida, adopted with a quorum present and voting this 8th day of February, 2022, signed by the Board of County Commissioners Chairman Kevin Van Austinbridge, attested to by the Clerk of the Court, Angelina Colonesso. And so I wanted to, without a long speech, um, I just wanted to say on, on behalf of someone who has the honor of uh, really being in some ways adopted 
uh, by the parish area and the community. Um, I'm just so grateful for what we see every day. Um, you know, we go in this, our social circles and in our, uh, you know, Facebook circles, you see people um, that continually defend others. Boy, if you talk bad about a restaurant and parish, you know, a hundred comments show up. Don't talk, they, they threw in the best they can, don't be. And, uh, you know, so, so just a really neat uh, a community to be a part of, to raise a family in, uh, to live in. And of course, you know, we all know there's uh, lots of change happening, um, but I see us uh, as being anchored uh, to the things that make America great and parish set up to be uh, already is and set up to remain uh, just the greatest community in these United States. So with that, I wanted to present this to, who am I, to Ms. Her Civic Association. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for this. I appreciate it very much. I'm Gretchen, the president of the Parish Civic Association, and I have Jennifer Hamey with me. She's our treasurer, and Xavier Clone, who helps us with the volunteers and has been a part of setting this up for many, many years, and you all know him. He was a former employee here um, for many years also. So I wanna thank you for the proclamation. There's um, a couple things I wanted to share about the Parish Heritage Day um, Parade and Festival. The parade actually has been going on for, we went back 80 years as far as we could find. Um, it started with a few people walking around the building, the schoolhouse that's there, the one of the few remaining buildings that is there. And the Heritage Festival was a potluck. Mm -hmm. They would walk around the building and have a potluck, and that was the festival. All the town got together and did that. So we've taken it and grown it, obviously. Um, we have now several thousand people that come out to this event. The Parish Heritage Day um, Festival and Parade is brought to you by the Parish Civic Association, but it's free to the community. We get sponsors, we use our membership money, and we also use the money we get from our paper, which is the Parish Village News, um, to put this on so the community can come out and enjoy all the festivities without having to worry about paying for it. So that's another plus that we really want people to know, that we take the money that we gather as the civic organization and put it back into the community. And this is just one of many events. So this one, um, just to give you an idea, we have, I think we figured out at least 60 vendors coming. Mm. We've got food trucks, animals, rides, including the bungee, rock climbing, mechanical shark, and a Zorb track, which I'd like to see maybe a couple of you <laughs> running on the Zorb track. George, do the it's rock the big climbing. giant balls that you run on a track and you can race each other. No. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> I'd Gotta love to see that, that one. I'll we have carnival it. games, face painting. We have live music with one of the local favorites going to um, play. Uh, Jacked Up is the name of the band. Um, we have cheer demos and line dancing, and we also have the early learning coalitions coming out. They're going to hand out books. We've got the Parish Pioneering Returns this year. We haven't had that in a couple years, and we're going to have a bullwhip uh, contest, and a, they're going to have a blacksmith. We're going to have the history of Parish displayed and uh, under the PCA tent and with our local historians explaining it. There's going to be pictures of the history of Parish. And then we also are doing this in front of Parish Community High School, and we partnered with them. They are going to provide... Um, the parking and allow us to have parking there and use the space in front. And that's one of the pluses of having a community high school as the reason why we decided to go with Parish Community High School and they are very helpful and want to do what they can. The drum line's gonna also help step off the parade. We're gonna have the uh, parish band, the uh, marching band is gonna be in the parade. These are some new things that we haven't had before. So uh, we're really looking forward to that. Parade steps off at 10 on 121st. Um, the festival starts at 11. It goes till 3. Um, we are going to, we end at the front of the high school, but it's also the front of the new park that we're hoping to get soon. We have been working on this for several years, and the reason we asked for this park was because of things like this. We do 
provide community events throughout the year and we wanted a festival park we have no place to go we we actually going to be on fort hamer road for this festival we don't have space big enough so we are really looking forward to having this festival park because the park is where we are going to have these events and have the space and the amenities to do this so we thank you and we hope this next year is our goal is that we will actually have it at this new parish community park and we will be able to um have many more people and i'm trying <laughs> just a reminder <laughs> that we are really really wanting this park and that's why because we do this for the community we bring these to the community and this is the way we can do this and we need space because as you know we are growing uh, exponentially so thank you for the proclamation and i hope to see you all there and maybe a couple of you on the zorb track okay yeah, i want to see that all right I don't thank you gretchen uh, I would merge Commissioner Satcher's two proclamations today and say that he is really cracking the whip around here to try to get your park done. Um, so hopefully your, your park will be completed sooner than later. Uh, I have Whitmore and Hopes on the board. Commissioner Whitmore. Uh, yeah, I was going to say it under comments, but since you're here, I, I talked to Charlie Bishop last night because I know you still had questions. I know you've met with Commissioner Satcher and myself, and I think Commissioner Cruz and... I'm going to be asking to have a meeting with the PCA and um, Charlie and myself because uh, I know you want to deal with the engineer, but the engineer works for us. But anyway, so I'm going to um, be calling, asking if you can meet, and I think Commissioner Satcher's done the same thing. But anyway, he told me last night that he'd make a commitment to uh, have you know, set this up with us, so I, with that. But I, I want to tell you, Parrish has come into his own. I I saw this happen to Cortez. We're starting to see it in Mayaka with this focus group, how people are starting to uh, see what they want to see. Cookie and Ben Jordan came here and kind of started the whole thing with Norma. But And now the PCA, the, the Parrish Civic Association, owns that newspaper. So they're able to put their money where their mouth is. Yeah, they, I know in whatever they've been doing in the village or, or downtown area, they're actually paying for engineers, consultants, out of the money they make out of their, pay, their paper. So, and I know you're recruiting new membership. So I want to tell you all I'm proud of you for doing that. And uh, is it, it's not a cookie chill off and it's not at the um, train anymore? No, that's a separate event. Oh, okay. That's with the Parish Foundation. Yeah, right, right. I know, I know. Okay, so um, it's going to be a different route at ten, and we and you don't register; you just go in line like just they do on the island. Paper. You if just any, sign up. If any commissioners want to attend, though, let us know. We'll get a car for you, so you can. Okay. We'll so if any around. commissioners want. Yourself. Okay. <laughs> all right. I just want to tell you all, Xavier, we miss you very much at the county, but I know you're the head of CRA in Palmetto. The direct, yeah. Well, congratulations, and um, we all look forward to going to your event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. Dr. Hopes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, uh, I think on March 5th, Commissioner Satcher will have some very good news for you. Uh, a lot has occurred in the past week since he and I have sort of double teamed the negotiations, let's say, about uh, the final land acquisition for the park in parish oh, uh, so I'll be discussing with with each of you individually yep. where we believe we've landed uh, and so stay tuned I'm, I'm confident that your county commissioner uh, will be able to deliver some very favorable news that may very well get you on that park uh, next year for uh, for this event Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hopes. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you so much for coming down. Thank you, Commissioner Satcher and Xavier. Um, next is going to be the National Eating Disorder Awareness Week in Manatee County, adoption of that proclamation. It will be presented by Commissioner Cruz. All right, last proclamation of the day. Uh, <coughs> whereas February 21st through February 27th, 2022 is National Eating Disorder Awareness Week, 
a national campaign organized by National Eating Disorder Association to shine a spotlight on eating disorders for educating the public, spreading a message of hope, and putting life-saving resources into the hands of those in need. And whereas in the United States, 20 million women and 10 million men will suffer from an eating disorder at some point in their lives. And whereas eating disorders are serious but treatable mental and physical illnesses that can affect people of all genders, ages, races, religions, ethnicities, sexual orientations, body shapes, and weights. And whereas eating disorders have the second highest mortality rate of all mental health disorders, surpassed only by opioid addiction. And whereas eating disorders are widely misunderstood illnesses and support option and support options are often inaccessible. Only about one third of people ever receive treatment for their eating disorder. As a result, too many people are left feeling helpless, hopeless, and frightened. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County, Florida, that February 21st through 27th, 2022, shall be known, designated, and set aside as National Eating Disorder Awareness Week in Manatee County, Florida, adopted with a quorum present and voting this 8th day of February, 2022, signed by our chair, Kevin Van Ostenbridge, and the clerk of the court, Angelina Colonesso. Okay, you're All right. There Thank you, go. Commissioner Cruz. Who is here to accept? Hi, sir. Danielle Geyer, Parks and Natural Resources. Hey. Thank you, commissioners, for accepting this proclamation and for allowing me just a few moments of your time to explain why National Eating Disorder Awareness Week is just so important. So last year I was here to present this proclamation as a message of hope to others based on my own ex experience and recovery. Getting the message of hope out to the public is extremely important, but information is important as well. Information that not only relays the signs and symptoms of an eating disorder, but information that stresses the prevalence, seriousness, and realities of an eating disorder. There are many misconceptions about eating disorders, especially from those who have not experienced one themselves. I have heard eating disorders being described as someone just struggling with the body image, someone who has an unhealthy relationship with food, or someone just who wants to lose weight. And that barely scratches the surface of the many complicated layers of an eating disorder. I could talk for hours about it, but I'm not, and I think I could just sum it up in a most recent example. I recently listened to a podcast of a woman who recovered from an eating disorder, and in this podcast, she described her eating disorder as, and I quote, a devil inside of her, and no matter how much she wanted to recover or no matter how much she knew her behaviors were unhealthy, that eating disorder voice inside her head always took over and took control. When I heard that, at first I was like, oh, that sounds a little dark, but it's exactly what an eating disorder is like from my own experience. Recovery looks different for everyone, so I will only speak to my own in stating that part of recovery is not only first admitting you have a problem, which is why getting information out is so important, but also learning to coexist with your eating disorder and realizing that your healthy self is so much stronger and wiser than your eating disorder self. Recovery is very long and difficult, and what makes it even further difficult to recover is that there's no escaping food. So those who are trying to recover from an eating disorder have to face food every single day, multiple times per day, you know, in order to stay alive. Even after recovery, there has to be daily intention to let your healthy self reign and not let those eating disorder thoughts have any merit, especially around food and during stressful times. I don't want to take away from how liberating and empowering it is to recover from an eating disorder. There is hope 100%, but this week is also about bringing awareness to this awful disorder, informing the public about the realities of eating disorders, and encouraging those who may be impacted to seek help. The slogan for this year's National Eating Disorder Awareness Week is see the change, be the change. I thank you for being part of the change by recognizing this important week through this proclamation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much for your courage to come down here. I, I think I read that last year and you accepted. Um, so we did not uh, go through the, this essentially the, the, the awards or proclamations for past chairs because uh, supply chain issues, we don't have the actual plaques. Um, so this is the first yeah. time ever. 
so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to take motion. I'm going to uh, entertain motions to defer that uh, to our next regular meeting. A motion to table it to our next. Mo I move to table. Second. We have a motion to table by Commissioner Satcher, a second by Commissioner Whitmore. I will open up to public comment. Anyone from the public like to comment on this specific agenda item? Seeing no one, Seth, there is one person on the phone who would like to speak on this agenda item. Yes, sir, we do. Okay, go ahead, sir. 445, 445, star six, please. Lynn. Maybe he pushed it for something else. I call her, go ahead. Go ahead, call her. For the record, Glenn Jablina. Cloud, I was waiting Glenn. for Glenn, Glenn. Glenn, I need you to speak up. Go ahead, Glenn. It's not on this Go ahead. Glenn. I was what? I was waiting for future agenda items. So okay, I'll Glenn. We'll we will do that next. Um, so, seeing no one on the phone for this particular agenda item, we'll go ahead and hold the vote now. All in favor of tabling, say aye. 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 All opposed. Madam Clerk, it carries unanimously. We will now move to future agenda items because we have people that are here waiting, after which we will recess before we start to work our way through the regular agenda. So for future agenda items, I do have two cards here in front of me and one known caller. We'll start with Mr. Mike Meehan, who would like to speak with us on the spending of reserves. Mr. Meehan, I actually I don't see Mr. Meehan. Yeah, Mr. Meehan? Uh, perhaps he's outside. I'll go to the next card, and if he's out there, he'll come in. Bring him on down. There he is. Mr. Meehan, you're the next contestant. Come on down. Um, we are on future agenda items, sir. You'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, please keep your comments focused on future agenda items. State your name and your county of residence, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mike Meehan uh, is the name, citizen Manatee County, and <clears throat> reserve spending is my game. Um, I, I, you know my position on reserves. We should either spend the reserves or send them back to the taxpayers who, who paid the money in to begin with. So <clears throat> what I've been trying to do is figure out exactly what the reserve spend is for fiscal 22. And I looked at um, the capital spending plan for 22, and I couldn't find any evidence that reserves were being spent for capital spending in fiscal 22. So I then referred to the um, income statement that's on page 142 of the budget document. It's kind of hard to read, but I did go through this uh, income and expense statement, <coughs> and I came to the conclusion that the reserve spend for fiscal 22 is going to be about $122.7 million. Um, that was just looking at the beginning um, cash carryover of $639 million and subtracting from that the cash balance of the prior year of 516 and that came up with that number of 122 million so that was my guess as to what the reserve spent i was trying to clarify that a little bit further and i saw on page 82 of the budget document uh, these words which were when calculating the net budget the beginning carryover balance is subtracted by the remaining cash balances therefore identifying the reserves which have been used as a source to as a source to offset expense so my wild guess based on this uh, language was this number of 122.7 million I wasn't quite confident in this financial analysis, so I decided to contact um, Gasby, and I sent Gasby a copy of, of this page, which was page 142. And um, from that document, uh, they couldn't really say or identify with any degree of certainty what the cash reserves spend uh, for fiscal 22 was so I'm still in kind of a quandary about what 
what is the exact reserve spend for fiscal 22? And if anybody wants to enlighten me, I'd like to hear from them. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Well timed. Thank you, Mr. Meehan. Next on the list is Chris Johnson. Mr. Johnson, are you here? Oh, there he is. Mr. Johnson, you're next. You'll have three minutes. Please state your name, your county of residence, and speak to future agenda items only. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Chris Johnson. I am the CEO at Suncoast Partnership in Homelessness. We are the lead agency for the continuum of care in both Sarasota and Manatee counties. Uh, I bring this morning um, a discussion regarding affordable housing. Uh, so I want to, first of all, congratulate you all uh, for your decision to allocate $15 million of your ARPA funding towards the uh, veterans uh, jail reprojecting. Um, and I, I'm grateful to hear that you guys are investing in veterans, um, homeless veterans and veteran services. So thank you for that. Uh, there was an article that was actually written uh, yesterday um, by Ryan Callahan that I thought uh, a few of you were quoted in, I thought was really good. Um, Dr. Hopes, uh, you were quoted in there of talking about that this need to uh, create concert, comprehensive services for helping veterans who are homeless to leave homelessness behind them and actually help them in all these levels of transition. And then also later on in that article, um, Commissioner Whitmore, you are uh, quoted as talking about heavy case management and the need for 120 units of tiny homes uh, for those veterans to couple with that. Again, we never know how the newspapers actually quote us, but there we go. Um, and then, um, Commissioner Servia, I appreciate yours of saying that we have to understand the problem before we start offering solutions. We need a report that details the facilities we have to help the homeless and what gaps there are. Um, I would encourage the commission uh, for a conversation in Suncoast Partnership is by all means uh, willing to come to the table to discuss uh, to discuss matching those funds that you've allocated from ARPA for transitional housing and services to also permanent housing. The reason being is the trends in the data that we're seeing at Suncoast Partnership um, show that even if we create transitional housing for veterans or for anybody, there's nowhere for them to go from there. Mm -hmm. There's no affordable housing units available. Um, average veterans make $1,000 to $1,200 a month. Um, that's the numbers that we see from the veterans we're working with. Uh, that doesn't even match 30% AMI at $1,650 um, or $16,500 a month. If you go up to 50% AMI, you're talking $27,000 and 50. Um, so the veterans, even if they're able to be transitioned through a transitional housing facility, don't have anywhere to go after that. The other numbers that we're seeing across the continuum, just so you guys know, and again, because we make kind of data-driven decisions at Suncoast Partnership, right now we have 74 identified homeless veterans within Manatee County. Um, so the need is there, there's no doubt. But as far as housing units go, only 22% of our housing units are at FMR or below. Um, that's unbelievable uh, because FMR governs so many of the funds that come through the county and through the state and through the federal government. And once our waiver is done March 31st, uh, we're trapped by FMR again. So that means our housing stock is extremely limited. Some of the other things that we've seen trends um, just over the past two years from 2020 to 2021, um, as opposed to the previous one year, rents went up 26.58% overall in Manatee County. And just going from 2021 to today, we have another 19.75% increase. Those are astronomical numbers that are pricing people out of the market, as evidenced by our families entering the system. Back in June, 59% of the calls we were getting uh, for families were brand new. And today, that's 79%. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Johnson. Appreciate your comments. So those are the only two cards that I have. Is there anyone else from the public who would like to come forward to speak on future agenda items? I do have one other person who wants to come forward. Yeah, Sir, you'll have three minutes to speak. Please focus your comments on future agenda items and state your name and your county of residence. Hello, uh, commissioners, Mr. Attorney and Mr. Administrator. My name is Bob Nicholson, <coughs> excuse me and I live in District 3. Kevin Van Austinbridge is my commissioner. Um, I'm not a Manatee County native, but I've lived here for over 40 years. Almost. Years ago, I was certified as a Florida Master Gardener and subsequently as a Florida Master Naturalist. I volunteered with the Extension Office for over 10 years. I completed Manatee County's Preserve Ambassador Training and volunteered there. I had, excuse me, I had the good fortune to volunteer with the RIP squad 
and learned about, a lot about the county's preserves from Damon Moore. Lastly, I have served on LMAC for, for around nine years. I have advised them that I will not seek reappointment and I'm not here to speak for them. Uh, I am far from the most educated or most dedicated member of LMAC. I just want you to understand that some expertise and a lot of dedication is necessary in the people you appoint. I'm here to ask you to play the environmental long game. You will soon be appointing new members to LMAC. You could populate the advisory board with your political supporters, your neighbors, with the idea that they will advocate for amenities in your district. Or you, you can appoint people from your districts who have demonstrated a sincere interest in the long range environmental health of our county and that have some expertise in evaluating environmentally sensitive lands. <clears throat> Excuse me. To paraphrase a former vice president, there is more at stake than our party or our political fortunes. Getting some swing sets or kayak launches for your constituents might help your political fortunes but there truly is more at stake. I urge you to appoint people to LMAC who will put in the necessary effort to understand the importance of native plants and animals to our future, the importance of wildlife corridors, wetlands and conservation easements to our water and food and air. Everything is connected. Once you've made these appointments of qualified members, Please give fair and honest consideration to the recommendations, regardless of where the properties are located. I'm sure you've heard the adage, blessed are those who plant trees under whose shade they will never sit. This is the long game. Purchase and manage environmentally sensitive land that will serve as your legacy long after you are no longer in office. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate your comments. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to come forward to speak on future agenda items? All right, seeing no one, we'll go to the phone. Seth, we have three callers on the line? Yes, sir, we do. Okay, let's start the process. It's 445, 445, star six for us, please. Caller, we're listening. Four, four, five, star six. We'll move on to the next one. Uh, next caller is one, one, nine, one, one, nine. Please press star six for us. Fun Jibalina for the record. So can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, Glenn, we hear you well. Right now. All right, so I sent you my four PowerPoints. You know, I don't sucker punch anyone. So no, you know exactly what I'm talking about this morning. First and foremost, the Sadowski funds, they want to fleece it for another $40 million when they raped it last year for 50%. We need to stop the steal. I made it very easy for each and every commissioner to, to email the, the committee that is making the decision tomorrow. So that needs to get done today. I am pleading and urging with you. You heard the gentleman, Christian Suncoast. My God, we're on the, we're, we're reading from the same playbook. So he hit the numbers as well. But if you remember, uh, we already let them fleece it for 50% last year. And now they're, they're putting their hands back in the cookie jar for another 40 million. This insanity has to stop. So please, I urge you by the end of the day, send them the, the, uh, the uh, thing from the, from, uh, the Florida Housing Coalition and let our voices be heard. Second, EPR funds. We should adopt the best practices. I also wrote you all a letter concerning the, the current situation that uh, recipients are only available for 12 months. Well, unfortunately, nobody told COVID that. There are people still struggling out there that can't make ends meet, rents are going <coughs> up, and after 12 months of assistance, they no longer qualify. Why is it our sister county in Sarasota allows 18 months, 
but more importantly, allows them to reapply. We need to adopt those practices. I've got a records request on the balance. So Dr. Hopes would entertain us on the balance. I would love to hear from him. Uh, resolution on four, number three, for-profit builders for surplus property. This was passed in 2017. Uh, we've been promised that, that this would be instituted. Dr. Hopes said it would be done in February, so I'm looking forward to that resolution being implemented. Uh, solar renewable energy policy, we still don't have one. I mean, it's unbelievable that we do not have a policy on current buildings for Manatee County. Uh, so we need, we need the Sadowski funds, the EPR funds, for-profit, and solar. Uh, I did see uh, item number R37, Carol, on, on uh, homeless mm. housing, but I didn't see any attachments. So I'm looking forward to listening to that, Carol. And I, and I have to tell you, uh, Lee Washington, now the Director of Neighborhood Services, an absolute home run. Well done, Dr. Hopes. So please, Sadowski Funds, help us out here, folks. Mm. Oh, there's my timer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jibalina. Seth, next caller, please. Yes, sir. Next is 119. 119. 119. Go ahead, caller. Please state your name, county of residence, and you'll have three minutes. Future agenda items. Hi, this, this is Tina Show, um, Manatee County 34243. Um, I have just a couple questions I hope you all can address at some point today and, and a few uh, statements. One of my questions is, um, when commissioners send or receive emails or text messages during a meeting or a work session, is there any requirement that they disclose that information to the public? If not, I suggest that those, that information should be made known in real time and then added to the agenda notes as an addendum. Ma'am, that's a good question I for a 3 one one system. It is not a future agenda item. Please stick to future agenda items. Oh. All right. Well, thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, future agenda items, then. I'm disappointed that you all won't be discussing the um, method by which the 3.9% increase in, in salaries has been put through. One of the things that stands out, and trust me, I am not an economist or any type of expert, but the budget message says that the pay levels will be increased by 2.9%, which is pretty clear, and that there will be a 1% pay for performance. However, that seems to have been changed by Dr. Hopes and the HR director and um, I think Jan Brewer, without the county commissioners weighing in on it. Uh, my question is, when a change is, is deemed necessary, and I understand things change all the time, but shouldn't the county commissioners have been consulted on this or uh, at least had some kind of vote to approve the way those funds are dispersed? I'm under the impression that uh, the county administrator works for the county commission, not vice versa. However, if that's wrong, please clarify that for me as well. Thank you for your time, and um, I hope you'll take a few moments to address these questions. Thank you. Seth, next caller, please. Yes, sir. We have one last raised hand. It's 820-820, star six, please. All right, 820, you have three minutes. Please state your name, county of residence, and stick to the topic of future agenda <coughs> items. Good morning. I'm Dr. Sue Ann Miller, president of the Friends of the East Manatee Library at Lakewood Ranch. I reside in Lakewood Ranch, Manatee County. February is a month of many celebrations, including National Library Lovers Month. The Friends want to share their library love and thank the commissioners, administration, and the Library Services Department for all your work with the groundbreaking for the new library in December and now involving the public in the naming of the new library with the online survey. We are also very supportive of the new library long-range plan and how it reflects the findings of the library master plan with the consultant's reported recommendations. 
You're doing a great job. Thank you so much. Hmm. Thank you, ma'am. Seth, are there any other callers? That's all we have. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Whitmore Cruz Baugh is the order of the board. Commissioner Whitmore. All right. Um, Mr. Meham, I don't know. Yeah, he is still here. Okay. Um, we, am I wrong? And I know Jan's here and um, she knows, and I just want to confirm it. We have taken out of our reserves $350 million, and he's mentioning spending in 22. Well, what month is this? February. <laughs> I mean, we have plans for that money, and I would just like um, Jan to confirm. Maybe I'm wrong, but I thought we took 350 out of reserves and 80 million for a line of credit. So, if I'm wrong, please correct me. You do, Jan Brewer, uh, Chief Financial Officer. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Um, the page that was being referred to is your budget plan that is required by the state of Florida. That's why GASB was a little bit confused and why it was being represented to them. Um, the plan within what you have clearly delineates the level of your reserves that they have gone down to. Um, you are at minimal amount of reserves above the 20% at this time. Um, I can regurgitate the budget back if you want me to, but it is all laid out within the budget. And that's what we're currently following. Right. The only thing that would not be, would be changed is anything that we have brought before you since October 1 that's different. Clarify the $350 million. Off the top of my head, I'm not I'm not understanding what the 350 you're pointing. Didn't we bring to our is? budget down 350 million, and that came from some of it came from that one reserve that we don't have anymore. I think she's referring so, to the number that we're going to bond. Correct, oh. but I, I would say, commissioners, that this these are all very good questions and valid questions for you to uh, ask and discuss with staff. But um, okay. in the middle of our meeting, I don't believe is the appropriate time. But if you want to follow oh. up with these residents, you know, uh, on your own, you. I you're think you're right. That's it's the bonding. I'm it. sorry. I'm sorry. And then, um, thank you, Jan. And then Chris Johnson. Every time he talks, he leaves. Before I can, um, yeah, uh, their organization is the lead agency that gets all the federal monies, as we all know. Some of us were here when it started. They are Sarasota-based, but they do receive Manatee monies that we tap money into. He mentioned permanent housing. I heard on the news this morning that Manatee County is the second largest increase in rent in the United States. Not anywhere else in the United States. Sarasota is third. I was going to bring that up under comments. So, yes, we have a problem with homeless. We have a problem with everything. So, and we heard uh, Senator Gruders when we were in Tallahassee saying how much his staff member has gone up who probably can't even afford to live here. He's going to have to find another place to pay for rent. So, in the United States, this is nothing to be proud of. And it's nothing with the commission. It's market-driven. And people are getting that rent. But yeah, this is something we can bring up. I know we're having an affordable housing work session. When is that? I couldn't Council. find it. 15th, 15th of, of February. February. OK, because we were Council. looking for that for a meeting I had yesterday. I couldn't remember the date. Maybe this could be brought up. But this is everywhere, and including, unfortunately, the, uh, the people that really need the affordable housing. But in the United States. So anyway. Okay. That's okay. all I had. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, I'm just going to quickly respond to Glenn. Um, I got your email about the emergency rental assistance and the 12 months versus 18 months. I think that's just a matter of our, our website consistently being terribly out of date. Um, the, our ERA web page is from June of 2021 or maybe April of 2021. It, it hasn't been updated since. It still refers you to Jerry Lopez if you want to get questions about it. Um, back when ERA funds came out, it was a 12-month maximum period mm -hmm. to utilize. You could technically get an additional three months. You had to reapply and show that you had a continued need to maximize 15. It was only when the ERA 2 plan came out that it extended to 18 months, right. which Sarasota has updated appropriately on their website. Uh, we just have not. Um, we adhere to all federal rules of all funding we get. In fact, sometimes we sit and wait months and months and months for Ernst & Young to respond to us just to ensure that we're adhering to all of the rules from a federal and state level. So I, I would assume, unless I'm speaking incorrectly, that 
we also would offer the same 18 months because that's what's allowable. ERA 2 actually goes even further. Instead of, I think, October 22, it extends all the way to 2025 and it has some flexibility. It doesn't have to be directly COVID-related to be able to qualify for it. You just have to have been impacted during the period of COVID. Right. Um, so it's some flexibility. And I believe just recently, a week or two ago, they they dump some more money into the state of Florida. I don't know how that's going to be allocated, but, uh, but but we're not different than Sarasota. They're not offering anyone more than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Their their website's just updated. If, if you look at our website, if you go to mymanatee.org right now, uh, it says copyright 2018 on the bottom. So um, so we just need to, to do a better job of updating our information in a timely manner for programs that are important to people in a timely basis. And uh, but, but, but we do honor it. So it would be 18 months, Glenn. Thank you, Commissioner Cruz. The order of the board is Baugh and Hopes, and then we will recess the meeting uh, for 10 minutes after that. Commissioner Baugh. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to say thank you to Sue Miller. Uh, she has, uh, her and the Friends of the Library are the hardest working people that I know, and they do such a great job, and I, I kind of thought we might hear from her today. Uh, I'm surprised that she didn't give us her opinion on what the name should be. I, I think that Sue and I agree on what the name of the library should be, but, but we'll have to see how it goes. Um, just wanted to say thank you to her. Looking forward to the Vanessa Ball Library. No, that won't be it. I can <laughs> assure you. Vanessa Ball Library. I was thinking Misty Servia might be appropriate. <laughs> and Dr. Hopes, you're next on the board. I, I, too quick, Mr. Chairman. I just want to clear up. One of the, and I think it was a, a female caller, had referenced uh, CFO Jam Brewer involved in a particular meeting or decision, and, and she was not. Uh, but more specifically, uh, for the public and for the commissioners, uh, one of the critical areas that's moving over to Mr. Washington new department uh, is the area with regards to these rental assistance funds and I have every expectation that under Mr. Washington's leadership uh, we will see a, a very aggressive outreach uh, in in getting these funds to to people in need in our community both the ERA 1 and and the two funds so I look forward to reporting to you and the community on Mr. Washington's uh, progress in that area. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hopes. Commissioner Bellamy. Yeah, a couple of things. I just always listen to figure out, you know, how we're going to address certain issues and things um, that come up. Um, there was a, a request by a caller um, and, and an email as far as discussing, you know, what's about to take place from the $40 million of the Sadowski um, funds uh, allegedly being taken out. I'm, I'm not necessarily, I haven't vetted that. I haven't vetted that at all, but I do have a question as as far as um, the board's position on the Sadowski Fund continuously being um, robbed, and we know that we have affordable housing out, um, issues here. And I wanted to know, Mr. Chair, if I can have some dialogue with um, Commissioner Cruz or do any of my colleagues have a position on that because it seems like it's something that continuously happens. And well, I'm not necessarily sure what we can do, but can we make a statement, you know, up in, to Tallahassee to let them know, well, have we already done it? Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, all, all I'm going to say is it, it, what, what Glenn's saying is not incorrect, it, but last year they, for years and years and years, we got zero dollars right. effectively. It was like instead of getting five, we got one. So it wasn't zero, but it was sure. virtually zero. It's kind of a rounding error, leftover money. Uh, last year, they, they made a decision, which I don't agree with, that they were only going that they were going to guarantee we got essentially half of it, and the other half they were going to spend on like climate change and trees or something. So. It, it, it was all kind of, it, it was for other avenues that they kind of claimed was beneficial to community. That's literally what it was for. It was for like storm, storm water and things like that. So uh, this year, I don't know the nature of what Glenn's talking about, but I know Governor DeSantis's budget, whether it's called Sadowski or it's called just dollars out of a bit, has like $335 million, towards it, which would be the single largest influx of capital into a four-plus. I believe almost $250 <coughs> million of it is specifically targeted towards low-income housing and workforce. So <coughs> you can call it Sadowski. You can call it just general funds. You call it just the governor's budget. It's so If it passes, which I believe it should, it will be the single largest influx of capital into communities related to affordable housing, I think, since 2008. 
So th there is money coming if the budget passes. It may just not be called Sadowski fund right. per se. And, and I think that's why I asked for us to have some dialogue so the, the public could be a little bit more um, aware of it. And, and now um, for, the, for the more uncomfortable topic, um, because I just, I just received a, um, an, an email um, a, about it, and it actually came up in public comment. And I think right now our position is not to address this continuously ongoing as far as the 3.9%. So that, um, that was listed increase. as item number 38 on our agenda. If, if you would, I, I asked if we wanted to keep it on the agenda. No one said they wanted to bring it up. We can put it back on the agenda, if you like, and, use, and speak to it as an agenda item during the regular agenda. Well, I'm not necessarily sure of the position of, of the board, but I'm being um, approached by individuals in the community about that. I received some phone calls over on the weekend, and I thought it would um, be addressed. But, you know, I don't go back and forth and get all into some of the stuff that's out there. I would and just put it back on the agenda. Let's and do that. We, got, we need to take a break at some point. Yeah. Yeah. It could turn into a long conversation. Yes, sir. Certainly will. So we'll, we will done, Mr. put number 38 back on the agenda. We'll take it up after the recess. Uh, so with the exclusion of item number 38, Commissioner Whitmore, did you need to speak yeah, to something else? Yeah, the ERA 1 and 2. Uh, Jan and I met with uh, Lee Washington and the, the girls that are actually administrating it. And hopefully we can get an update because Jan was really um, impressed with what she heard and so was Lee um, what they're doing now but it I asked to meet with them because it's so confusing so I, I wanted to meet with them one-on-one -on -one so I could be able to answer intelligently so hopefully we can have during whatever our affordable housing or whatever I'm glad you brought up that money because I wasn't aware of that yeah. so that makes us feel better remember we're number two in the United States so maybe we can get that to the governor's attention that um, as far as affordable housing in Manatee County, or I mean rental, anything. But maybe we can grab his attention because of that. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. Um, I'll just speak very quickly before we recess. Uh, my text messages aren't too exciting. My friends think that the Orange Bowl posting about Commissioner Bellamy's brother is badass. Um, it's not my brother. <laughs> the uh, sorry, well they they said brother. It is your uncle, but they said they said brother. Um, I, I yeah. asked Jorge to get contact information for Commissioner Von Hamen, and he did. And he also added the fish festival to my to my calendar. Um, Tommy Gregory texted me and told me that he is going to be moving into District 72. Um, I mean, it's it's really it's about as exciting as it gets. I don't think uh, you were supposed to say now. that yet. <laughs> well, I mean, these these are the these are the uh, the comments that I got during my <laughs> during my meeting this morning. Uh, so that's as exciting as it gets. We're going to recess this meeting for ten minutes. We'll be back at ten fifty one. I'm going to get.
looks like I'll just stay here. Okay, we're back. Uh, let's go to the consent agenda. Oh, and the, uh... We'll do the consent agenda first. Go ahead and get that out of the way. Um, no one pulled anything from the consent agenda, so I will entertain motions on the consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda as shown. Second. I'm sorry, Mr. County Attorney. We just need to take public comment. Oh, of course. Oh, okay. after that. Make sure we want a motion. Um, so we have a motion by Commissioner Serbia to approve the consent agenda, and we have a second by Commissioner Whitmore. We will open up the consent agenda to public comment. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on the consent agenda? Seeing no one, we'll go to the phone. Is there anyone on the phone? There is no one on the phone. All right, let's vote on the consent agenda. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Chair, the consent agenda passes unanimously. Um, Dr. Hopes, please bring us to the first regular item on the agenda. Yes, County uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I will tell you that staff, numerous staff, uh, and I have been dealing with this issue for the past uh, week or so. Uh, and we have narrowed it down to it appears uh, with regards to the issue of the 3.9% pay increase for Manti County employees what? and constitutional. Oh, what are we? Introduce the agenda item, oh, sir. Number 38, sorry. That's oh. We're doing number 38 before 31 and 32 and 33 and 34. He said after the recess that we were no, going to no, take let's, that. No, okay, no, let's, let's, let's get to 38 after, after lunch. Okay, that's let's, fine. So let's then, uh, Mr. Chairman, under the advertised public hearings, item number 31 is adoption of ordinance number 22-12, establishing the Rye Ranch Community Development District presentation only upon request. Does anyone, would anyone like to request a presentation on item 31? Yes. Commissioner Satcher has requested a presentation. Who is here from staff to present? From Building and Development Services. CDD. Oh, okay. Hello, I'm Max Sigler. I'm a planner with BADS. Uh, mic a little bit closer. Yeah, pull your mic up. Speak up a little bit, please, Max. Max Sigler, planner Thank with you. BADS. Mike, what's your name? Last name? Sigler. Sigler, oh, okay. Yes. Slides. We're just loading up the presentation. It's okay, Max, go ahead. Basic one. Thank you. Okay, here we have the location of Rye Ranch, mm -hmm. Upper Manatee River Road, east of Rye Road. It is 1368 acres under PDMU 1916 ZG. And this generally is a request for the parks facility security under special powers mm -hmm. and the, it uh, names out the initial board of supervisors. Um, I've also got language on what a CDD is. If anybody would like that, um, petition contents. This petition has fulfilled all of the um, regulation and it uh, appears to be consistent with our Uniform Community Development District Act of 1980, the comprehensive plan and in compliance with the requirements of the Land Development Code. Are there any questions? Commissioners, do we have any questions? Commissioner Whitmore is on the board. Commissioner Whitmore. Can you just clarify what a CDD does is allow a funding mechanism to be able to do infrastructure, Correct. roads, et cetera? Yes. It's, uh, okay, that's its all. own funding me mechanism for the So they the can charge CDD fees to be able to pay for their infrastructure. Thank right. you. And it's government, and it, right, correct? Separate, no yes, yeah, separate of our government. And county thank you. Yes. All right, thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. Are there any other commissioners that would like to speak on this? Seeing none, we will open it up to public comment. Is there any from the public who would like to come forward to speak on agenda item 31? We have one person coming forward. Sir, please state your name, your county of residence. You'll have three minutes to speak and address your comments to agenda item 31. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Jarrett Earlywine. I'm with KE Law Group here on behalf of the petitioner. I'm really just here to answer any questions you all may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Any questions, commissioners? Seeing none, is there anyone else from the public who would like to come forward to speak on item 31? Seeing none, we'll go to the phone. Seth says there's no one on the phone. Board, uh, I will entertain motions at this time. 
Oh, that's right. Commissioner Servia made the motion. We'll hold the vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Seeing none. Madam Clerk, passes unanimously. She didn't make the I think I don't. Ma I didn't make the motion on that one. Sorry. I think there's a little confusion. We need a motion. I'll I make believe. a motion to approve the recommended motion by staff on item number thirty one. Thank you. I have a motion by Commissioner Whitmore and a second by Commissioner Servia. I apologize for the confusion. Someone is whispering in my ear that we already had a motion. <laughs> no, we didn't. That was for the right. consent agenda, Mr. Chairman. That's that was the that was consent. You're right. Okay. So we have a motion by Servia and a second by Whitmore. We'll now hold the vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Clerk, it passes unanimously. Dr. Hopes, next agenda item. Mr. Chair, item number 32, adoption of ordinance number 22-13, establishing the Newport Isles Community Development District. Would anyone like a presentation on this agenda item? Seeing none, we'll open it up to public comment. Would anyone like to come forward and speak on item number 32? Seeing none, is there anyone on the phone, Seth? No, sir. No one is on the phone. We'll entertain motions. I'll make a motion to approve adoption of ordinance 22-13. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Whitmore and a second by Commissioner Servia. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Clerk, it passes unanimously. Dr. Hopes, next agenda item, please. Item number 33, adoption of ordinance number 22-14, boundary adjustment for Artisan Lakes Community Development District. Artisan Lake. Artisan, sorry. Uh, is there anyone from the public who would like to come forward to speak on this agenda item? Seeing none, we'll go to the phone. Seth? No calls. There's no one on the phone. Does anyone like, would anyone like a presentation? No presentation needed. I'll entertain motions. i make a motion to adopt ordinance number 22-14, item Second. 33. We have a motion by Commissioner Bellamy and a second by Commissioner Servia. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Clerk, it passes unanimously. Dr. Hopes, next agenda item. Item number 34, Mr. Chair, is adoption of ordinance number 22-15, boundary adjustment for Artisan Lakes East Community Development District. Thank you, sir. Would anyone like a presentation on this item? <coughs> Seeing none, we'll open this to public comment. Is there anyone from the public who would like to come forward to speak on agenda item 34? No one in the audience. Is there anyone on the phone, Seth? No, sir. There's no one on the phone either. We'll entertain motions at this time. Motion to approve as shown in the agenda. Second. Motion by Commissioner Servia to approve. A second by Commissioner Bellamy. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Clerk, it passes unanimously. Dr. Hopes, please introduce the next agenda item. Item number 36, under public works, Mr. Chairman, approval of map selecting the roads for the first year of the Rural Road Paving Program, adoption of budget resolution B22-054, Mr. Butzo is here to present. Good morning, Chad Butzo again, public works. I am following up on this agenda item. Uh, I do not know if you want me to start from the beginning. I uh, put together a little bit of a history within the agenda memo. Uh, I think if you sort of give us a quick timeline, it, it would be good for the public to hear it as a, you know, sure a large initiative on, on your department's part. And for many years, and a uh, previous commissioner had, uh, had Northern County as uh, her district and had championed the idea of uh, correcting the right spend on the amount of shell uh, that needed to be purchased to take care of shell roads. To the contrary, let me just say the one thing. We're talking about the Rural Road Paving Program. Nothing to do with our resurfacing program that takes existing paved roads and either reconstructs them or uh, mill and fills or just overlays it. Totally different program. So this is uh, the concept of taking shell roads and applying asphalt to them and adding them to our paved road inventory. Uh, so the history goes, we used to have, uh, we were spoiled. We had a shell pit down in the uh, SMR area. And we were able to go get shell at, uh, at 5 and $6 a, uh, a ton ourselves with our own vehicles, and we were able to keep up. So shell is a... a consumable products. So after many years of grading, you will only get somewhere between that six and eight years of uh, 
being able to push it around and get something out of it. Otherwise, it just keeps decomposing and it turns into dust and either you lose it or even if you're trying to push that around, it doesn't stay smooth, it doesn't resist the uh, rain that we get, and uh, certainly it doesn't compact, so it becomes a maintenance issue. Uh, with the closure of that pit, the next closest shell areas became in the Port Charlotte area or even east of uh, Arcadia. So that turned our cost uh, more than three times higher than what we had been paying. And because we had to order it delivered, we just simply didn't have the time uh, to run round trips of our own equipment in doing so. And that was also coming out of the uh, big recession. So we got behind. We got behind. So many of the roads uh, missed over six or eight years of being on that real schedule of being maintained at an adequate shell level. During that time uh, back in 2020, the, we proposed an idea that said if we give an honest comparison to the cost of how much we should uh, maintain our shell roads with as opposed to actually paving them and then resurfacing on a uh, cyclical basis which is typically closer to a 20 year or a little bit more in shell in a 15 year we should reshell a shell road in like twice it became a business decision at that moment when we presented it and certainly in 15 years, it was seen as a clear cost savings to have paved the roads with an when you annualize the cost as a, compared with maintaining all of our shell roads at the level that they should be maintained at. And in, in, during 2020, with the approval of the 2021 CIP, the Rural Road Paving Program <coughs> was entered into the CIP. It may have looked like a giant chunk of money. It was never our intention to do everything in one year. Uh, uh, we wanted to break it up into preferably at least four years uh, from a constructability point of view and just making sure we can meet the expectations and find vendors and uh, get the work done. So what we have in front of you, uh, I'm not sure if they're looking at it, Seth, but uh, this was our flyer that is ready to go that we would mail to everybody on this year's road. So I have a different map that does uh, show the four different groupings of the roads that got broke up. Uh, this map is what is uh, ready to be mailed. We also intend to apply uh, signs at the beginnings of all these roads. Most of them are dead end roads of some sort so people can't fail to pa uh, pass uh, saying, uh, paving to begin soon, call this phone number for uh, questions uh, when we have a contractor and uh, work is imminent to get started. During this process uh, where it became known, it was known in the rural areas uh, that we had this program in the CIP, we have actually received uh, what was initially just a handful of phone calls of people that had said, uh, please don't pave my shell road. And that did surprise us. Up until recently, that had only been kind of a one-off. We had seen, heard from one person over here or one person over there. Most recently, in the uh, extreme south, Mayaka City area uh, of Rexrod Road and River Road, we actually recently received a petition. Uh, I haven't validated it uh, with the number of homes on there, but it was an ex uh, in the vicinity of like 16 names. Uh, it's not real densely populated out there, so that could be a fairly... A uh, significant percentage of the people that live on that road that signed and said they did not want that road paved. That road is not in this year's proposal, so uh, my intention was to say we can certainly continue to discuss more outreach, uh, validate who signed uh, which properties on that uh, petition, but that decision doesn't have to be made now. Uh, we're trying to get this action today. It moves uh, from an appropriate amount of budget to it puts our money in my checking account to do the contract and issue the contract and try to get this work done before September 30th. I doubt we'll all get it complete, but we can get a uh, darn good start. And then the following year, we'll be starting uh, soon and over summer, so we're further ahead. So we guarantee you the second year's choices will be completed within that fiscal year. All right, thank you, Chad. I appreciate it. This is a, a good project, and that's basically what I wanted is, even though there's no one sitting in the audience today, hundreds of people watch this at home. It gives them an explanation of the of the money being spent. The only specific thing I didn't get that close into, when I, when I mentioned the uh, it was cheaper to pave and do that, I mean, we are serious. I mean, the intent would be we complete this project and we get out of the grading shell road business where 
Graders are on the road every day when it ain't pouring cats and dogs, when they can do useful work. Uh, every shell road that we routinely maintain gets either graded every week or every other week. So, I mean, our intention would be to complete this program and sell the graders, reallocate the forces so we can do more uh, useful tasks. I mean, that was the commitment from a business decision of why the program was funded in the first place. Okay, thank you, Chad. Whitmore Ball hopes. Commissioner Whitmore. When this got brought up during our briefing, I don't support it. I, I just don't. Rural is rural. And these people, we, we have, they've expected the gravel, and I think Commissioner um, Trace started that, which is totally fine. You know, until the mid early 2000s on the island, the, the, ed, the street ends were all, you know, unpaved. And that's what the citizens want until other people started buying, and then they, they wanted it. You know, I, I just, um, I know you have a petition from one, but you've had others, too, that don't want it paved. And this is um, our citizens' way of life, and they're expecting it to be graded. And um, I, unless we get permission from the majority of the, the homeowners on certain streets, I wouldn't support paving it because I know that's a big change for people that live out there to all of a sudden have their street paved when they don't want it. So I, I may be a cost thing for us, but we, you know, they pay taxes too. So, and they don't get their um, gravel very often, but when they do, you know, they pay taxes for that. So I kind of don't, I mean, I don't support this right now. Maybe Thank I'm you. the only one. Thank you, <laughs> Commissioner Whitmore. Commissioner Ball. <laughs> Well, first off, Chad, I just wanted to say thank you for having that Zoom meeting with me yesterday on this very issue. Um, you were wonderful, very helpful, and I look forward to, um, you know, whatever happens with Rex Road with taking care of that situation. <clears throat> um, Commissioner Whitmore, I understand where you're coming from, but I have to tell you, I've represented MIACA <clears throat> for 10 years. And, and I can tell you, I've had a lot of citizens, and, and Chad can vouch, who have really not been pleased or felt that we were not maintaining them as, as often as we should or whatever. A lot of the people have wanted it paved, but you're right. There are some that don't. And, and that's one of the conversations I was having with Chad yesterday on how are we going to handle that. And, you know, the idea came up, and I thought it was a good one that Chad had, was, you know, if, if there's a road that the residents do not want paved, then we maybe a special assessment where they can pay, uh, you know, to, for the upkeep of the road. So, you know, we are moving forward. Uh, yes, it will always, I hope, be a rural area. I'm hoping and praying that, you know, the growth doesn't take it over too quickly. I hope not in my lifetime. It would be very sad for me. But that being said... Um, a lot of the people are looking forward to it. So, you know, we're kind of looking at this, you know, going into it slowly and taking little baby steps. But I, I do think it's something that um, Commissioner Satcher probably knows something about this as well from, uh, you know, from your district before. So, uh, Chad, thanks for being so helpful. Do you need to go now so I continue with commissioners? No, can we, can we, so we're going to go Bellamy, Satcher, Hopes. Commissioner Bellamy. I just want to, um, I support any upgrade that's, that's out there to make um, individual communities or rural areas quality of life. But if anyone in any of those areas don't want I have some areas in District 2, right, that want to be paved. Right. Right? Um, so I just, I mean, I'm just going to put that out there. If, if we have some exactly. areas where we don't want it, reach out to Commissioner Bellamy, 745-3702. Notice I put that public number out there. Um, and let me know because we do, I was on a conversation the other day uh, with the individual and I told him that, you know, I probably need to make sure all the residents are on the same page, but I would like, I have a couple areas if they don't want them, we will gladly take some roads to be paved in District 2, trust me. Thank you, Commissioner Bellamy. Commissioner Satcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I had received a <laughs> pretty persuasive cell phone video of, uh, of one of my uh, constituents driving 15 miles an hour down his road and the amount of, I mean, his truck was about, you know, I would, 
it was right. it was way more extreme than you know, and um, and so and then when we spoke about that road, you said that it was that it would take a little longer to get to that one, and so I just know that there's probably people there, you know, that have. Uh, you know, maybe written in, written in emails or whatever. Can you say just a little bit to the process of how you arrived on these roads, just so they know that, that they're not being forgotten? There's particular reasons why these are on the list for this coming year. Yes, sir. Uh, Seth, could we flip to the bigger map? And I guess the TV will have to play to maybe see how, uh, how it looks. Being as a business uh, decision, so it was a cost savings point of view as far as how uh, the creation of the program is at all. So as we were trying to figure it out, so if we're going to spread it over four years, so we needed somehow where we thought the cost would be relatively the same, but cost was the secondary. So first, we tried to think of the most extreme areas as far as how far the grader had to go away from where the, essentially the grader teams worked. So uh, we ended up with uh, the colors on this map don't match your other thing, but it was just meant to show you we have four different colors. I do not know if that shows up well or not well on TV. So year one on this map is the green map. So, I mean, it is your extreme north boundaries, and that's the most road time uh, that you have in the greater where you're not accomplishing anything. And then the next we envisioned would be uh, on this map the red uh, area, the extreme southern area, and then the uh, blue would have been the, uh, I call it the central east or far east, depending on how you would uh, look at that, and then that tan or yellow or orange color there would be everything else. I mean, in a proposed hypothetical four-year uh, program. It was intended to be how do we maximize time back to the work crew annually. rather than the inside out. If we would have, say, started closer to uh, uh, the urbanized area, that would have been reversed. We'd have been uh, delaying our maximum savings uh, until the outer years. Okay, Commissioner Cruz. I just wanna make sure I'm understanding. So we did this, because I, I had that same question, like how did we figure these out? Because I had people emailing me about you know, various roads saying, can I get mine on the list? Can I get mine towards the front? And I, I couldn't really figure out. So. What you're saying is we didn't do it based on the maximum number of people we're benefiting or on the worst road conditions where people are bouncing around at 15 miles an hour. We did it simply based upon proximity for the graders. So there could theoretically be roads up there that have three people living on them and are in fairly decent shape, but because they're further away, they're this year. And there could be a road centrally located with 30 houses on it with just divots and, and holes all over the place, and they're four years from now just because they're closer to where the trucks need to go. Potentially. Well, the whole purpose of it is because to save money on you know the, the graders and the shell and the fuel and time. That's the whole purpose of it. Understood. But that purpose is supposed to stretch over 50 years. We're talking a condensed four-year period. So, you know, I don't, I don't know if we're extending too much additional money going out to the middle of Duet for, to pave what looks to be a long road, so there's going to be costs associated with those longer green lines at the very top compared to some of these small little yellow lines smack in the middle, where there's probably higher density of people and probably more wear and tear on the road at a lower cost for paving because the roads seem smaller. Just curious. It's a factual statement, sir. I'm not going to disagree. <laughs> I just want to make sure I understood. So when statement. I get questions, because obviously most of the people that reach out to me were the people in that Mayak area. When I well, go out by 675 and see everybody out there, they're the ones who ask me about their roads. So I just want to be able to speak to them about the process we went through. Correct. Process a process. That's that your, that your department, not my department. I just want to make sure I understand what the process was it, so I can relay that. Correct. Cost Thank savings you. was the intent. Thank you, Commissioner Cruz. Commissioner Satcher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So when I asked you that question, that actually wasn't the answer I expected. I thought we had, uh, I thought there was permits that, in other words, I thought we could move a lot faster on these roads. There were other roads that we're going to take longer to get to because of permits. Did, that, did I just uh, hear that from someone that didn't know? Or I don't think I made that up. I'll put it that way. Maybe I, maybe it was uh, maybe it was in reference to something else. Anyway, I, I I'll hope just... it was in reference to the bigger CIP jobs. Right. Uh, not this. This is relatively simple because uh, it's an exemption. It's already impervious surface, and we're essentially just covering okay. uh, the existing impervious surface. 
All right. Well, I can I can definitely see advantages to doing it this way and and getting the graders more. I mean. Uh, theoretically, the ones that are closer to where you start out, the graders out, should get more care and more attention if the other one, you're not having to make the trips. And so I see some advantage there and definitely not looking to throw away uh, taxpayer money. However, I do just want to point out that the only reason we do these is not to save money. You know, the, the main reason we should be doing them uh, is to help our citizens and for them to get um, you know, something for the taxes that they pay, a, a reasonable service, which it would be roads and, uh, you know, drivable roads um, for 2022 um, would be our number one motivation. But I understand that I, I could see this definitely being a um, similar situation. I won't, I won't bring it up, but we've had, a, we've had something else in the past where, you know, the more people, even if it's not you getting helped initially, it gets to you a lot faster once we get those out of the way. So I'm excited we're going to get this all done. Uh, hopefully this year or very close to getting these all knocked out this year. So that sounds great. Thank you. Eve, I'm sorry, sir, but to inter, uh, inject would be there is help even in the first year because of the roads that we would uh, be paving this year. They wouldn't be the target of our limited funds for uh, adding additional shell uh, to them. Right. So uh, we could absolutely make sure the uh, one in question is uh, dealt with higher maintenance this year. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Satcher. Uh, we'll go to Dr. Hope. Yeah, quickly, I just think what's important here is is uh, Public Works has come up with a system that also it concentrates work. So w once equipment is out there to do this paving, they can get more road work done in that area, and then move. And as uh, as Chad mentioned, you know the whole issue is 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 to get rid of these outlying areas where the graders spend a tremendous amount of time getting out there. If they're then you know, working on these, <laughs> these areas that are closer, they can get to them quicker. The objective is to take this very, very long list of CIP projects and, and, and let's, let's get these things done, get them knocked off, and move on to the next group of projects. Obviously, if, if, and we'll come up with a system to, to assess a neighborhood. If a majority of the neighbors on the road don't want it paved, we'll come out up with a system that we can move them to the, 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 the back of the list and we can come up with an equitable way to cover you know, the high maintenance cost of these roads when we're trying to deploy dollars in order to improve the quality of life and transportation, et cetera. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Betso. Thank you, Dr. Hopes. Commissioner Baugh. Yeah, just to add to what Dr. Hopes just said, it might be, and Chad and I talked about this yesterday with Charlie Bishop, it might be that when some residents start seeing the roads getting paved and realize what an asset it is, uh, you know, particularly when it's been raining and during rainy season and all that, uh, it might be that they'll feel better about it. So who knows? Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Baugh. With no one else on the board, we'll open this to public comment. Is there any, anyone from the public who would like to come forward to speak on this agenda item? Chappy Wood. Seeing no one. Is there anyone on the phone? No calls. No one on the phone. I'm entertaining motions. Move to approve. Thank you. We have a motion by Commissioner Baugh to approve and a second by Commissioner Bellamy. Uh, we'll hold the vote now. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Grudgingly aye. Madam Clerk, it passes unanimously. Yeah. For grudgingly. I was going to lose, so. <laughs> Dr. Hopes, please introduce the next agenda item. Yes. Uh, uh, chair, this is under Commissioner Agenda, and it's under the Chair. Authorization to bring back a resolution to name Field 1 at G.T. Bray Park to the Lloyd D. Grantham Jr. Field. Thank you, Dr. Hopes. Um, I already read um, Mr. Grantham's bio and background at a <coughs> workshop. Um, there is one small change, whomever reads, I don't need to read the motion, but whomever reads the, the motion, um, we would be dropping Junior from it, so it would be the Lloyd D. Grantham Field mm -hmm. without Junior. Sure, are you sure, Mr. Chair, are you sure you don't want to hand over the gavel to the Vice Chair so that you can make it's that quite motion? Okay. This is a request by residents. I've, I've never met Mr. Grantham. Okay. Uh, I'm just honoring a request by residents because it seems no quite GT reasonable. Gray. I, um, I can't talk today. That's, that's okay. So we'll open this up to public comment. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on this agenda item? Seeing no one, we'll go to the phone. Seth? There's no one on the phone. So we will entertain motions. Mr. Chair, I make a motion and authorization to bring back resolutions and name the field. A motion as, as written. 
Uh, well, we don't want it as written. I would re removing Junior. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Bellamy and a second by Commissioner Whitmore. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Clerk, it passes unanimously. Uh, Dr. Hopes, please take us to the next yes, agenda Yes, Mr. Item. Chair. This item is under Commissioner Whitmore. Uh, it's item number 37, and it is a discussion on the Affordable Housing Task Force. I would prefer item, the one we're adding, and then I'll take this up after, because mine may take a do, do we need an after lunch? It's only 1122. <coughs> I have, have a, I have a comments and stuff. I, I have a hard lunch commitment that I have, to, and so does Commissioner Bellamy. And mine's going to um, take a while. And hers is going to take a while. <coughs> and shouldn't. Do we have any lighter, any other agenda items to hit, Dr. Hopes? Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe it's item number 38 that. Well, that's not going to be. Chose to add back on. Okay, why don't that's we? Not be any lighter. I'll do this fast, and we can bring it back. We will stick with 37. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, my notes are somewhere, and God knows where they are. They're in my computer. They're on my iPad. Uh, first of all, we have been bringing this up. I know Commissioner Cruz has brought this up quite a few times at meetings that nothing's more or less being done, but we've talked about it. And I, I contacted Denise Thomas, who is a, a wealth of history, because from what I was understanding you, it was something that had happened a long time ago. I know we've talked it at the city's meetings, too, but we actually had an affordable housing task force in, in um, 91 and they they uh, brought back whatever they needed before the board okay my thing is is we always talk and I'm about let's get something done so I was what I was going to ask the Commission if since it is on the agenda we could vote that we actually and, and I need help from the board to establish uh, make a motion that we uh, start the process of the citizens advisory task force and uh, select a liaison to be on it, and I don't want to be on it. I'm thinking it's, it would autumn. I mean, totally be Commissioner Cruz, but he wants to dialogue with me. Is it okay? We, we, we have, we, we literally have it. It was the, called the task force before Florida statute had all the counties. I know create we had that one. A, an affordable housing advisory board, which is literally in existence today, which is literally citizens forming a task force with myself appointed by the chair as liaison to discuss affordable housing items to bring to the board. It's the same thing that we've always had. It's not that it disbanded. It just changed its name because it fell under statutory regulation. Okay. We're doing a few things similar. We brought up Council of Governments where we said, hey, th there's really four entities in Manatee County that can meaningfully affect affordable housing. I mean, the, the islands just from a land standpoint and a space isn't feasible, although they certainly benefit from it because a lot of the service industry and hospitality industry people need that housing. It's us, City of Brainton, City of Palmetto, and the school board. Yeah. So we had talked towards the end of last year, I believe it was Charlie Kennedy brought it up and I agreed to help. Mm -hmm. And it came up again last Tuesday where we really need to start focusing on this. We need to figure out our urban core. We need to figure out how to get things done. We're starting to put the pieces together in April Fads is bringing back, or whatever, dads, or whatever we're calling this thing. <coughs> bringing back the half unit, the, the half dwelling unit ordinance proposal, which helps the urban core. So I've already reached out to the four major entities involved in this. Uh, Mayor Bryant's agreed to be on it. Um, Councilman Bill Sanders from City of Bradenton's agreed to be on it. And I'm still waiting to hear back from Charlie, but presumably he will, or someone else. And we've already sent emails out to set a time. It's informal. None of us fall under any kind of regulation. It's like grab some, you know, lunch or breakfast, you know, once a month or once every few weeks just to start bouncing around ideas of how can the urban cores work together? How can the, the school board work to facilitate impact fees while well, we're over here waiving or paying our impact fees and they're not, which is still cost prohibitive for affordable housing. So this is kind of just all of us get together with the intention of, sitting down at the Council of Governments meeting, kind of relaying our own task force information. Uh, do you think that, and I, can I dialogue? Yeah. Yes. Do you think this is a little too loosey-goosey and that it should be something a mo little more formal, that you are the, uh, the appointed, the anointed liaison for affordable housing? Anointed. Anointed, <laughs> whatever you want to say. No, you are the affordable but housing let, guy. Let me bow. Uh, yeah. But, well, and, it, and, it is and, informal because at this point it is because it's not a sunshine board. It's not noticed. With the we, we have City of Bradenton has an affordable housing board, a, a formal yeah. one. 
Manatee County has a formal Sunshine Affordable Housing Board. Plus, we have Housing Finance Authority Board. We've got every piece of it. Having one more Sunshine-related formal board is just everyone stepping on each other's toes. The initial step, and maybe it turns into that. I'm not saying it doesn't. Initial thing is I've sat over there in Palmetto over and over and over again with Jeff and Shirley and talked about how to best use their land. I've sat with you know, Mayor Brown and everybody over here. I've talked to Charlie and Chad and Mary on the score, but we've never had the four entities essentially sitting together. We can't have more than one person because then we do run into sunshine oh, issues. That. But true. having one of each, we can sit there and have that conversation just of what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts? And then we can bring it back. And if it looks like we can find something, then maybe we turn into a little bit more of a formal task force. But initially, we're just trying to get a way to sit together and bounce around ideas to see if there's some common overlap where we can help each other. Because the last two times that you've brought this up, you said we're not doing anything. We got we keep saying we have this task force, and that's why I thought you were looking for something more formal, like even if it's just appointing you as the liaison. Correct. And I'm I doing I'm would... doing stuff on the side too. I've I've met with three of our for profit developers, two of our non profit developers specifically to talk about what in, why aren't they using our incentives? Why aren't they taking advantage? Like, why do we have a project on Mendoza throwing a 30,000 square foot store in there to get density bonuses mixed use instead of building 25% affordable housing, which is much more preferable to our community? Why aren't they taking advantage of that? Why aren't people building four or five, 600 square foot units and, and only building 1,200? Right, right, right. Why aren't we getting the tiny homes? So I've been meeting with the developers about that. I've been meeting with BADS about that. I've been talking to Dr. Hopes about that. So I'm trying to aggregate, and, and if everyone else is too, we can have these kind of bigger discussions. But I've been talking with everyone trying to figure out how we can maximize Can this. you at least maybe, what I'm maybe missing is, could you give us a report without s disclosing so much, but at least let us know kind of where you are, what, what's going on? So others of us that get asked to help with this stuff, we're going to go, no, it's being worked on, talk to Cruz. Sure, of course. I mean, maybe give a report, because I was under the impression the last two meetings that you were frustrated because we're well, not Well, I am frustrated because... It. But it's not, you, our pro it's not our fault, right? The board's here. No, but it's, you, know, you can't talk about rents going up 40% over the past 12 months and fix it today because you can't build something right. instantaneously unless it's right. a pop-up tent. It needs to be built five years ago. Okay. And so the ship has sailed, and we're seeing the, the implications of not doing things previously. And a lot of it, again, has to do with our regulations and our zoning and how our comp plan is. We don't encourage redevelopment. We don't encourage smaller units because our impact fees are, are too high for too small of a unit, and our, our parking ratios are too high for too small of a unit. There are things that can just be fixed. And we almost have to look at it and say, we may need a Band-Aid today, but we need to take this as a lesson on making sure three years from now this isn't happening again. And so that's what we need to work on. And the impact fees on smaller homes, that was supposed to come back before us to make a decision, and I haven't heard anything it, about we, it. We waived AD, the, the decision did come back. The consultant said they didn't have any evidence that they needed to charge impact fees on ADUs now, but it's going to be incorporated right. into their revised report. So right now there's essentially a moratorium on fees. If you build an ADU in your backyard right now, there's no impact fee. So is the board comfortable with what, what Commissioner Cruz's? Is, is? I think if we just keep updated on what you can or cannot, you know, what you can tell us yeah. publicly would be great. Sure. I'll, I'll give you as many updates as you want. Okay. I, mean, I, I deal with it literally on a daily basis. It's the main thing I'm working on right now. Commissioner Baugh and then Commissioner Satcher. Um, well, I, I was actually going to talk about homelessness, but on, on a different topic than this. So let me know when would that would be, be appropriate the best for commissioner time. comments. Yeah, 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 I could do it then because yeah. it's really kind of connected here. All right. Commissioner Satcher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to echo or first of all, just say thanks, uh, you know, for doing that work and then echo the, the fact that it would be great to have uh, whatever you have as far as written updates or progress and not because just because I have so I have citizens asking me about it and um, and it, it, you know sunshine just I was like I can't call you up and say hey you know George what are we doing on this can I help you with that blah blah we can't uh, you know work together um, unless we're here at one of these long meetings um, so and even if you know we have it written down then we can know I can look and say you know what he's not doing anything on this front 
maybe I could either bring it up to him in a public meeting or maybe I could work on that myself and let him know if I had any uh, progress. Um, so so I just wanted to say that that, that does seem like a, a good idea. I hate to give you homework. Um, but this is an important issue. More and more of our citizens uh, I'm are more than, I'm more than happy to do it because the more people that are involved in it, hopefully the faster it gets done and the more consensus we have as I'm moving forward. So I don't right. run too far forward only to find out four people up here don't like what I'm exactly. trying to do. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what you need to do, yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Cruz, and Commissioner Whitmore, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, personally, you know, if you're looking for input from the board on our, you know, our, our level of comfortability with uh, Commissioner Cruz um, spearheading this, I, I'm very comfortable with him spearheading this. I think he's a tremendous asset to our board, Six. specifically on this matter. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I would just encourage him to continue on and you know, do keep us updated. Um, without disclosing too much information, as sometimes people can do from the dais. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can and, I, uh, when you're done? Sure. So yeah, I, would just, I would just encourage Commissioner Cruz to, to, to carry on uh, as he is. Uh, Commissioner Whitmore. I have written my notes, and I just found them. Just stimu uh, uh, things that can stimulate affordable housing in the very near future. And this is going to be up to you. You're the, the point man. Cha if, it, if you think so, the change the LDC and comp plan to accommodate high density even more. Fast track anyone that builds these, like we had it with the, the port when we did, um, you know, business that's coming. I wrote impact fee adjustments or a long-term payback, um, and also work with developers that are willing to do this, and that was it. So. And, and just to finish this, and then we can go to lunch, you can get your thing. Um, of everything you mentioned, literally, I, I just spoke to Dr. Hose like last week really? about modify your comp plan to encourage kind of pockets of redevelopment areas with higher density and, and higher height restrictions. That, that was literally a conversation we just had. Fast Track did pass the state of Florida. We basically have a 30-day window if they're using Allura and doing affordable housing. It technically exists, I'm just saying. Um, we've obviously been behind the eight ball in terms of manpower to help get that done, but hopefully that's being fixed. Uh, impact fee changes. Again, I'm working on that. Lisa and Bill are bringing back the half-dwelling unit uh, ordinance in April which means if you build under whatever square footage we, we stipulate, um, in Sarasota, I believe it's 500 square feet, but you know we can be flexible on that. Then it counts as half impact fee, half density, and half parking ratio. Sarasota has it. Most of our surrounding areas have, encourage smaller units. So even if you charge full boat buck 50 a foot on 500 square feet, it's only $750. It falls into 30% for teachers. So that's being brought back as well. I'm also talking to the school board about how do we fix theirs? And working with developers, like I said, I've already met with a good handful of them. So everything you've said is being worked on, just to let you know, and I'll, I'll report back as I get further on Thank it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Oh, Commissioner Servia. Hey, just one more thing before we end this, um, and that is I hope that we can um, take a strong look, and maybe the committee you're on, George, can do so, at what Hillsborough County is doing. They have an affordable housing trust fund, and I think they established it like 2013. Um, and I, I don't know all the details, but I think the money comes from general revenue. I don't know. I think it's worth looking into no wh what they're doing and how it's working and, and to see if there's anything that translates well to Manatee County. Yeah, and, and I've looked into a few. I'll be really quick on this. There are different ways to fund that. Um, one way is general revenue. Um, in other ways with bonding. In other, one way a lot of people do it is, like I just mentioned, no one's using our density incentives for affordable housing because they just don't want to build it. It's cost prohibitive right now to build. A lot of communities, I believe Orange County, a few others, what they do is give you an either or option. You can build me 20 affordable units to qualify for, or each unit it costs you 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars, whatever you come up with. You can basically buy your way out of building the affordability. It's allowing people to buy density effect effectively, and then all those dollars go into a fund that's specifically used to affordable housing. And as we've seen, almost everyone's showing up here from an R3 to an R6 to an R9. It, that can start creating meaningful dollars, and it allows them the density they want, which is which is profitable for them, and it allows them to avoid the affordable housing. It does hurt from an inclusiveness standpoint because then we end up building affordable housing elsewhere, um, but we're not having mandatory inclusionary. But there are different ways to fund that. I have looked at a few of them. General funds is a little tough, but there are some creative ones like buying up, buying up the density as opposed to building. Thank you, Commissioner Cruz. Uh, this is not an actionable item, so I will close discussion on this item now. Uh, Mayor Chappie, did you wish to address this board? 
I don't mind extending a professional courtesy. Okay. All right. Uh, in that case, I will recess this meeting until 1.30. We're in recess. Hi, I'm Manatee County Commissioner Kevin Van Austin Bridge, and I represent District 3, which is located in West Bradenton. Welcome to GT Bray Park. As you may have noticed, GT Bray Park has been undergoing extensive renovations. We started at the Little League Complex, and we moved over to softball, and then the football stadium, lastly soccer, and now we're at the Walden Racquet Center. So how is Manatee County keeping up with the demands of the fastest growing sport in America? Let's find out on this episode of Manatee on the Move. Racket centers aren't what they used to be. They aren't just tennis anymore. Pickleball is one of the fastest growing sports in America and here in Manatee County is no exception. That's why we're adding eight additional pickleball courts to GT Bray Park for a total of 20. Covered playing areas will also be added, allowing for play in inclement weather. When not in use, these covered areas can be utilized for additional activities such as summer camp. And let's not forget about our tennis lovers. Manatee County is upgrading the clay tennis courts at GT Bray Park with a new underground sprinkler system. And since the new irrigation system will only require the courts to be raked, players will no longer have to wait for the courts to dry, meaning less downtime in between games. In addition to replacing the irrigation system, the county will upgrade four of the existing eight courts, making them USTA regulation, which means Manatee County can now host tournaments. Shaded seating between courts is also being added, and we're upgrading court lighting. New pickleball courts, and a major upgrade to the tennis courts at GT Bray Park. These are just some of the ways that Manatee County Government and the Board of County Commissioners are improving your quality of life. Hello, I'm County Commissioner Vanessa Ball, and I'm honored to represent District 5 in Manatee County. Welcome to the Premier Sports Campus, home to some of the best soccer fields in the state, and soon way, way more.
Because of easy access to I-75, the mall at UTC, our charming Main Street, and thriving neighborhood communities, Lakewood Ranch has quickly become the most populated area of Manatee County, and soon we'll be offering even more to our citizens through new developments taking place at Premier Sports Campus and the land just to the north. On the Premier Sports Campus side, we're in the design stage of a new air-conditioned, multi-purpose, permanent framed soccer tent offering shade for meetings, registration, dining, ceremonies, and gatherings during busy soccer tournament weekends. This project also includes climate-controlled restrooms, new stadium lights, locker rooms for the stadium, parking lot improvements, and a stadium scoreboard. Moving north, our East County General Development Plan calls for a new racket complex scheduled for completion in the spring of 2023. This project features 24 pickleball courts, a small administration office, restrooms, water fountains, lighting, and shade. The new 50,000 square foot East County Library Complex is set to break ground at the end of January, offering modernized access to a world of knowledge for our citizens, visitors, and families. Complete with a rooftop terrace, the East County Library will provide a picturesque view of the Premier Park campus, as well as a serene pond. A 25-yard, 10-lane, competitive swimming pool will be the heart of our new aquatic center. Swim a few laps, take a fitness class, or catch some shade or sun while the kids take swimming lessons. And we're not stopping there. Future proposed projects on this site could include additional ponds, an amphitheater, gymnasium, a baseball and softball complex, dog park, a playground, BMX track, basketball and volleyball courts, clay tennis courts, a Manatee County Sheriff's District office and fleet facility, additional green space, and a skate park. By the way, our new East County General Development Plan calls for approximately 280 additional parking spaces in Phase 1, with up to 500 spaces included in future phases so everyone has a chance to realize what I've known for a long, long time, that District 5, Lakewood Ranch in Manatee County is a great place to live, work, and play. Hello, I'm Kevin Van Austinbridge. As Chairman of the Manatee County Board of County Commissioners, I would like to thank you for your availability and support as we share our priorities for the upcoming legislative session. For the sake of transparency, this video will also be made widely available to the public. So, if you're a taxpayer of Manatee County and you happen to be viewing this, we welcome you too. Joining me will be my colleagues, James Satcher from District 1, Reggie Bellamy from District 2, Misty Servia from District 4, Vanessa Baugh representing District 5, and at-large commissioners Carol Whitmore and George Cruz. Now let's get to work. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you. To reduce the potential for future degradation of water quality and the ecological and economic viability of the Tampa Bay region, we have made the closure of the Piney Point facility our top continued focus. And I would love to thank Governor DeSantis for including it in his proposed budget this year. This really is a quality of life issue to ensure the safe and efficient closure of the Piney Point facility once and for all to permanently eliminate the threat to the environment and to our community. It's no secret, Manatee County is growing. And while we're excited for this growth, we know that it comes with hardships like increased traffic. That's why we're requesting a non-recurring state legislative appropriation of seven and a half million to match local funding to wide Mox and Wallow Road between I-75 and US 301 in one of the county's fastest growing areas. This funding will allow us to widen the road from two lanes to four and add bicycle lanes and sidewalks. It's gonna result in more time with family, less time sitting in traffic, and a safer road for all of us. And that's something all the hardworking taxpayers of Manatee County can get behind. Manatee County ranked in the top four counties in Florida for child removals in 2018 and 2019, yet ranked near the bottom in terms of funding, receiving over $14,000 less per child entering foster care than the statewide average. 
That's why we're asking for a more equitable distribution of funding for the child welfare system to allow us to better meet the needs of our at-risk children and families in the community. This includes investing in the ideas that keep families together and finding ways to prevent children from ending up in foster care in the first place. Manatee County bridges are necessary for everything from day-to-day -day traffic to hurricane evacuations and as a corridor to some of the best beaches and tourist destinations in the nation. That's why we support the expeditious replacement of the bridges leading to Anna Maria Island via Cortez Road, Manatee Avenue, and over the Longboat Pass, as well as the expansion of the Fort Hamer Bridge. In addition, the DeSoto Bridge replacement is a top priority for multiple organizations since the project will facilitate improved north-south capacity on the US-41 corridor. Let's relieve congestion, improve traffic flow, and get Manatee County taxpayers and tourists alike where they need to go safely and efficiently. Manatee County taxpayers have already invested a great deal in protecting our beaches and dunes. Let's continue to protect the taxpayer investment by supporting regulation that keeps our beaches intact and beautiful. Manatee County is requesting $2.3 million for the construction and monitoring of erosion control at Anna Marie Island. Of course, the condition of our beaches is only as strong as the quality of the water that dance along on our shores. Ongoing threats like blue-green algae and red tide blooms tend to upend much of our hard work. That's why we're requesting $950,000 in state assistance for an oyster and clam research and restoration pilot project that will quantify the roles oysters and clams play in an improving water quality in the coastal waters of Manatee County and Tampa and Sarasota Bay. Manatee County supports measures that increase broadband accessibility. This includes encouraging private investment in the deployment of infrastructure in the rural and underserved areas and beyond. It's time to give these citizens the same quality access to the world that much of our urban areas already enjoy. You know, Quality of life is about connections, and connecting people to ideas and information is just as vital as connecting potential workers to local businesses. Business leaders in Manatee County point to the shortage of workforce housing as a significant reason they have trouble attracting and retaining talent. As Manatee County's population continues to grow, so does our shortage of affordable housing. It is imperative that the state use the statutorily dedicated funds for actual housing needs, and we support allocating the full amount of dedicated documentary tax revenue to fund the Sadowski Housing Trust Fund and its distribution to local governments for affordable housing activities. The pedestrian crossing at US 41 and 17th Street at Lincoln Park has been identified in the Palmetto Trail study as an intersection that needs improvement for both traffic movement and pedestrian safety. Manatee County requests state funds for the design of a bicycle pedestrian bridge over the four-lane US-41 roadway. The proposed overpass at this intersection accommodates critical pedestrian safety measures and provides access to the community park, the splash park, the new pool, basketball courts, and soccer and football fields that are currently under construction in District 2. Thank you for the opportunity to share our legislative priorities with you. You can find an in-depth breakdown of these legislative items as well as other items in the legislative agenda packet that you've been provided. If you're a citizen, I encourage you to reach out to your local state representative in support of these measures that will improve your quality of life. Thank you for your time and consideration as we move Manatee County forward together. We have already impacted the North River community by adding sidewalks and safety lights to the underserved areas. We're in the process of transforming Washington Park into a community stomping ground. And now, we're reaching new heights at Lincoln Park. Let's dive into the deep end on this episode of Manatee on the Moon. Hello, I'm Commissioner Reggie Bellin, and I'm proud to represent District 2 in Manatee County. By now, you've probably driven by, seen the slide, and had a few questions regarding the improvements we're making at Lincoln Park. It all starts with the brand new competitive swimming pool, perfect for fitness, swimming meets, and cooling off during the heat of the summer. 
This project also features a separate zero depth entry kiddie pool with aquatic playground, slide and plunge pool, parking expansion, picnic pavilions, and a locker and a restroom entry plaza that will also house a lifeguard station, small party prep area, and a pump house. And we're just scratching the surface. Right around the time we're wrapping up the pool project, we'll begin work on a two-story press box that will stand tall over our additional bleacher upgrades on the home and away side of the football field. In addition to a new scoreboard and fencing, we'll also be adding restrooms to accommodate our athletes and spectators. Friday night lights at Lincoln Park will never look better. To make way for the Aquatic Center, we'll be constructing two brand new basketball courts near the football field. These slip resistant surface courts will feature regulation lighting and fencing and will also include little touches like benches and chilled water fountains, trash cans, and more. With all the enhancements we're making at Lincoln Park, accessibility is paramount. That's why we're building a pedestrian bridge to connect Sylvan Oaks with Lincoln Park. And that's what this project is about, building bridges so future generations can enjoy the safety, accessibility, and recreation that this facility will bring to all Manatee County. I'm ready to go. Are you? Good morning, everyone. It's Monday, January the 24th, 9.30 a.m., and the MPO board meeting is called to order. Mr. Hutchinson, do we have a quorum? Can you do a roll call, please? Um, we do have a quorum. Okay, do you want to go ahead and do the roll call just in case? Um, would you like to um, announce who's here in the net? I, I can do that. And we have um, um, Mayor Judy Titsworth from the ITPO, Home Speech. Commissioner Kevin Van Austinbridge of Manatee County, Council Member Joe Numder, City of Venice, Commissioner Al Mayo, um, Sarasota County, welcome back, Mayor Gene Brown, City of Bradenton, Mayor Pete Emmerich, City of Northport, and we have, uh, I think Brian Williams from uh, the City of Palmetto is en route. Uh, I had a message that I didn't get the full message, but um, I understand there's some traffic out on University Parkway. That's what I'm hearing, yes. And we have our vice chair, Commissioner Cutsinger from Sarasota County, and our chair, Commissioner Vanessa Baugh from Manatee County, Commissioner Christian Ziegler from Sarasota County, May vice mayor Mike Haycock from Town of Longboat Key, and our past chair, Commissioner Liz Alpert, City of Sarasota, and Mayor Eric Arroyo, City of Sarasota, Commissioner Misty Servia from Manatee County, and Council Member Bill Sanders, City of Bradenton, and Commissioner Carlos Bruff is absent. And at the moment, uh, Commission, or Vice Mayor Barbara Langdon from City of Northport um, is also, she is just here. <laughs> She's excellent. Ooh. Good timing. Go around. Yes, ma'am, or either, either way, way. <laughs> you're gonna have to go around. Welcome, thank you. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, we're going to go ahead next. Uh, Commissioner um, Alpert, will you do the invocation and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Go ahead next. Uh, Commissioner Alpert, will you do the invocation and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Right, will you please bow your head with me and let us pray together, each one of us, according to our individual beliefs. Thank you for every seat that has been filled here today, for each mind and heart that fills the presence of this room. 
Thank you for the gift of life and the opportunity to serve the people of our region. Help us to act with character and conviction. Help us to listen with understanding and goodwill. Help us to speak with charity and restraint. Keep us ever mindful of opportunities to render our service to fellow citizens and to our community. Guide us as to how to satisfy the needs that need to be met during this meeting. Guide us so that this meeting can be productive. Strengthen us as we make tough decisions. And finally, bless the people of this community and help us work together to make it a better home for all. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, let's do it. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, open the meeting to public comment, including any comments on any agenda item. Um, in, on your screen, you will see four ways for the public to provide input to the board. All comments received before, during, and after meeting will be shared with the committee members and made a part of the public record. I love this script, by the way. This meeting is being live streamed as, as publicly noticed and will be available on METV, the MPO Facebook, and publicinput.com. Ms. Eubanks, have we received any comments? All right, thank you. Uh, then we'll go ahead and... Um, Move forward. All right, next is reports. Um, the MPO report, Mr. Executive Director. Um, actually, F. Dot, I believe it should be in front of mine. Secretary Nan. It is may, correct, yes. We may have several items on which this. to report. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Good, Good morning. morning. Um, interestingly, Madam Chair, I do not have any updates, but I do want to introduce our new um, Sarasota Manatee MPO liaison. Justin Abraham, who used to be in this position, he took another position within the department, went to work for the Interstate Program Group. So we hired uh, Tanya Merkel here. Um, she came from our construction office. Uh, she has a planning degree and wanted to get into planning area, so she took this position a couple of months ago. So she's going to be your liaison from now on. Tanya. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Tanya Markle with FDOT. So this morning for FDOT, I want to just let you know that the River Road project is getting ready to start. We have a public meeting which is scheduled for January 27th from 530 to 730 at the Englewood Sports Complex. And there will also be a virtual option if you want to attend that way. That it's there, we're in the process of scheduling a ground breaking after the public meeting, so I will keep you updated on anything that comes up with that. And just in case you see anything out there, clearing and grubbing is scheduled to begin at the end of this month, and that's in preparation for all the prior to utility work, things that need to get done but the actual widening construction is anticipated to start in May. So keep an eye out for that. And then we have on I-75, our planning and feasibility study is underway for the Southwest North Corridor Master Plan. And that's 40 miles of I-75 from south of River Road to north of Moccasin Wallow. Public meetings are anticipated to be scheduled in April of 2022. And we're hoping that the interstate will be able to present updates to the MPO board coming soon. We'll get that scheduled as soon as all their data is in. And in conjunction that we had um, D7 interstate with their PD&E for their part of I-75 from Moccasin Wallow to US-301. So there was a small little overlap. So we've been in communication with D7 to make sure that our ideas are going along the same way. They were. They have presented to the TAC and CAN at our last meetings. They weren't able to come to you this meeting because they have a conflicting meeting. So next time, we'll get that one scheduled for you as well. And that is what I have right now to report. Do you have any questions or anything I can Any do? questions? Not seeing any. Thank you so much Thank and welcome much. aboard. Thank you. Look forward to working with I you. Look forward to it. 
All right, the MPO executive director. I don't know about the script stuff. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Mr. Chair, Bob. I um, <laughs> have a few items that I would like to um, bring to your attention and talk about. Um, I guess first off, um, we had some additional staff changes since our last meeting. Um, and Alvi Marie Corrales, who is here today, is um, has take she was our planning manager and she's taken a job as the chief transportation planner with the city of Sarasota. They've done it again. But um, um, we really are are proud of of our staff and and it's you know it's a good thing when when they um, advance in their career. So she and Corinne are now at the city. We will miss her, but I also would like to introduce our newest staff member, um, Winona Venter, AKA, also known as Nina, and she just joined us in December. She's a sociology doctoral candidate at the University of South Florida, USF, where she taught sociology and urban studies courses before joining the MPO. Her dissertation is about city making, including, including governance and urban planning. So uh, she's going to fit right in with transportation planning. She earned a master's degree um, in sociology and a graduate certificate in community development from USF and a bachelor in liberal arts from New College of Florida. And she recently served um, on several community related projects, including the Sarasota County Community Report Card as an intern with the SCOPE program, which is Sarasota County Openly Plans for Excellence. Most of you are aware of that. And so she's already familiar with a lot of the demographic data that we use at the MPO. So um, welcome. Welcome, Nina. Nina. And we, we are advertising for, um, you know, at least one more position. And, you know, Ryan um, Brown has, is now in the role of planning manager. And yes, I'll, um, and I'm not, I'm going to get to probably the most important um, one in a minute. But so while I'm on Ryan, in your, at your places, you will see that Ryan recently presented on our Tuesday traffic jam program um, in the, at the National Transportation Research Board annual meeting in Washington, D.C., and received a um, recognition for that presentation. And our, our, we were runner-up to a program, can't remember who, whose program it was, but they spent half a million dollars on their public outreach program and our our program was produced in-house and um, probably cost us you know a thousand or several thousand dollars so we feel pretty comfortable about that and we're proud of uh, of our Tuesday traffic man jam program that was continuing and um, wanted to let you know about that recognition for Ryan you also in your packets um, you'll see save the date information about two sessions of the um, statewide MPOAC Institute, which is training for MPO elected officials, board members, and MPO board members. Um, and in our MPO, all but one are elected officials. There's also the calendar, which um, nothing changed from the last time you saw it, but that's just so you'll have it handy. Uh, that's been sent out by email as well. There's some information about the infrastructure bill. We have yet to see any of the funds from that show up in our F.Work program, but we're anticipating that they will um, hopefully between now and July. And then last but not least, um, we had another um, transition, and Sue Clapsaddle, who worked for the MPO for 34 years as our finance manager and um, handled our, our, you know, human resources for many, many years has decided to retire. So um, we have a certificate to present to Sue who um, didn't want to come. She wanted to slip quietly out the side door, but we're not going to let her do that completely. So we're going to ask <laughs> Charles Clapsaddle to come up and receive the certificate. I wish we could do a Rolex, but, you know, federal funds. The federal government is here today to report on our certification, so we better 
Yeah. Just forget the Rolexes. Right. And Dave, could you join me up here to present this? Yes. Or I'll come down there. item um, that I would uh, just point out is on our consent agenda, um, we have um, provisions for an additional uh, legal services contract, um, and, and Rob Eschenfelder is actually here in the audience should any questions arise for him. And that's um, all I have for my report today. Any questions? <coughs> Not seeing any, Dave, thank you. I guess I'm next. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to let the board know that uh, I did go to a meeting that was up near Tampa, and it was uh, done actually by DOT, and it was about uh, rail, passenger rail, and it was a, a great, great meeting, and I think that you're gonna see some things moving forward here very soon. Um, I'm not sure, to be honest, how it will affect us right off the bat. I don't know that it will, but it is in process. So I was very excited about that, just to let you know. Um, also, I just want to add that there is an MPO uh, AC meeting this uh, Thursday. Um, the executive board, I, <clears throat> I sit on their executive board right now, um, and we are in the process of redoing bylaws and and so forth, so there's a lot going on on the state level uh, with Dave, and, and um, I'll be there, well, actually Thursday and Friday in Orlando. Um, I wanna say congratulations and welcome aboard to Nina. Way to go, we're excited. Uh, Ryan, congratulations. We're very fortunate to have you. Also, for any new members to the uh, MPO, you might wanna think about that Weekend Institute. It really is worthwhile. Uh, there's a lot of different fundings, uh, funding sources uh, that come into play and, and you need to know about all of them for your areas. Um, so I would look into that in April. I think what, Dave, the 22nd through the 24th, I think it was? That's the first one in Orlando. <coughs> the second one is in Tampa. And if you've attended in the past, you can attend again. The MPO reimburses you or your jurisdiction for the cost of attending. There's a fee for the course and your travel expenses. Um, and the last, <clears throat> the last thing I would like to say is that um, I do have a certificate of appreciation for Commissioner Dietert, who is not with us today, so I'm going to give it to the vice chair uh, to present. And then um, Commissioner Alpert, I know it's a little soon in this meeting, but if you would join me out here, I would like to present you with this as well. You were such a great chair to the MPO. So uh, just a certificate of appreciation for your time, your service, and your professionalism. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that's really um, all I have at this point. So I just killed two birds with one stone. All right, action items number six. Dave, do you want to move forward? Certainly. I'm. Uh, this is the consent agenda, and oh, item five. I will okay. read oh, the um, items that are on the consent agenda, which include approval of the minutes from November eighth, um, the committee appointments, reappointments to our bicycle pedestrian trails advisory right. committee. Um, approval of execution of um, renewal of, of one of our current legal services contract and adding another legal services contract. And um, there's a modification to our 2045 long range transportation plan, um, primarily the summary cost feasible 
um, uh, document that clarifies the cost feasibility. This is in response to some of these federal certification um, um, items, a corrective action item that you'll hear about later. We believe this addresses it. There are also several work task assignments. There's a um, template that we're asking your approval for so that we can enter into um, work task assignments with our three GPCs so that we can call on them at, while we're short staffed specifically um, to accomplish our, our planning tasks. And there's also a Federal Transit Administration or FTA grant, which is the, the latest um, round of funding from the Federal Transit Administration. Any questions, commissioners? Not seeing any, what is the pleasure of the board? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion to approve by um, Mayor, Mayor Brown. Brown. I keep wanting to say commissioner. With a second by Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Yes, ma'am, it's approved unanimously. Thank you. All right. So welcome aboard, Mr. <clears throat> Eschenfelder. It's been a long time. It's good to see you. Can I sure, please. Madam Chair, members, uh, I appreciate uh, on behalf of the firm Trastenio to be uh, added as one of your uh, legal counsel. I personally had the um, honor of being the MPO general counsel for three different executive directors. Long time. And uh, from 2002 to 2016, and uh, our firm also just took over my uh, colleague Erica Jello to be a city attorney for Homeless Beach, and, and so we're happy to serve in this capacity and I help you all do your mission again. So thank you very much. And I would have been here earlier, but there was a huge accident. <laughs> we need more planning. Okay, Rob. <laughs> Stop it, Thanks Rob. You know. <laughs> For those that don't know, we were honored to have um, Mr. Eschenfelder at the county attorney's office in Manatee <coughs> for many years. So it's good to see you. Thank you. All right, item number six, Dave. Um, I, I will introduce uh, Tanya Merkel and Ryan Brown who have a Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP amendment, that's been requested by the Florida Department of Transportation, and there are several items in the TIP amendment that they can present um, that we would like to adopt into our TIP. Well, we had the operating assistance for the MCAT and SCAT, and these are previously existing in the TIP STIP. They're the 22 annual grant funds that are being added to have that and there were some no-go awards that have been rescinded because of material shortages that have been impacted the access and manufacturing process to the buses so once we get direction and materials are available again we'll work that back into the program okay great Ryan anything to add nope just she pretty much know that you know those those two no-go's were awarded and like she said there were some cost overruns and shortages that that prevented those from being awarded this time, the, the two that are being asked to be moved forward are, are operating assistance um, for our two transit agencies in Manatee and Sarasota County. So with those amendments, we'll be able to work that into the TIP and they'll be able to receive that funding. So that's pretty much it, pretty standard. Any questions? Not seeing any. All right, this requires a vote uh, by show of hands, please. So what is the pleasure of this board? I need a motion. Somebody? Madam Chair, no, motion to approve. Thank you. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please raise your hands. All opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Short and sweet. To the point. All right. All right, Dave, next. Great. I would introduce Slade Downs, um, who is our MPO multimodal transportation planner that um, is no longer our newest staff member. <laughs> and you've met Slade before. That so, was quick. Um, I, I will say that um, he's also presented this information to the Citizens Advisory Network and to the Technical Advisory Committee. And the uh, Technical Advisory Committee um, recommends that the board adopt the safety targets for the next cycle. And, uh, you know, we are making progress apparently uh, better than some of our neighbors to the north where they had a big increase in, um, you know, 
worsening of the safety situation in Pinellas, we are continuing to, um, to make progress towards a destination of zero. We're, it's gonna take a while to get there, but Slade can give us that overview. Thank you. Yes, good morning, board. Um, and as David said, uh, no longer the new guy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, good to be here this morning. Uh, we should have a PowerPoint presentation if we could throw that up on the projector screen. So I'm not just listing a stream of numbers at you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. As, as David was saying, uh, we set our safety performance measures every year. Uh, the MPO adopted our first round of safety targets back in January of 2018. Uh, we are now set to adopt our fifth set of targets uh, this year at this meeting. Uh, the safety targets uh, are federally mandated. Uh, you've all seen these before, but just in case, here's a quick refresher of the targets that we set and track. It is number of fatalities, rate of fatalities, number of serious injuries, rate of serious injuries, and number of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. These are all tracked based on five-year rolling averages, and that is what we are here to talk about today. For each of the... Um, Safety measures, we, you all, the board approved uh, these targets last year. And um, here is how we, the region performed. Um, thankfully, we met or uh, superseded most of our targets um, with just about every data point being lower than what we were anticipating. Uh, with the one exception of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. <clears throat> and as most of you know, the uh, fatalities and serious injuries reduction plan is now destination zero. Through destination zero, the MPO will identify actionable strategies to reduce fatalities and serious injuries. At next month's board meeting, we will have a full presentation on that, uh, I believe by Chris Keller, the consultant on Destination Zero. So this table here shows uh, historical safety data as well as the um, projected uh, numbers for next year. This first pair of gray columns here shows the adopted and what are adopted targets for the 2016-2020 time band and how we actually performed as a region. Um, unfortunately, did not meet most of those, but here, these, this second pair of gray columns shows the adopted and actual targets for targets and data for our region for the 2017-2021 time span. And this is just the same figures you saw on the previous slide where we've met four of five, thankfully. And finally, this pink column here shows uh, our proposed targets for the 2018-2022 time span. Uh, these, are these are generated uh, based on uh, the trends that we have been following uh, as a region in the based on the you know safety data shown on this chart. <clears throat> and in conclusion, these are uh, the five safety targets we are looking to adopt today. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, sir, go ahead. Could I ask a question? Th thank of you. Of course. Um, when looking at this report and you look at over the time period, obviously our population has grown. Um, and there's no data in there about what the population was till what it is now. And when you look at the numbers, you wouldn't think we were doing a good job. But if our population has grown by 25 or 50, 30 percent, maybe mm -hmm. the numbers would look better. And obviously, you hate to say about numbers with with fatalities, but 
you know, I mean, if I'm looking at this just from the numbers we see, it doesn't look very good. Mm. But if our population is a lot more, the numbers have gone down statistically. So I don't know if there's a way to put that component in it or not, or say okay. where we're at. Mm -hmm. So while that a, a per capita calculation of fatalities, injuries, and so, and so forth um, is not federally manda mandated, but I, I think it would be a good idea to, to display that just for the sake of tracking that internally for our region. I, I think that's Well, I, I, Madam Chair, if it's all right, I would think it would look good for our community because I've heard a few things from people that uh, the target zero is not realistic. And obviously we'd all like that, but we got to get in reality here and and what the federal government wants, we've got to produce, but also what we want to put out to the public is some common sense general person information, in my opinion. So. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, questions? Dave? Well, I might ask if they can put the um, um, six, uh, the action item recommendation up. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that that's a very good suggestion, Mayor Brown, and we can um, add that in. You'll hear uh, some of the, that perspective added mm -hmm. to our uh, Destination Zero plan um, that, that you'll be asked to adopt next month. And um, it does make sense. In fact, when the rule was being developed, those were some of the comments that MPOs around the country had suggested. Um, and, you know, it's a... Yeah. Rulemaking, I, I would imagine, um, is a an art of compromise from the the um, rule makers at the probably the federal and the state level. So um, they ended up with uh, something that that we are implementing. Um, however, uh, we I would give credit to both the Florida Department of Transportation and each of your jurisdictions for really upping the ante and emphasizing safety more in the last you know five to six years yeah. than a lot more than it was 10 or 15 years ago not that it wasn't important it was always it's always been important and it's always been part of our process but um, since we were identified as some being one of the more dangerous parts of the country to walk in or ride a bike in, mm -hmm. I, I think that um, every every one of your jurisdictions and the Florida DOT have has stepped up. I mean, LK has been a statewide champion for the safety program and including safety in every project, not just safety projects. So, I just also wanted to make sure that um, in adopting these targets. Um, you are aware that we're also supporting the transit safety targets um, uh, set forth by MCAT and SCAT, which are consistent with their past year's targets and progress towards reducing transit-related safety issues. So just want to make sure that's part of the record. I'm glad you, you said all that because, you know, we all know, all of us in this room know that our counties have certainly grown leaps and bounds. And so that is something that should show because it is going to affect the percentage mm -hmm. and how we look. So commission, thank you Mayor, yeah. for bringing that up. One follow-up if that's yes, all right, please. thank you. Um, some of you in this room probably know what my career job is and family, <laughs> but but yeah, so I, like it. It, I see that a little bit more when you talk about fatalities and, and obviously over the years dealing with those families. So it does hit a little bit more where, you know, I actually talk with them, yeah. you know, when they've lost somebody and what we're doing. So um, any statistical information I think we can put out will help. So thank you. All right. <clears throat> Good conversation. So thank you for your presentation. Any other? Yes, Commissioner. Uh, any idea why they're going down? Like what, what has been done to make things safer? So I, I can say that um, I, I know that a lot of, as far as the rates go, um, we have a much higher, the rates are calculated uh, using vehicle miles traveled, and we've had a lot more vehicle miles traveled this uh, past year. So uh, 
with roughly a lower number of a, a lower number of uh, fatalities and serious injuries combined with many more miles driven, that would show why the rate <coughs> themselves are going down as far as the actual numbers. Uh, Ryan, do you? Yeah. I'll yeah. just add, add one other part to that is, you know, we've also, we performed very poorly in the past in terms of we've dropped off some of our okay. significantly higher years. Yeah. So I wouldn't say that, you know, we're necessarily performing better. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're probably in similar of a status quo kind of thing. Um, you know, we've done some things. We've, you know, DOT's done a great job working with us in terms of some operational improvements and things like that in terms of, you know, no turning when PEDs are present and things like that, signage, um, reducing median crossings, things like that, filling in medians, reducing some of those middle turn lane uh, scenarios that we have that cause a lot of uh, head-on collisions and serious injuries and things like that. So there has been some kind of, you know, operational and, and physical, uh, you know, changes to our engineering. But, you know, it, as you said, we're, we're, our population is increasing. People are not used to our roads. Um, things like that that we're going to have to overcome. But really, I would say that the reason the numbers went down this year is because we did drop off one of our, our worst performing years in, in the, in the five-year average. Um, that's in, in real transparency. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Vice Chair? Yeah, if I might. I'm reminded of a conversation that we had uh, about um, traffic circles okay. and continuous flow intersections and the reduction in serious injuries. I'm wondering, I think we asked at that time for some updates on comparisons between those and intersect regular intersections. Did we ever follow up on that? Because I think that could be an important part of it. We have not yet followed up on that, but I think that is worth um, um, also adding to our Destination Zero presentation because we have examples here where um, Jacaranda had a lot of crashes. They were not serious injuries, they were not fatalities, but it increased that number. Um, the county, Sarasota County and Florida DOT um, went in and re-engineered it, made some changes, and I no longer have, you know, monthly complaints about the circle of death, <laughs> um, you know, which it wasn't, but people didn't like it, and it's, it's much better. Florida DOT has gone and replaced some of the lighting at intersections throughout the region and throughout the state with um, LED lighting, brighter uh, lighting that has apparently proven to reduce crashes. Um, the, you'll see on Cortez Boulevard, um, Cortez Road in um, Bradenton and Manatee County, they are installing uh, pedestrian activated crosswalks. So we'll see how those work. Hopefully they'll help. Um, you know, safety improvements on Bee Ridge Road seem to have made a difference. So your your projects also make a difference. And, you know, speed management is important. Slower speed doesn't necessarily mean fewer crashes or, uh, but it does mean fewer fatalities for bicyclists and pedestrians in areas where there are lots of, lots of pedestrian traffic. I think uh, Secretary Nandum has something to add. Mr. Secretary, please. Madam Chair, if I may. So, um, you know, obviously we had a year 2020, which was, uh, you know, hit by pandemic, right? So the traffic volumes were down. But one interesting that we have seen is the fatalities and severe injuries have not dropped down, right? You know, the numbers stayed the same. So speeding has become a big issue. But um, going back to the reason why we are seeing a stabilization in relation to the number of crashes is a lot of strategic initiatives that we've put forward as a department uh, to improve safety. You know, the lighting that Dave mentioned is one of them. And a lot of systemic improvements that include, um, you know, changes to traffic signals, protected left turns, you know, protecting the pedestrians, and median installations, all that stuff that we do uh, makes a difference. But, you know, think about the MPO board, right? You know, you've put roundabouts as a preferred method for intersection control. That makes a difference. We've been progressively implementing roundabouts at key locations for speed management, but also to reduce the fatal crashes at intersections. That, that makes a difference, right? You identified US 41 and, you know, as one of your strategic multimodal corridors, and we've been progressively implementing improvements on that corridor 
because of your priority that you put forward. So these are the kinds of things that make a difference. And, and you know, safety is an interesting fact in that, you know, when we look at the amount of funding we allocate just for safety, it shows as a small number, but everything that we do, every project that we do, we incorporate safety elements, you know, whether it is a resurfacing project, widening project, intersection project. All these progressive improvements that we do makes a big difference. You know, I'm, I lead the statewide pet bike coalition, and part of that program, you know, obviously engineering is one aspect, but you got to bring education and enforcement into the picture, right? So that particular coalition provides um, additional funding to our law enforcement agencies, which we call the high visibility enforcement, where we provide funding to the law enforcement agencies where they can go out and educate pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorists on safe behavior, right? You know, that makes a difference. So. Um, you know, it's a, it's a collaborative effort that's, you know, that's what makes a difference, and that's why you're seeing the numbers stable, stabilized. The goal is, you know, even though it's going to be tough, target zero, vision zero, or the MPO termed it as destination zero, right, you know? So that should be our goal, and we work towards that particular goal, and incrementally, we are pretty confident we're going to get close to that. Good points. Good points. Vice Mayor, go ahead. The... Um the 50 or so safety projects that are listed here, are they designed and funded, or are they just a realization that these are the most dangerous intersections we have and they need to be designed and funded? Is that the the draft project priorities list that you're... Um, it just yeah. says the top safety projects. Oh, in the project. part of the LRTP. So, um, here, Ryan, you... Would you like to? I, I believe yeah, Ryan would so be able to. So those are, those are uh, were identified in our in our process uh, from our previous safety assessment in 2019 and through our LRTP development. Um, those were identified as that uh, as, as our uh, the areas that we need to address. So your second statement was correct. Those those are areas where your jurisdictions could apply for funding through our process, and they're identified in the LRTP to receive funding if they do apply through the project priority process. So those were determined as, you know, high ranking, serious injury and fatality locations that we need to address going forward. And then you all would lead the effort to help with um, what are the safety issues that need to be yeah, addressed in the Along with the OT, correct. Okay. Any other questions from the board? All right, we need a, um, a motion. Um, do I have a motion and a second? I move adoption of the 2018-2022 safety targets setting, including transit agency safety targets as recommended. Second. second. All right, we have a motion and a second. A motion by Commissioner Servia, a second by, uh, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. Um, and you're not on the list. I'm sorry. Vice uh, by Vice Mayor, thank you. I couldn't see your title. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? To prove unanimous, oh, raise your hand. I just have Is a question. Is that what you're going to say? Does that include expressing support for FDOT's uh, Vision Zero target? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right, good. All right, thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. Um, Dave C, 6C, Metropolitan Planning Organization Advisory Council and Ca Sun Coast Transportation Alliance. Good. I, I see Ryan's name on there. He may have something to add, but this is an annual action normally taken um, with the election of the chair and the vice chair. The uh, MPOAC is a statewide MPO organization. Um, Commissioner Baugh has been the representative for a number of years when um, she was a available and willing to participate in those quarterly meetings and sometimes more. She is, uh, last year was elected to the executive board of the MPOAC and um, was instrumental in ensuring that we um, hired a new director for the statewide organization. And the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance, formerly known as the um, West Central Florida MPO's Chairs Coordinating Committee, is a regional uh, Tampa Bay out to Polk County um, organization that also meets twice a year as a governing board. And um, one of those meetings every other year involves meeting uh, jointly with the uh, Central Florida Transportation Alliance, which is um, Orlando all the way to the East Coast. And the 
Um, what has normally happened is the chair is the main representative if they're available and willing to serve. The vice chair and the past chair are designated as alternates. And that would be uh, a staff recommendation to, um, for a motion to ratify those appointments. Councilman? Yeah, Madam Chair, I guess uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the recommendation for uh, you to continue on in those uh, particular roles, if that's okay with you. Uh, it's great for me. Thank you. And does that also include the vice chair and the past vice chair? Yes, ma'am, it does. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. I'm sorry, was that you? Yes, All right, we have a second. All in favor, say I, aye. Are there questions, Madam Chair? Absolutely. Yes. Commissioner Servia. So my question is just that um, you have announced publicly that you are, you're planning to resign soon. And so what would happen in the event that our chairman resigns? What is the process for putting someone in so there is a seamless um, leadership? Go ahead. The, well, the board would elect a new chair from Manatee County inclusive of jurisdictions, which would be you know, <coughs> Palmetto, um, the ITPO representative, or and Longboat Key, or any of the Manatee County commissioners. Um, and then that chair would fill the, the representation on the regional and statewide bodies. Um, the, those statewide, the MPOAC would be responsible for replacing um, the representative to the uh, executive committee, and it's likely that they would uh, elect someone to the executive committee that, that had already been serving on the MPOAC. And Commissioner Servia, I might add, since it's in reference to me, that the only way that I will be resigning is if I run for state and win the House of Representatives seat, then come November I would have to resign. But that's the only way that that would happen. Okay, thank you. In case you're curious. Any other comments before we vote? Not seeing any. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Thank you very much. It's approved unanimously. Thank you to uh, all of our board members. I appreciate it. I do enjoy the MPOAC and I work very closely with Dave. Um, Vice Chair, you will find the MPOAC very enlightening. You will enjoy it. And uh, past uh, Chair, you already know, so I don't have to tell you. So thank you for still cooperating with this moving forward. All right, Dave, next. Um, I'm going to introduce Ryan, and this is one of two highlights of today's meeting. Um, <laughs> you know, we're all about projects and project delivery, and... This is the next round or cycle of our annual priority list of priority projects that gets presented to FDOT for funding. And it has to be consistent with the long range transportation plan um, and sometimes other, other annual uh, legislative um, activities get balanced in. But um, we have been working with your jurisdictional staffs to develop the updated list of project priorities, which will come back next month for adoption. And uh, I don't, I'll, let, I'll turn it over to Ryan. Yeah, I mean, you, you covered a lot of it. Um, so <laughs> uh, basically, this list in front of you, we like to do it, you know, in twofold. We never like to just bring a list to you and say adopt it so you know we try to we try to bring it back at least to two meetings uh this was our first draft um through the last few months your jurisdictional staffs had done a great job getting your applications into us to score and then be prioritized on this list um it's very similar to the past years i will add that we did add a category um this year following our efforts um over the last two years to develop a transportation system and management and operations committee which is basically our technology improvements um, so that category was added this year to this priority list um, your jurisdiction submitted a number of projects um, double digits really which is great to see so that we can fund those projects this year based on um, you know feedback from FDOT and Federal Highway on some of those projects so that's kind of the main addition in terms of the new types of projects that were included um, other than that um, there were quite a few new projects um, out east, um, various types of projects that I'm sure you've all um, reviewed within your jurisdiction. So um, really, this was just a, sh a short presentation to say, you know, we've, we've gone through, worked with your staffs, um, scored these projects, gotten their initial feedback, and we wanted to bring it to you all um, for the first time. So you've got, you know, some time to mull over it, look at it. 
um, you know, you can provide immediate feedback or obviously reach out to us or through your staffs, um, any of your concerns. So this will be back in February for a, as a final draft for approval, but this, this was a simply an effort to, to make sure you were aware of, of what was going on in the process. So um, with that, I can take any questions related to this list now, or as always, um, anytime. Commissioner Mayo, do you have any questions, sir? Uh, not a question, but I just want to point out that uh, I guess on the second second page, mm -hmm. uh, future SIS, uh, that I-75, uh, yep. they're calling it a commerce connector, the interchange. Uh, a lot of work has already gone into that uh, at meetings uh, several years ago with the uh, Charlotte County, Punta Gorda, MPO. Uh, I know that was just uh, canceled uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, they uh, agreed, Charlotte County agreed wholeheartedly that they had no problem with that next interchange after the one at 681 being moved into Northport. It still serves the same uh, same things that the one that was previously thought of uh, in Charlotte County. So uh, that's got pretty universal buy-in from this group, the Punta Gorda, uh, Charlotte County MPO, Sarasota County individually and the city of Northport. So just uh, just a, a little refresher on how that got there and everybody's hopes for that. It's also nice to have you back <laughs> to say. <laughs> Vice Mayor? Uh, yes, to, to add on to that, we've had a lot of discussion in terms of should the entrance and, and egress from 75 be on Yorkshire to Raintree? And I just want to make sure that everyone here understands that <laughs> the area of Yorkshire, so the area east of Toledo Blade in Northport, is targeted for pretty intense economic development, is zoned for light manufacturing, um, logistics, distribution, and having the exit at Raintree um, will mean that there will be trucks going through residential communities. So uh, I am a major proponent of having both the entrance and exit being on Yorkshire. That area is zoned commercial, industrial. The areas off of Raintree are zoned residential and it will be a huge disruption, not right away, but in five or 10 years, a huge disruption to that residential community to have that industrial traffic flowing through their neighborhoods. So um, I know we're many years away from um, where that interchange will go in, but we need to really have some, some more discussion in terms of the proper place to put that. Yes, sir. A year or two ago, um, the MPO staff met with uh, Charlotte County Punta Gorda MPO staff, FDOT staff, and um, Sarasota County in Northport. And we heard from DOT what some of the things they would be looking for to be able to advance the concept into you know, the, the necessary studies. And of course, they, they want to make sure that there's going to be funding for the entire project before they get too far down the road. They also talked about the need for uh, Sarasota County and the city of Northport and Charlotte County to work on a connection up towards Kings Highway out to the east. Otherwise, um, they it might not pencil out to be a need. And you know they look for a certain level of traffic. So. Um, I would say that this is a, it's on our list, it's in our long range plan, and there's a lot of work to be done to, to make it happen. Great. On the other hand, you know, sometimes things can happen fast if, if uh, you know, stars are in alignment and everyone's right. in agreement. So one of the concepts that was talked about was a collector to distributor system that would involve traffic uh, being able, you know, connecting Rain Tree and Yorkshire, they basically are connected already off the interstate system so it may be a hybrid type of solution not one or the other right. but until they get to the point where they're ready to do those interchange studies um, which can cost a million dollars or more um, they, just for that part of it um, it's probably best to 
keep our our options open to as to um, those specifics. Dave, Dave and I would, I would I would add that you know DOT also you know encourage that you, you need to have this you know the sustainable you know roadway network around the interchange um, prior to, to to investing in that. So you know we've we've brought up some connections between veterans and things like that to where we could realign and, and create some better you know entrance and you know exits off of off of that interchange so there might need to be some you know expansion and capacity improvements to the existing roadway network surrounding that interchange prior to that to happening so obviously we all know there's a lot of work to go in but but understandably you know we want we do want to follow in line with land use and make sure that we're not you know mm -hmm. building an interchange in the middle of a neighborhood so that's, that's right that's, that's right understood. absolutely thank you very much for that yes sir go ahead <coughs> I agree completely with what the Vice Mayor said. That was also a consideration. I should have mentioned that. But I'll give you another overlay, if I may. There is uh, great activity in future economic expansion and development at the EDC in Sarasota County. And that is one of the places that there is the land, and that's everyone's future hopes. Right. So there's plenty happening at the EDC, which can provide an overlay as you try to promote what you just said, Madam Vice right. Chair. Right. All right. Thank you for that. I have a related. Um, yes, go ahead. OK, thank you very much, of course. Chair. Um, we have two projects, the interchange beautification projects at 75 and Sumter and 75 at Toledo Blade. Um, at the intersection of 75 and to Toledo Blade, I think we need to do some coordination of effort. I will share with this group that the population of Northport is just shy of 80,000 at this point in time, and we're expecting a build out to be a community of 240,000 people. Toledo Blade is our industrial corridor. There, uh, uh, the city is investing this year in bringing utilities to that intersection. There is a lot of activity in the areas to the northeast of Toledo Blade. We currently have 28,000 workers in the city. 90% of them leave the city every day to work somewhere else. So again, I bring that up only because um, I'm anticipating, we are anticipating a lot of development and activity in that area, and I would hate for us to spend money on a <coughs> beautification project when what we need is additional lanes um, and capacity at that interchange. So we just need to coordinate very <coughs> carefully as development plans progress for that area so that we're not wasteful of government money. Thank very you. good points, very good points. Any other comments? Um, I do, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Um, are there any public participation forums scheduled in the first quarter or the first half of the year that you can share with us? In, in terms of the project priorities? Yes, or, um, yes. Yeah, and then, you know, a, as these things become, you know, projects, right, the, the <laughs> DOT helps us coordinate project-related uh, outreach and public studies, but in terms of the public, you know, in terms of the project priorities, no, there isn't, you know, an actual, there will not be a, a, a physical meeting, but we will try to, you know, push it out through all of our, you know, all of our channels at our committees, through our newsletters and things like that to make sure that, you know, and we've gotten some good public feedback. I've gotten some good public comment already, um, you know, through some of our public input, um, through our, through our um, social media pages and things like that when, when these things get posted. Surprisingly, you know, the public is very engaged when, when it comes to the project priorities in the future that we'd like so if they were more engaged with all the things that we do, but um, the projects don't, they don't seem to miss those uh, very often. So uh, we'll continue to step that up and, and potentially in the future that, you know, that, that would probably be a good idea. We maybe we could tie it in with DOT's work program um, when they do their, their work program meeting in the, in later in the year, we could, you know, tie along with some of those things, but um, that, that's a great comment. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Commissioner Servier, was that it? I, I might add that, um, you know, this is, um, I wouldn't say it's a work of art because it's data based and, and it is based on, you know, where we think projects can solve some of these performance measure identified issues. Um, so we're limited, you know, it can't just be somebody's favorite project. On the other hand, 
we work very closely with your jurisdictions. So um, if there are other projects that are moving along um, that aren't, that somehow we've not got on this list, that they might be expecting state or federal funding, we'll work with you on those and with the state and uh, try to um, you know, get as much money for as projects within our region as we possibly can. And if I may ask, I knew and I forgot. I'm sorry. When is this actually due to be? So, so you know, we, we've re we've requested your jurisdictions to make sure you've all have already voted. But you know, everyone, <laughs> for you know, for them to be moved on to DOT, they have to be approved by each you know local body of elected officials. So we're ha hoping to have that by the fourth. Um, we there's some wiggle room because we have to submit to them by the the middle of March. So okay. March 15th. So we still have some time. Um, so we will bring this back to you in February to actually be approved. Um, and then, you know, we will submit soon after our, you know, we have a couple weeks following our February board meeting. Okay. And the reason I ask, I'm sure that the counties and, and cities, everyone's voted on it, but at the same time, if there are any yeah. changes, we need to look at it quickly. That's why I was asking. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, a month, <coughs> month and a half. Okay. That range. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Not seeing any. Thank you. Perfect. All right. 7B. Um, the draft 2022 project priorities list. Nope, that's wrong. Yes. Sorry. Federal certification findings. Jim Martin, Federal Highway Administration. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, board members, for having me. It is a joy to be back here in the Sarasota Manatee area. Uh, we, uh, we enjoyed coming over and talking to all the uh, staff members and the community after, uh, after the, the uh, formal meeting was held. I'm uh, sorry to see Alva Marie leaving the staff. She was with, with all the others. We showed such great professionalism and expertise in this area. It was amazing. So um, I don't think necessarily the MPO is losing somebody. They're just spreading their influence a little bit <laughs> wider into the community. Good way to look at it. Good way to look at it. That's the way I'm going. So as you mentioned, the reason I'm here today is to, to discuss the 2021 Federal Certification Review. Um, and we do have a PowerPoint presentation, uh, but uh, just to go over a little bit of that, I'm on slide two if you want to catch up. Uh, part of the review committee included myself, Teresa Parker, one of our senior planners, uh, Carlos Gonzalez, who has uh, recently joined FHWA here in the Florida division. Uh, Carlos will be your regular uh, planner that you'll see on a, a regular basis rather than myself. Uh, but uh, him being in Tallahassee and me being in Orlando, we just thought it was easier for me to scoot on over here and, and make the visit. And also John Crocker from the uh, Federal <coughs> Transit Administration, because this encompassed everything that the MPO does, does including uh, transit planning. Uh, so is this set up? I don't, that's okay. So the uh, certification itself actually fulfills uh, two needs, two purposes altogether. One, there is a federal requirement that on a regular basis that FHWA and F FTA get together and, and come out and see how the uh, uh, transportation management areas are doing at least every four years. Uh, so you are not gonna see uh, this kind of report come out for, for a, a few more years. Second of all, it's our way of just making sure the MPO and the TMA areas are uh, managing uh, the, the federal funds uh, as they should be and not buying Rolex uh, <laughs> watches for <laughs> retirees. So it's, it's, a great, it's a great opportunity. But at the same time, we're looking for uh, ways to make improvements. We also love to acknowledge some of the great things that the MPO is doing. And uh, we, we do this through a, a multi-step process. First, we do a, a risk assessment. Uh, up till about four years ago, five years ago, the Federal Highway Administration, FDA, did these certifications by coming in and spending two to three days and going over everything with the MPOs. It was a very long, drawn out, yeah. arduous, uh, it, it was a difficult process. I remember. Nowadays, we do a risk assessment. We look at things like, you know, has there been any new policies come out? Has staffing changed? You know, uh, during our last review, were there big issues? It's a, it's a complete risk it's assessment. And we look at those things that seem to have a potentially high risk uh, come about. 
And once we've identified those items as, as risk potentials, or at least scored higher than the others, we perform a, a desk review. And this is just uh, myself and the other staff members going over the documents that the MPO has provided us, uh, such as the, the long range transportation plan, the TIP and UPWP and, and so forth. And we look at all those. Uh, following that, we come out and do a site visit. And that's when we were here last, uh, near the end of July. And uh, uh, just across the street, had a good time there. Uh, enjoyed some good food here too, at, uh, up, the, up the street, one bet. Uh, final review uh, report was finalized back in December. <coughs> and then a closeout presentation, and that, that's the final step that's needed, and that's why I'm here today. So like I said, we have a, a risk assessment, and we look at all these different variables along the way. We look at prior certifications and, and uh, some of the things that the state DOT has looked at because they do annual MPO certifications, and we take into consideration anything they've highlighted and uh, put that all together. And as a result of ours, we looked at uh, three main areas, uh, one being the uh, long-range plan, uh, specifically the fiscal plan and um, fiscal constraint part of that plan, and the, the TIP. Uh, the other part of that was looking at the transportation performance measures, which uh, Ryan and the other gentleman were talking about just a little while ago with safety as being one of those elements in, in those performance measures. And I, I'm sure this board has heard a lot of those performance measures and how they're moving forward on those. So the first thing we'd like to do is, is highlight all those wonderful things that we, we noted that we'll probably go back and share with some of the other MPOs. We got a lot of MPOs here in Florida, more I believe than any other state, 27 MPOs. Uh, so it gives us an opportunity to, I think, test the waters of when some of these smaller states don't have the same opportunity and share with them what we've learned here. Uh, and I, I have to say, uh, Ryan got that recent award through the Transportation Research Board but that was the first thing we, we highlighted was the participation plan on the uh, long-range participation, uh, long-range transportation plan. Uh, the outreach uh, that they did with the education and uh, gathering of people with surveys and everything else like that we thought was outstanding. It's now available. Yeah. So you have to advance. I have to advance it. Okay, would you set me up and I'll advance. All right. Hot diggity. Hot diggity. All right, there we go. <laughs> That's why you get the big bucks, man. Technology. Right. <laughs> so again, uh, the uh, public engagement was, was top notch. We, we thought uh, what the staff had done in, in getting out to the community for this uh, was uh, far and beyond what uh, you know is is you know needed. Uh, not needed, but. Uh, you can never get enough public engagement. And I think there's already been some talk about how involved the, the community is um, on these things. Uh, the transportation performance measures, uh, we wanted to talk about how the region's needs were prioritized. And uh, the, uh, in, in fact, the uh, executive director uh, did talk about that at a uh, uh, seminar that uh, we all participated in. So uh, this this area is leading the way on how uh, performance measures are incorporated into long range plans. And speaking of how it's incorporated, the dashboard that the uh, MPO uses uh, to measure and display and communicate those performance measures we thought also were, were quite n noteworthy. Uh, the, the last one, uh, actually, uh, up there, the Transportation Improvement Program uh, priority is web tool. I've been doing this for about 25 years. I've worked with a lot of MPOs all over Central and, and, and West Florida. Uh, but it, I think it's the first time I've seen the, the web tool used in this way or at, at all. And I think that works great in coordinating uh, with both the staff and the local communities, helping uh, expectations and helping uh, set priorities. I think uh, that was part of the discussion that, again, Ryan was just mentioning is going through that filter of, of looking at things that are in the long range plan, but are a priority to the uh, local jurisdictions. So again, thought those were, were wonderful tools and, and I wanted to uh, uh, applaud the staff on, on such a great job on that. Had a couple of recommendations uh, that we uh, wanted to uh, to put on there, and it's just a uh, 
to include some of the uh, definitions of funding terms and also uh, a little reference page on, on some of the uh, uh, items on the TIP. In other words, if you're looking at the TIP, uh, where would a, someone from the community be able to find that in your long range plan? It's just a recommendation. It wasn't anything earth shattering, but uh, maybe a tool that uh, the MPO can use uh, to, to make the uh, TIP a little bit more user friendly. It, it's a great, great uh, product that you have with your TIP. Uh, corrective actions is the, the final uh, things here. Uh, one of the ones that we noticed was that the first five years of the TIP, meaning your TIP, was not incorporated as expected in the long range plan. It was in there by reference and, and it was, there was some elements of it in there. But uh, you and your board action, I think number four, went ahead and adopted the changes that we needed and see, so this particular item is already taken care of. The staff jumped right on that, and uh, uh, they uh, they couldn't have been any more cooperative. And so, <laughs> yep, they, we get this under under control, and and uh, it looks great and meets all the federal expectations. So that's the last thing I want to talk about. Uh, just pleased to say that uh, overall, based on our finding, that uh, the Sarasota MPO substantially meets all of our recommendations in federal requirements. And uh, uh, the second bullet there, subject to resolving corrective actions, well, you've done that. So y'all are good to go all the way up through December of 2025. Couldn't have been happier to work with this staff and to come on over here today and tell you all about it. Well, there's only one problem on, from what I can tell, you need to come visit more often. All right. All right. Not to necessarily <laughs> you know, check out the reports, but just to be a part. Would happy be to great. do that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any comments? Commissioners, councilmen, mayors, vice mayors? No. Thank you, Jim. And You're we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for such a great report and staff. You guys rock. Thank I you. I told them that several times. You did? I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah. They do. It's, it's a team effort. And, um, you know, a lot of what we've done that we think is cutting edge or but not bleeding edge has been done um, with involvement of and support from the board. And uh, it's really, again, aimed at getting projects delivered within our region. And the, the, the coordination with FDOT, you know, I would say never ends and we really do work at it. Um, so thank you, Jim. All right, next uh, our member comments. Any comments from the board? Wow. Um, Commissioner Servia. Madam Chairman, I just want to say welcome to all of the new employees and to Tanya. And please don't leave without me exchanging a business card with you. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, go ahead. All right. So, you know, I'm, I'm completely in favor of um, project zero and I believe it should be one of our goals to, to reduce the number of fatalities but when we were adopting the plan um, you know I, I sort of I'm wondering and I'm new to this but I, I'm wondering what is the role of the experts in this in us crafting public policy here um, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm by no means an expert, and all of you probably know more about traffic than I do, but uh, upon reading articles over the weekend in anticipation of this meeting, I found that, um, you know, sometimes expanding lanes and, and building more roads actually does not help traffic. And, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, um, you know, there was a, a report done by the University of California and several other think tanks and found that uh, what you sh we should be doing is focusing on mass transit efficiency, such as increasing the bus-only lanes, uh, bus rapid transit, and, and, and routes that get people to jobs <coughs> and opportunity. I, I love what Sarasota County was doing with SCAT, which is incorporating a Uber-like system. Uh, you know, redirecting funding for new roads and, and uh, towards maintenance of, of new roads as opposed to just expanding more roads that are just going to get more costly. Uh, and assisting in increased walkability, um, focusing on congestion pricing, something that not, we don't like to hear, but actually works, and, and uh, as a solution to traffic to, to allow infill development in denser communities. Um, I think this will 
all tie into the bigger problem that we're all facing in this region, which is a lack of affordable housing. So um, just just my, my two cents, you know, I, I don't feel I don't feel like I'm the expert in the room, and I would like to hear from the experts when we adopt these these plans if they believe this is working and if uh, this is something we should continue doing. Thank you. I, I'd like to respond to that if you don't mind. Very good points. I, I can't argue any of them. The only thing I would say is that I know that this board, <clears throat> this organization for many years, have looked at multimodal as the way to go. And I think if you're in a city and a municipality, that's very, it's much easier to do than uh, when you're in, like in the unincorporated areas, uh, such as most of us here. So good points. <clears throat> I will tell you that Project Zero, I remember when it first came out, no offense, I, I really felt like that Project Zero was almost something that <clears throat> would be terrible, <clears throat> very hard to obtain. And we're still trying to get there. So uh, thank you for um, taking this weekend and, and reading up on this issue. It's an important issue. I think affordable housing does come into play. Um, and I think we need to look at our counties, at Sarasota County and Manatee County as a whole, to figure out how we can best move things forward with Project Zero. So, Dave, any comments? Well, I think those are, are good comments, and they are consistent with the role of the MPO in looking at these issues holistically. The new, um, you know, what was called the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill did <laughs> add an, an additional emphasis on affordable housing, and, um, you know, our MPO as a governing board and um, our district secretary have said for years we have to have coordination of land use with transportation and not just, you know, um, look at them in silos. So we have tried to take a multidisciplinary holistic approach to get where we are and certainly going forward, we'll, we'll need to do that even more. Transit won't solve all of our problems no. in an area where we are spread out like we are. And, uh, but we have seen in, in the growth that's occurring and is expected to continue to occur um, a lot more infill than had been anticipated in, in many parts of the region. And I think that we're going to see more transit-oriented development. And uh, we have the 41 transit improvements where we have now re obtained funding to increase frequency of service along the US 41, our busiest transit corridor. We're looking at future connections in several other key corridors where transit service could be improved. And that ties in with you know getting people to jobs from affordable housing. It also ties in with improving safety, reducing congestion, and maximizing the use of existing um, facilities. And I don't know if, if uh, Secretary Nandum has anything he'd like to say about this, because this is really what this regional body can address that um, it will probably be the only place where this type of conversation occurs. Absolutely, it is. M Madam Chair, um, if I may. So, so your long-range transportation plan, Mayor, um, is one of the best um, comprehensive plans that I've seen as it relates to bringing that multimodal aspect. Um, but going back to the fundamentals, right? Fundamentals is if you want the LRTP to be successful for what you're talking about, the lo local land use plans will have to match that, right? You know, so you got to kind of figure out where the infill is and how do we bring transit-oriented development, affordable housing and all that stuff so that, you know, multimodal transit-related improvements can actually be successful. On top of it, you know, you're talking about expanding to the east, particularly in Manatee and Sarasota, more self-sufficient communities, you know, is going to reduce the travel from the uh, expansion and the growth that's happening to the downtown areas. Instead of them driving, you know, they can actually spend the time where they need to and Lakewood Ranch is one of the good examples for that, right? You know, so so that's what is uh, key for success uh, to actually implementing what you're talking about. Thank you. And I think part of that is to get more commercial areas in areas such as Lakewood Ranch and, and other new communities. Commissioner Van Ostenbridge, you're next on the board, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would agree with some of what was said, uh, and I think that you know if you look at Lakewood Ranch, as was just brought up, it's a, a live here, work here. 
uh, master planned community. Uh, Mayor Brown and I have spoken at length about um, increasing density in downtown Bradenton. So, you, you know, again, you know, living where, near where you work. Uh, our county administrator, Dr. Hopes, and I have discussed uh, trying to maximize the number, uh, doing a study of some kind to maximize the number of employees that the county has who can work from home. Uh, and that, of course, eliminates commutes as well. Uh, so all of these are good ideas, and they're things that, you know, we should be, as an MPO, you know, advocating sort of other organizations to do. Um, but to be honest, as an MPO, I think building roads, for the most part, is where we need to focus the majority of our, our attention and our monies. Uh, because, you know, when it comes to urban sprawl, the horse is out of the barn in Manatee and Sarasota County. That's right. And there's no possible way that I could have driven here from Northwest Bradenton. Or sorry, I could have gotten here from Northwest Bradenton without driving. Um, so it's not really plausible. Um, and, you know, with all due respect, Mr. Mayor, your, your study coming from the University of California is a big red flag to me. There are 48 other states I would sooner model ourselves after oh. um, before California. Um, but at any rate, we, we went up to Tallahassee. Uh, the county commission did for Manatee County, and we had a really successful trip up there. We met with Courtney Drummond, who's the secre de deputy secretary of transportation. Um, he spoke very highly of this MPO. He spoke very highly uh, of our district, sec F. Dot district secretary as well. Um, so those are big compliments, I think, to, to you gentlemen and to your staff as well. Um, mm -hmm. So just a little something we brought back from, from Tallahassee. Thank you, Madam Chair. And one thing to add, uh, something that I've not heard is the word roundabout. You know, we know speeding is an issue. Roundabout slow, slows traffic down, but yet keeps it moving. Anyway, um, Ms. Vice Mayor and then uh, Commissioner Servia. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to pile on, my, my ears really perked up when I heard Chair mention that there are conversations about rail transportation. Uh, I'm, I mentioned earlier, we have 28,000 workers in Northport. And as we continue to grow, I suspect our demographics will hold true. We're the youngest community in the dual county area, and that will continue. While we're doing a lot to keep our workers in Northport, I suspect we'll continue to supply workers throughout Sarasota County, which is the reality today. If 75 and 41 are the only way that those workers are going to move about the county, we're gonna be in serious trouble. So um, I really encourage this group to get aggressive and creative as we think about how we move people throughout our two counties. And um, for me, I think as the years go on, we need to become less dependent on our roads and highways and seek alternative ways to move people about. Thank you. Commissioner Servia. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And one of my favorite topics, so thank you all. Very good comments. Thank you for bringing it up, Mayor, um, and your comments were very good. And so I will say that there's an opportunity for those of us who represent unincorporated areas to look at where we can increase densities along our major corridors. When we get enough people in a certain location, that's when transit works. And, and as Commissioner Van Ostenbridge said, we're, we live in a sprawling community. But there are areas where uh, we have the opportunity to increase density and make uh, mass transit work. Manatee County is looking at a water taxi right now uh, to help our island community and all of the congestion that we everyone faces every weekend on our two major roadways. Um, and I, I just look to the future for ways to, for us to partner to get us out of our cars. And I, I saw a, um, an article that Strong Towns recently wrote, I don't know if anyone else saw that, that if you're trying to solve uh, traffic congestion by building more roads, it's like trying to solve obesity by loosening your belt. It just is a never ending, um, a never ending process. So thank you very much for everyone and all that you're doing. Um, Commissioner Ziegler. Yeah, uh, good comments. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think Kevin kind of mentioned it and hit it as well. I mean, our job with this organization is to look at, you know, transportation roads and the build out there. Um, we also have, obviously, our roles and responsibilities in our individual counties and municipalities. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we've talked about here that 
for example, the 681 interchange there at 75. And, um, you know, I know we're pushing forward with that. Um, and the reason why that's so big for Sarasota County is because we have a massive landowner there, uh, Hugh Culverhouse, and you have a couple other ones that are there that'll give us access to areas where we can build not just homes, but potentially commercial, industrial, manufacturing, all right there along 75. And it also gives us access to continue to build the grid out east, which is something that we're, our commission's prioritizing and we're obviously working with you guys on, um, is getting Lorraine Road. You know, that was great. That came down from Manatee County. The problem is it stops at Fruitville <clears throat> Road. And right now, all that traffic, we're seeing it bottle up on Fruitville Road because they can't just continue to go down south. And the goal, and, and we're obviously seeing that there's a demand to drive in that direction because we're seeing the traffic right now, but until we continue to go down south, we're not gonna alleviate the traffic problem there. And that's why we need to continue to build that grid out east and keep going south with Lorraine Road, for example, going all the way down to Knight's Trail. Um, you know, 681, I'm having some meetings here in the next couple of weeks. I mean, I just think that, you know, the, the reality is people want to move as close as they can to downtown Sarasota. That's just the reality. They can't afford it. There's not property there. So then they start going further and further away. But all the amenities are basically in downtown Sarasota, even Northport. I had a lot of employees that live down in Northport. And frankly, they wanted to live as close to downtown as Sarasota as possible because you have bars, you have restaurants, you know, younger people in their 20s, 30s want to be close to that. So the question is, what can we do? Well, we're kind of maxed out on growth or growth potential by the city of Sarasota. But if we look at that 681 interchange, we could bring commercial, we could bring bars, restaurants, we could bring jobs, you know, I don't care if it's call centers or office shops or whatever else right there. And now the people from Northport don't need to go downtown. They don't need to go up to UTC. That could become their hub for commercial activity because frankly, Northport's lacking it because of just how the city's been laid out. Um, so that's why like what we talk about here when we're so focused on the roads and the build out are, is so key because it supplements a lot of the priorities that we have as local communities. So, um, you know, and, and not being dependent on cars, I think that's kind of wishful thinking. We're gonna be dependent on cars for a while. Now the question is when we got autonomous vehicles, how does that change? Still dependent on cars, but how do they run? And do you need less road space? Do you need more? Do you need more parking spots or do you need less parking spots? but more maybe drop off areas. I mean, those are all the real discussions that I wanna see with this MPO really lead on because I think that there is, um, at the county level, we just don't know. I mean, you know, we're forcing parking spots on various developments, but do we need those parking spots in 10 years? Or is it maybe just a lane or an Uber pickup and drop off? I don't know. So, uh, you know, good comments. But, um, you know, hopefully that interchange in that area can be a priority because I think it'll alleviate a lot of issues for all the surrounding counties. Any other comments on this issue? Yes, Mayor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just listening and, and, you know, a lot of great comments today. And I think it shows that uh, as we work through the density of things and, and, and the city of Bradenton probably has the, in this region, one of the best opportunities right now, even though we are very small and space-wise, 14.4 miles in our city. But when you look at our downtown, there's a huge opportunity to build some density in that to, to bring those services that will then keep the people in a place where they won't have to get in their car. And I think that's something that, that we're looking at, and actually we have a plan coming out at our next council meeting that, that starts that. And so we're looking forward to kind of starting that first step in our city and uh, you know you'd mentioned about Sarasota downtown kind of being built out well you know the city of Bradenton is ready to to start that and I think we're going to need the MPO and the, the people here obviously to work together and that's the biggest thing you know we're all individuals when we're talking about that but we also it's going to be important to work together to figure out how we get those cars off the road whether it's the water taxi whether it's the other ways whether it's bringing the density downtown and that's going to be important to continue to grow that Thank you. All right, I, I, I've, I've got to respond to a few of these comments. They're really, I've heard some great comments from this board. Um, I'm sure that you can tell just with what Mayor Brown just said that Manatee County, um, you know, we are really looking at things differently um, 
you know, in, in Manatea, we're looking at how can we better serve the community? How can we, and what we look at is how can we improve the quality of life of our citizens? And that's really what it's all about. Um, you know, joint partnerships between Manatee and Sarasota. I will tell you, everybody has looked at me over the years and said, wow, I know Secretary Nandum's probably going to choke right now when I say this, but, um, you know, the diverging diamond. Uh, that was truly where I started contacting. I wasn't on the MPO at the time, and I started contacting the commissioners in Sarasota, and we all started working together. And within six months, we had things moving forward. My point is, uh, you know, we certainly need to be working together as a region uh, when it comes to transportation. And, and Vice Mayor, your comments about rail, I, I do agree with you. But I will tell you from the workshop that I was in with DOT, you know, we're probably looking at years down the road here locally before rail really gets here. So do you have park and rides in Northport? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know. Uh, no, we do not have park and rides. Okay. You might want to look into something like that. It might be helpful because I know you do have a lot of uh, people in Northport that do come up to Sarasota and Manatee every day to and from work. So, you know, maybe we can talk more about something along that line. The challenge is we can park them. We can <laughs> ride them. Well, we can, maybe we can, again, a partnership. Heads yeah. Yes. So good, good responses. And Commissioner Van Ostenbridge, did you have something to add, sir? I would just say this has been a great discussion. And I've been on the MPO now for exactly a year. <laughs> uh, and in the past year, the, the last 15 think. minutes is, is by far, the, I think, the best discussion we've had. And so I would just add that our agendas are, I was highly, I think, possibly entirely staff driven. And so perhaps, you know, we as the elected officials should have, uh, should set an agenda item as sort of open dialogue and an opportunity for us to sort of freely just discuss these kinds of issues um, with a little less structure to the, to the meeting. Yeah, so, Nanette, you got that right. I think that's a great idea too. Any other comments? Yes, ma'am. I'll make one final comment. Uh, years ago, I had a vice president who said to me, Barbara, if you're going to be successful, you need to skate to where the puck is going, not where it is. That's right. <laughs> so Very good. When it comes to transportation, I would like this board to really innovate. Let's get ahead of it. Let's start skating to where the puck is going and not to where it is today. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Mayor, I, I, I want you to know that <clears throat> I really do appreciate your comments. Uh, about transportation, and I think it shows how this board, all the members of this board, really do want to move forward to improve uh, quality of life, because that's what it boils down to. Any other comments before we adjourn? All right. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back. We are in session. It is 1.30, and we have one last agenda item left, after which we will proceed through commissioner comments, and I believe today we start with District 5 when we get to those. Uh, so it's item number 38. Uh, Dr. Hopes, would you like to start us off? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there was, I think, a little over a week ago, an article in an online... Um, yeah, the whatever, uh, by, by a writer that brought into question the 3.9% pay increase that we gave employees, uh, let's see, over four months ago. And there were some interesting questions, concerns, allegations, uh, political attacks, or whatever you want to call it, and 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 there were requests for information, and uh, it it caught my attention and others, and apparently some of you as well. And from the best of our understanding, and trying to figure out where this was coming from, uh, the the writer of the articles at at issue appears to be referencing the July 9th, 2021, initial recommended budget message that was in my first proposed budget uh, to this body. Uh, subsequently, as you are aware, the process of establishing the final budget approval uh, included work sessions, uh, a, a late property tax cut with uh, the final two hearings in September, and you approved a final budget. Uh, this budget included authority for a 3.9% pay increase for Board of County Commission uh, employees and constitutional offices. Uh, at the time, in consultation with the new Acting Human Resources Director, and she was also the former Compensation Manager, and given the COVID pandemic response and disruption in, in our employees' lives, all the dollars were used for paying an across-the-board increase of 3.9%. As always, we gave the constitutionals the same 3.9% increase in their, their budget for employees. Uh, there was talk early on about minimum wage, and I can go into that if you, if, if, if you want to get into it. But, you know, if, if the concern is that this was not the directive of the board, uh, then I take responsibility and accountability for that decision. Uh, as county administrator, I bear the total responsibility and accountability that the board's directives are implemented. In consultation with the CFO, who knew my intent to not get into pay for performance uh, because of the aforementioned situation with COVID and everything else. In fact, I even delayed performance evaluations because it wasn't going to be tied to compensation. Uh, if this is about my compensation related to the terms and conditions in my employment agreement, which is in the board's language, or the HR department's implementation of my employment contract, which, by the way, happens without any involvement on my part. When that agreement was, was approved, a signed copy was given to HR, and that's how they structured my, my payroll. I have no role in my payroll except saying, yes, I work this many days during the pay cycle. But if this is about my compensation, uh, then this is an issue for the board to address. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hopes, uh, for that brief analysis and explanation. Um, Commissioners, no action is needed on this item. Um, I have Commissioners Whitmore and Servia on the board, and Commissioner Baugh. That is the order of the board, so we will begin, and Commissioner Cruz. So we will begin debate now. Commissioner Whitmore. Okay. I, I have no... Um, after it was explained to us uh, in a roundabout way a couple times, again, I... I have no issue with how um, of receiving this because I think even Carlos took the same increase because he always follows the administrator. And I think we confirmed that since we've been up here. So I, I, I think um, with you being new and everything and um, 
getting the increase, and I don't even know if it's more or less than the previous administrators. Maybe that's it. Again, I, I told you, I'm, I, this is, I don't even want to be talking about this. I'd rather talk to you alone on this. About, I don't think this is appropriate up here. But I wasn't shocked because of how it was explained to me. And so the only thing that I wanted explanation, it was with you in cons uh, consultation with the um, human resource director, correct? Okay. Truthfully, I want to... I want to stop all the drama that we had last year and try to run these meetings professionally and not be the laughing joke of Manatee County because we do this. I planned on meeting with him after and, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, I have possibly may have concerns about this, but I'm going to talk with him and only he's the one that can do what I'm thinking. So I'm not going to bring it up here. I think I don't want to go into this drama that we did in 2021. It was a joke. Let's just move forward. Thank you. I don't think it's appropriate. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. Very well said. Commissioner Servia. Yes, yes, thank you. And I also was not going to discuss this up here. Um, I have a meeting with Dr. Hopes and I think Jan tomorrow. Um, and, and But I thank Dr. Hopes for mm -hmm. clarifying it because I think whenever there's a question by anyone in the public or the press, and it's raised in that way that we should answer it. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and so I ask, what have we learned from this? Because we always learn from these challenging situations. And what I've learned is the faster that we can respond to questions when, it, when we know what we're going to say, the better. Now, I understand wanting to get it right because I think it should always be right. But I think that the delay in responding may have caused some of this unnecessary drama, as Commissioner Whitmore put it. Um, Look, we, as commissioners, I think we have three jobs by statute. <laughs> it's to adopt a budget, to hire and fire the county administrator, and the same with the county attorney. I, I think that's all the statutes require us to do. So when those issues are raised by someone in the public, it's going to catch my attention. And it's never, it's never personal with me, and it wasn't in this case either. This is business, you know. I want to make sure that I'm doing my job as I've been hired to do. Um, so I don't think there's anything nefarious that happened. I do think there's been a little bit of a communication breakdown, and that's okay. No one up here is perfect. No one's expected to be. But when we make a mistake, I think that we should move quickly to correct it. That, that's who I am. Um, you know, I, I just came from Kiwanis, and I'll share a story with you, because I, I thought it was so appropriate. Uh, Cliff Walters was telling me this story. And it, and it kind of reminds me of this situation with Dr. Hopes, because the, the story with, uh, that Cliff told me was this, you know, a picture Einstein up at the chalkboard and uh, teaching a class, and he says, eight times one is eight. Eight times two is 16. Eight times three is 24. Eight times four is 36. Eight times five is 40. Eight times eight is 81. And eight times nine is 91. And the class bursts out in laughter and says, 91, it's not 91, you know? So, yeah. Um, and so, and what Cliff was saying was, um, the story that he read was, when people get 90% of the things correct, and nobody says anything, and then there's a couple little snafus People jump on it and they say, you did this, you did that, you did this. Let's, let's try as humans not to be that way and be the opposite, you know, and recognize the good jobs that are done day in and day out. And, and that's the person that I am. Um, I think Dr. Hopes has done an excellent job, as I showed you in my performance review of him. I don't think there's anything nefarious here. But I do think that the public deserves to know the truth in clear language. And if there's ever a question then please, let's just get it answered. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Servia. Commissioner Baugh. Yeah. Uh, I'm really glad to hear uh, the comments that I'm hearing, and, and I'll just go back to what I've brought up a few times under Commissioner comments, and it's ethics and transparency. And I think that this board, we need to work on those, and I know that I've talked to the county administrator, and he's going to be bringing some things forward uh, to help with that. I, I, I think this whole thing has been blown way out of proportion. Um, you know, we all uh, uh, voted for the administrator's contract. Um, if you looked at, <coughs> excuse me, there might have been two, I think, that yeah. didn't. 
actually. Um, at any rate, if you read the contract uh, <laughs> it, before you voted, then you would have probably realized that as a staff member he was entitled to the raise. But, le but let's talk about that for just a second. Um, you know, no one is perfect. Uh, none of the commissioners up on this board, uh, no county administrator, no deputy county administrator. The only perfect person uh, died on the cross and he's not with us anymore. So uh, not on this earth um, in human form. So the bottom line is everybody makes mistakes and we need to learn um, to, to get past them uh, without upsetting staff and, and getting staff members almost in tears and, and uh, you know, pounding on our county administrator. I mean, we, the ones of us that voted for that contract uh, should have probably realized that it was there and he would probably be getting the increase. Um, I mean, I didn't specifically go, oh, he's going to get a cost of living increase or not cost of living, but a, a raise because, you know, the others are. It never even occurred to me. But, you know, the bottom line is he certainly has worked very hard and has certainly proven that he deserved the increase in pay, in my opinion. Um, he's handling a, a lot of uh, fires, going through a lot of changes in this county that certainly need to be made and I applaud him for the job that he's doing. Um, so I, for one, I think that it's as usual, it's just, you know, some people trying to make a big to-do about nothing, uh, really, um, and it's been blown way out of proportion. I think he deserved the raise, I'm glad he got it, and I, for one, would not want to see him return it. So that's just how I look at it. Thank you, Commissioner Baugh. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, because, uh, you know, all this meeting independently isn't doing anything. It just we, we just need to, to put this to bed. And we, we tried bad. last week when it was brought up by a commissioner during commissioner comments and, and instead of talking about it. But the, these articles, you know, let, let's realize what they're referring to. First off, they're referring to the fact that because Dr. Robes makes a certain level of money, he shouldn't get any more money, which is kind of how Karl Marx interpreted the Communist Manifesto, for, for, from each according to his ability and, and to each according to his need. You know, we, we don't determine whether or not people get raises based on whether they have money because I looked into the other salaries and our director of parks who makes a very nice salary got a 3.9 percent increase this year our director of utilities got a 3.9 percent increase this year our director of public works 3.9 all of them make over hundred fifty thousand dollars a year that's public record so if you're going to argue that Dr. Hopes doesn't deserve it because of his salary where's the line we're willing to draw where we say okay you have enough money you no longer get a raise because we sat up here talking about how Jerry Lopez left and how some of our other directors left and now we have to take care of them and keep them here and institutional knowledge. Where's your line before we stop giving raises to people? That's a ridiculous argument. And the real argument they were making was basically on 1% because the 2.9, even in the original version of the, the messaging about the budget, was going to be that cost of living. It was the 1% performance pay, the question of whether or not he gets that or not. And the argument on one side is we lumped it in, it's 3.9 now, but really that's what it is. 1% was $1,990. That's, that's what all of this discussion's about and whether or not he deserves that. But, but, but let's remember here, for everyone who wants to bring this up on this dais, and say that this was kind of snuck in behind the scenes and we're not comfortable giving him 1% because you know, he he's makes so much money. Five weeks into his time here, he was an interim administrator making $187,000. Two of us said, hey, we have him for a year at 187000 as fiscal conservatives. Let's keep him there. He agreed to that contract. Five people on this board said, no, let's give him $12,000 more, which is a 6.4% increase five weeks into it. So <laughs> nobody up here who voted for that can complain about 1%. No. You gave him 12 grand after five weeks, but now $1,900 is just a bridge too far in terms of his money. <laughs> like, is that going to be gas for his Lamborghini? Is that where we're going with this? <laughs> so, I mean, at, at the end of the day, really very petty. At, at the end of the day, everyone got 3.9%. The conference board, which is an organization that keeps track of all wage increases, which is inclusive of, of executives and so forth, last year said the average wage increase was 
They anticipate wage increase this year of 3.4%. These numbers are in line with what everyone else in the United States is getting. We have 7% inflation. We're all basically only picking up half of it right now. And whether or not you make 200000 or 100000 or $40,000, everyone's dealing with the same thing. His contract that we've all agreed to tied him to employee salaries. He gets a 3.9%. I'm sick and tired of dealing with this. That's his money. He deserves it. It's a contract we agreed to. If you no longer agree to it, renegotiate his contract. But I promise you, if this year we agree to give everyone else here a 3.9%, he's getting it too. Because that's how his contract's written. So I, I, I just think we need to put this aside. Because unless you want to wipe out all these director salaries and come up with a flat number where everyone just stays straight and nobody gets a raise anymore, then how much he makes doesn't matter. The 1% doesn't matter. And whether you're fiscally conservative or not, doesn't matter if you voted on that contract in the first place. Thank you, Commissioner Cruz. Commissioner Bellamy, you've not spoken. I'm going to go to you. <laughs> what number was that? Four. I was four and then he called me. That guy always does me like that. Um, the, 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 I've heard all of it. I've, I've heard all of it. And I'm obviously um, one of the ones um, at that time did not um, support the contract. Not that I don't. You know, think he's doing a great job. I actually do. The, the reality of, of this, when when you have those type of concerns out there, my biggest concern was the protocol. Was it something that was done that we were not aware of? Dr. Hopes has 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 a statement here. He's brought out as far as taking full or uh, you know responsibility, and he identified the A, which is when I, which is accountability and things of that nature. Right there, I did feel to a certain extent that a public explanation. Was cleared up. What was needed after after the um, article? Um, we we have that. Will that answer everybody's questions? Probably not. Do we all have the answers? Everything like that. Everybody's going to have an individual meeting with him about this. Um, not that I'm trying to rush away from the public concerns about this, but very rarely do I I I, I, I comment like this. But as far as the the, the, the putting it to bed, I mean, if there's other public comments and things like that. Hey, we get your emails. Dr. Hopes gets your emails, all right? So e email him and, and copy his seven bosses, and we'll make sure that he responds and the, and the, and, and the communication is consistent. And there, there's other major things that we have to discuss and, thing, and things of that nature right there. That's, that's just me, and I'm thinking, thankful that he took um, – I'm thankful that he took responsibility if there was a concern. Um, I do hear things, and, and I joke with him, like, and, and I would ask him to caution himself sometime because sometimes we all put our foot in our mouth. Initially, when it came down, it went from free. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll do it for free, and, and now and now we're here. And and you know how the reality of it is. You know, I mean, nothing's for free. Nothing is for free. And, and, and when, when individuals out there hear statements, you know, that's their opportunity to, to, to regurgitate that in, in a moment like this, okay? But the, real, the reality of it is I, thought, I don't think no one out there that goes to work works for free. I don't think no one out there, and, I, and I'm pointing, and Kevin's making fun of me, but we know that people are listening. And, 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 <laughs> but, but, that's, but that's the reality of it. So I'm not necessarily sure what the next comments are, but, again, Mr. Chair, I have a meeting at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thanks. Commissioner Bellamy. Commissioner Satcher, did you want to? You're the only one that has not spoken on this. Well, I haven't spoken. So. Well, Commissioner Satcher, I'll just quickly say that um, point out for the future, and to ev everyone, you know, whether it's two people or or more uh, watching, it's it's election season, and people try to get clicks and sell papers. And generally, the way that that has happened in Manatee exactly. County is to present one side of the story, not even sometimes not even go after the other side. I have plenty of stories, attack pieces that are written um, against either me or people that I know um, where they never even called uh, to get a very simple explanation on the other side. And so I just want to point out that um, if you're at home, take all this stuff with a grain of salt. There's probably a lot more to the story. And is it worth our time and your time um, to always be going after every little, oh, this little concern and that little concern to take our time from here for the next however many months? And then, of course, you know, a new two-year election cycle will start. 
um, I'd say that it's arguable that it's it's not worth our time to continually do that. So for the future is the only reason I say this. Um, let's try to take those things with a with a grain of salt. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Satcher. Um, and I would just sort of want to make the statement that um, you know I sort of, I agree with what Commissioner Whitmore said and and uh, part of what Commissioner Serbia said that um, this is something that. Uh, people raise concerns in the public. Of course, we look into it. That's what we do. I get emails all the time, and I check with department heads and Dr. Hopes or whomever to find out um, is there any legitimacy to this. I forward emails on to folks. Um, but I, I don't think it's, it's something we need to necessarily discuss uh, in a public meeting. Um, it could have easily been handled behind closed doors. And, and I would encourage uh, my fellow board members to, you know, don't lend too much credibility to, you know, what is like an alt-left tabloid. Um, they're going to send us on, like they have today, I think they've sent us on a fool's errand. Um, exactly. And so I think we should be, be careful to avoid allowing them to do that. Uh, and let me, I kind of forgot they existed for six months until this happened. Um, at any rate, um, if the board wants to override this decision, they can, but I am going to close debate on this issue and move us into Commissioner no, Collins. No, we're on the board. If please, you want to make a motion to override me, you can. Otherwise, I'm closing debate. Mr. Chairman, please. I'm on the board. I'd like to I speak. I'm going to close debate to save us from ourselves. If you would no. like to make a motion, go ahead. No. <coughs> okay, with no one making a motion, then I'm going to close debate on this, and we're going to move into Commissioner Comments. We start today with District 5. Uh, no, no. Commissioner Boss. We have a, we, we're still on the board from the previous issue. What I are guess, doing? I'm, I guess closing, we have to, I'm closing debate. I, let's take and, a vote on well, if, if you want to make a motion, speak. I gave you three opportunities. If okay. you'd like to make a motion to override my decision, you can. Okay, Otherwise, I'd like I'm to make a motion debate. that I I have some comments we continue to debate? finish up. It's not debate. I have some comments I'd like to make, and I, I ask that I be able to make them. They'll take less than 30 seconds. And I second it. So we have a motion and a second to continue discussion. I'll open this to public comments. No one coming forward. Is there anyone on the phone? No one on the phone. So this will go to a vote. This is a motion to continue discussion on this item. All in favor? Well, actually, we'll do a roll call because it'll probably be a split decision. We start with four. Do I start with four this time? I vote aye. So five. Aye. Five. Nay. Nay. Six. Aye. Aye. Seven. No. Nay, one. No. No. Two. Yes, I think we said yes. out of the Four is a no. It fails four to three. We will move into commissioner comments. No. Commissioner Baugh. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple of things. I, I, I'm glad that we're going to have, I think, uh, Dr. Hopes, correct me if I'm wrong, but we are going to have a workshop on um, uh, veterans and uh, homelessness and so forth. So I'm, I'm glad I'll hold off on those comments that I spoke with you about at lunch until we have that. Um, again, I'm, I'm just going to bring this up again until it's done. I think it's very important, especially with what we've just been through. Uh, I've brought it up several times over the past few months. Uh, we need to get the lobbyist registration done, please. I know that you're working on that. But we also need to work on ethics and transparency for this board. I think that we need to try, as Commissioner Servia said, uh, you know, she mentioned the word, uh, you know, the citizens when they bring up something. And uh, we do need to be transparent as long as it's truthful. So um, I think we need to look into uh, coming up with a plan. And I'll try, uh, Dr. Hopes, if you want me to, I'll try and put something together to, to bring back to start that. Uh, process with you, if, if it's okay with you. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Baugh. District 6, Commissioner Whitmore. So we're asked, uh, Commissioner's bringing up on something on pot whatever and ethics, and she's going to write it for us to look at. What do we, we have, we all have, we're set by state statute. I, we're I'm protected sure. by the state for our ethics, so I don't, I think that's I think you misunderstood um, oh, my Commissioner statement. Whitmore has the floor. Okay, so uh, that is totally ridiculous unless Dr. Hopes can explain to me what it's about. So first of all, I'd like to know the status on looking for future lands on the landfill. Uh, if you could, uh, I could forward this to you if you want me to, Scott, but it, it, we need to know if where, I mean, are you researching properties? I know at one point you were, but all hex broken loose, so I don't know if you have. Um, I'll be attending the Brainton City Council meeting tomorrow morning. I, as I've told you a few times, have met with every city commissioner, and I've spoken to one. So I've met one-on-one -on -one with city commissioners and the mayor about uh, possibly looking at some property over by turning points. 
just to see and get feedback from them. You know, they're the ones that voted for turning points. Some of the commissioners have issues with turning points, but that's city of Bradenton is the one that approved it. I'm just trying to come up with a solution to help. I heard there is somebody in the county that's also investing millions personally on some kind of transitional housing, and I don't know when that's coming up, but when it all comes, it all has to be worked together, and we all have to be in conjunction. So anyway, I was just gonna, um, and I spoke to Councilwoman Pam Coachman over on Saturday regarding this, this is her district, and she's very positive about this, and just so you know, I'm meeting, I think, with Mayor Brown tomorrow with um, turning points, because he has issues with <coughs> turning points, and he asked me to be at a meeting with him, so I am going, it's either tomorrow or Thursday. Um, issues with the seawall on trailer estates that I had seen an email going around, uh, the wanting us to look at the seawall about repairing it. If I if my memory serves me right, that's a special taxing district. I think my son-in-law is the attorney for that. And um, I think that may be their responsibility, unless there's outfall issues that we look at as a county. But I just wanted whoever's looking into it, I think it was yours, Commissioner Servia. So you may want to um, just recall that and make sure that doesn't fall under there. I think I was copied because I'm on the WCIND. We don't do seawall. We do channel dredging and stuff like that. So I just wanted you all to know about that. I met with three members of the Parish Civic Association. I think um, Commissioner Cruz has. I know Commissioner Satcher has. He's try they're trying to meet with everybody regarding the park, as you know. They wanted to meet with the engineer of record so that they could look at the plans because they heard that they're 30% complete. And they just wanted to, since, you know, they are a uh, parish, I mean, they are the the structured organization, they wanted to see what was going on and then they wanted to give input to come back to before the board. I called Charlie kind of in frustration because never got a response on what, were, if I was, you know, if they were gonna let them meet with them or not. And so that's why you heard me earlier say, Charlie and I are gonna meet with them, Charlie Bishop. Um, I'm happy to see that our COVID rates dropped down. At one point recently it was 29% and the last time I looked it was 20%. And um, that's very happy for the health care, as you know. We still have a high positivity rate, but with I think with the Omicron being a diluted form of the original, the patients are doing much better, and you don't hear about all the mortality that we did before. Yesterday, um, Debbie Wing and I, I asked her to come along to take notes. We met with the Lakewood Ranch Business Alliance Director, um, Brittany Lamont, and we are look, She, they just want to discuss some what's going on. They have 600 businesses that are signed up with their organization and all of them are always talking about affordable housing and then I hear this on the news this morning about us being the second highest in the United States of increasing rents. So this is a good issue that we all need and everybody agrees that we all need to talk about. Um, and then I already mentioned about the um, rental and that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. District 7, Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, I have not, uh, I'm not dialogue, I'm just continuing what you said. Um, I've also been working on a few things with the parish. I have not met with PCA specific to the park because Norma and I had to reschedule. So, uh, okay. uh, yeah. but I've talked to them a number of times because Norma and I used to just hang out and watch the, the mm -hmm. parish football games all this year. Mm -hmm. um, but I am working on a few other things uh, for parish. I just had a, a meeting with, with Jan and Ruth yesterday and I'm meeting with Dr. Hopes tomorrow or the next day, um, Thursday, about a few things trying to figure out how to really get that downtown core village of parish uh, kind of moving forward. So hopefully we'll have some information on that coming up soon. Uh, the only other thing I'll mention because we just kind of finalized the panel and announced it, everyone keeps talking about growth in Manatee County. We're talking about affordable housing and issues and how do we get affordable housing here. Uh, February 24th, I think there's a link available, but we're having a panel on um, how are we managing our growth here in Manatee County for Tiger Bay. And uh, so the panel's set, so it should be pretty interesting if people wanna kinda hear both sides of things. I'm on it. Uh, Carol Clark from Medallion Homes is on it. Meredith Barkham, who uh, heads up the power uh, movement out in Mayaka and Glenn Gibellina to talk about affordable housing. So it should be a, a good panel to kick off Tiger Bay this year. Um, and it's obviously a hot topic, whether it be the FDAB or affordable housing that we've been discussing here today. So just uh, saying that because the panel just got finalized about 24 hours ago. That's all. Hey, may I ask Mr. Cruz about uh, Parrish? 
Sure. Uh, okay. You mentioned you were talking to the Parish Village about, is, is that about the infrastructure or is that about the four million we approved for the sewer? Because a citizen asked me and I don't didn't not, know. Not really. It, the original conversation I had with some of the people in Parish stemmed from that, but it kind of went off on tangents to where I had the conversation with Jan relative to the finance side and Ruth relative to the economic development side. And now we're following up with uh, with Dr. Hopes okay. regarding it. So that, that was the, the precursor to it, and that is a portion of it, but is not related to that per se. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Ball, did you have a brief? I did, question? yes, thank you. I, I just wanted to comment about something Commissioner Whitmore said. I, I don't know, um, when you were talking about the Business Alliance, um, are you aware that they're building some of uh, workforce housing over at Waterside? I just yeah, wanted to make sure I didn't know if you knew thank that. Thank you. Okay, that's it. Right. Thank you, Commissioner Ball, Commissioner Cruz, Commissioner Satcher, District 1. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, yesterday we got to uh, go to the port, and uh, there's a, an expansion of Berth 8 there and a uh, company uh, Ash Grove, I believe it is, um, that actually they paid to do the expansion and fix it up, if I understand correctly, uh, and brought in uh, what has to be a multi-million dollar machine. Yeah. Um, it's just this huge vacuum cleaner to uh, <laughs> unload their product. And uh, so it was really interesting and exciting. And I was glad my wife wasn't there. I know she would want that vacuum cleaner and just wipe my lot clean it'd be so nice but anyway um and so anyway it, it was a great time and uh so just kudos to the port and uh to carlos Piqueros doing a great job in the company there um ash grove uh this past uh i believe it was saturday um got to go to the conley invitational uh rodeo at the uh at the fairgrounds here in manatee county and uh and there were a couple awesome. of other commissioners that were there as well. And it was just really neat to see how the Conleys doing that because it, it benefits 4-H. And um, so, and plus it was a really good time. Uh, my my family, which you know constitutes, I, I, it's tough to count how many people that is. Half yeah. a parish. Right, <laughs> we, get, we get our own section <laughs> and uh, uh, bring a bus. No, it's not that bad. But anyway, my family had a wonderful time. And um, so that was great. And um, as far as the park, I, I kind of, maybe I need to start a poll on uh, the Facebook page or something. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that, uh, that in my meetings have come up. First of all, you know, we, we can't promise everything on every park, no matter what. There's always, you know, uh, considerations, limited uh, space, limited time, uh, limited money. So you have to pick and choose your battles. Um, but that being said, I think from what I've seen and the conversations that I've had um, that Manatee County has gone above and beyond so far. Now, I understand we haven't, you know, broken ground yet, um, but to get this done and a lot of what I do, I do offline. I don't do out in front of everyone because I'm hoping for yeses. And so I don't want to, um, you know, put it out in front of everyone, every, each thing that I'm doing. I let the, uh, the people sometimes that are in charge of other organizations uh, make those decisions and then get back to me. Uh, so I, I'm looking forward to March, that presentation. But the couple of uh, big questions that I said maybe we should put do a poll was uh, one was on whether or not to eventually, which I think this would be phase two, not to get into the weeds, but is there eventually a desire to have a pool there um, so, you know, students could uh, – uh, you know, swim as far as uh, laps and that type of thing. So, um, you know, so the parish uh, high students could have a swim team. Um, is that something that, you know, the area would be excited about um, and the parents would get behind and students would get behind? Um, not promising that we can find that in the budget, but if we could, is that something they'd be excited about or is that something that, uh, you know, we could uh, forego? Um, so that was one question, and the other uh, one that came up is uh, about a dog park. You know, it's a part of it uh, setting aside as a, as a place for a dog park. Is that something that is important to the area um, of Parish? So those are a couple of questions that had come up, and uh, so maybe I'll be taking a, you know, you're welcome to give me a call or uh, send me an email about that, and like I said, maybe I'll have to do a, a, a poll, but those are the two things that I had heard um, offline in meetings uh, with people. So thank you very much. I appreciate it, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Satcher. We go then to District 2, Commissioner Bellamy. Yeah, um, 
it's just a couple of things I want to bring bring forward um, about uh, District Two, but I do want to make a comment about the the pool requests um, in in Paris. And I don't know whether or not you all know this, but we've been out there in Paris since the early '70s, and I'm very familiar with a lot of the growth and the things that's taking place. And um, we've watched that area grow off of Erie Road, now connecting off of Fort Hammer um, Road, as, as well as Olomay Sims um, Park is, and now we're having another park. So one of my questions was, was there enough space in order to, to have a pool? And um, just I just asked Dr. Hopes that. Um, but I, I will say this, um, he basically made a comment about the acquisition of well, the, need, the need of acquisition of that other piece of land in order for us to, con, to consider that. Um, and I would be in, in, in support of that area, you know, having a pool as well as being connected to that high school if hopefully if the school district can get, in, can get involved with it and, and, high, and have some buy-in because I'm sure, it's, I, I'm sure Paris, um, what is community high school, will have a swim team and they will need an area to go and, and, and practice and things like that. So I wanted to make sure that it's clear from the, the individuals that have been, been in Paris the last four or five decades or, or, or further, you know, they obviously deserve to have that opportunity to come to their community also. Um, I also want to say that the, um, there was some reach out yesterday. There was a great article in the newspaper about um, the – the, the veterans facility, and we I already have a name in mind, but we can't talk about that right now. Um, over, over across there um, at, at the old uh, facility, we do not want to keep calling it the old. And notice I don't say that word. <laughs> we're not going to keep calling it that. So we're going to, uh, me uh, right now, tends to be the potential um, veterans facility. Um, there, was a, there was a great article on it, which obviously brought some communication, you know, where some media outlets wanted um, to reach out. I, honest, I honestly think the media communication should go through Lee Washington um, as, as far as when we're discussing the veterans facility um, so we can make sure, you know, when you're talking about the data and, and the wraparound services and the programs and things like that, I'm excited about that. I do plan on reaching out um, for some from state and, and some federal support because, like my great friend, uh, Mr. Cruz said $15 million is not going to cover that, so we may need to make sure we get on the same page on how we're going to approach for hopefully next budget time, you know, for appropriations or get some federal or, or state dollars down. So that's just about it for right now for me. Thank you, Commissioner Bellamy. Uh, Commissioner Th uh, District 3 is next. Um, so uh, in District 3, I would just – this actually – involves District 2 as well, but I would tell oh. everybody that the regatta is taking place in downtown Bradenton this weekend on Saturday. Uh, and despite the weather today, Saturday we're looking at sunny and 75 degrees. The mayor guarantees that. Oh, yeah. um, so you should go down there and expect beautiful weather by the guarantee of Mayor Brown uh, we'll on Saturday. Right <laughs> uh, there'll be, you know, the boat races, of course, the bridge, will, one of the bridges will be closed. Um, so you're not going anywhere anyway, so you might as well uh, in, enjoy the regatta, right? You probably walk across the closed bridge faster than you drive across the open one. Um, and it's a fantastic event. There'll be, the Blues Brothers will be there. There's all kinds of, uh, on the river walk, there'll be all kinds of entertainment. They'll have fireworks in the evening. Uh, the regatta is a full day. It's family oriented. It's a great opportunity and to be thankful that you live in free Florida and that you can go outside and you can gather and, uh, and have a good time. Uh, so it's a great day to, to go out and have fun with your family. Um, and that's about all for today, I think, for District 3. We have the Cortez Fish Festival the following weekend. I don't think I will have an opportunity to discuss that between now and then from this dais. So I will remind everybody of the Cortez Fish, Festi Fish Festival on Saturday the 19th. So two great events taking place in District 3, outside, free Florida. Got to love where you live, man. It's a great place and a great time of year. Uh, and that's all for District 3. District 4, Commissioner Servia. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I have um, six quick things to go over. And I'm going to start with the comments that I was unable to make uh, on the last item. And I, I just want to say that it's very important to me that, you know, we are accountable to our taxpayers. That's our job. Okay, so that's our main job, and that's why I felt it was important to talk uh, just a little bit more. I don't want to discount the importance of this topic, as some people have done, um, because what I did when I read this stuff in the paper is I 
took those facts that were stated and started checking on them. And I did not find that there were any facts that were misstated when I spoke with our CFO, when I spoke with other staff here. So um, I, I just want to get that out. And, and to Commissioner Cruz's comments that it's only 1%, I say every percent matters. Every last dollar matters. It is important. And I, I'm sorry, Commissioner Cruz, I'll let you debate if you want, but it just does. And, you know, trust, trust is so important also. Uh, you know, if you break trust, it's hard to rebuild it. And I believe that this board and our county administration should always be working to earn and build trust. Uh, we had a communication problem, and that's okay. So uh, I, I'm glad that it has been talked about and is going to be hopefully corrected a little bit. I'll, t I'll leave you with one more thing. When I talk with, when I go to the Republican luncheons, and uh, for years, for years I've seen this county do it both ways. There have been times in the past when staff would get an across-the-board increase, and there have been times when it was only merit-based. Um, the people I hear from at the Republican clubs don't like across-the-board increases. And everybody has a different feeling about it, and there are different reasons why both have pros and cons. But just keep that in mind as we discuss that as we go into budget season for next year, because uh, it's going to, I think, probably because of this, we're going to have some more discussion about it. Um, I'm going to move on to the TDC uh, meeting that's coming up on February 14th. My husband is having surgery that day. And I had hoped that I could do both. Um, but now his doctor is not going to give a time for the surgery until the Friday before. That's this Friday. And so I think what I'm going to do is ask Commissioner uh, Whitmore to please just plan on taking the lead on that TDC meeting because I'm not certain that I can be here for that. I've got to take him to the hospital. And that would mean also the TDC briefing that... I'll, I'll get with uh, your aid, and we'll see if hopefully you're available on, I think it's the 9th that is my briefing at 1.30. And if you're not available, we'll, we'll look for another time, or I'll attend the briefing and then brief your aid. We'll figure it out. I have surgery at 11, but it only takes me 15 minutes to get there. Is that on the 9th? Dr. Tomio, yeah, on the, the 14th the TDC meeting. Okay. But I can get a meeting done fast. I've, I've, I've got, I can get the TDC. We're all meeting. falling apart up here. I know. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, so, so, it's and my husband's having hip replacement surgery, which, which, which is out, idea. which is outpatient. If, can you guys believe that? So I drop him off probably around nine o'clock and I take him home in the afternoon. Yeah. So, um, that sounds insane to me, but he can't drive and I've got to be there. Um, this week I spent some time meeting with Michelle Conizio, and I think a lot of us know her from the Republican clubs, and um, she's also a great foster parent and does a lot of work with foster kids. If, if you want more information on what it's like to be a foster parent and some of the challenges that they're facing, I would really suggest that you meet with her. Um, I, got, I got a very clear understanding of some of the challenges they face, so um, thank you, Michelle, for meeting with me. Uh, the homeless workshop, I understand, was canceled yesterday. It was scheduled for the 15th. <coughs> Commissioner Cruz can't be there. Uh, I can only be there half of the day. So I appreciate that we want a full board. But I would say please make this a top priority because uh, the people working with the homeless are in crisis. And we really need to support them. So, And I'd like to suggest that it's a special meeting so that if we have to make some decisions that we can do it at that meeting. We really are behind. As you guys know, we need to do something. So please make it a priority. Um, the, the procedures um, that we recently adopted, I, I remember that one of the procedures was that anyone speaking at the microphone on public comments would have to state their county that they live in and their zip code. Am I remembering that correctly? Okay, because I know we're only asking them for county. So I just wanted to bring that up, that that's the procedures we adopted, I think, require both. We, I'm sorry, we have not adopted those yet. Oh, those those oh, have to be okay. brought back at a regular oh, meeting by my you. office. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, so that's why we're only asking for the county. Okay, makes sense. Um, and and I, when I took the chairmanship, I spoke with uh, Mr. Clegg about that because, for instance, in the city, you have to give your full address, and I thought that was overkill. Awesome. But I thought it was, you know, 
it was good information for us to know where the people that are coming, you know, whether or not the people that are coming to us speaking are residents of Manatee County or not. So I've just taken chairman's privilege to ask them to state their county of residence. I, I like that. I do uh, like that. Um, I, I also like, like the idea down. of the zip code. And the reason is if somebody's from a zip code that I'm representing, sure. I'm, I'm probably going to try and contact them and say, can I follow up with you? I get it. Okay. So, so I, I would appreciate that. And then lastly, with trailer states. Um, so yes, the reason that you were uh, included in that discussion, Commissioner Whitmore, is because of your involvement with the WCIND. But I think that Charlie Hunsaker is looking into that a little more carefully. Yes, Trailer Estates is a special recreational district, um, and they do collect taxes on that for that reason. But what I understand is if seawalls benefit the public, they may be entitled to some grant money or public money. And if they only benefit the community privately, they, they're not entitled, something like that. But Charlie Hunsaker is looking into that. Just wanted to follow up. And that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Servia. Uh, Mr. Clegg, do you have any final thoughts today? No, sir, I do not. Mr. Uh, County Administrator, do you have any final thoughts today? No. Okay, if there's no further business, we are adjourned.
We have already impacted the North River community by adding sidewalks and safety lights to the underserved areas. We're in the process of transforming Washington Park into a community stomping ground. And now, we're reaching new heights at Lincoln Park. Let's dive into the deep end on this episode of Manatee on the Moon. Hello, I'm Commissioner Reggie Bellin, and I'm proud to represent District 2 in Manatee County. 